Chapter One of California Sketches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. Chapter One My First Sunday in the Mines. Sonora, in 1855, was an exciting, wild, wicked, fascinating place. Gold dust and gamblers were plentiful. A rich mining camp is a bonanza to the sporting fraternity. The peculiar excitement of mining is near akin to gambling, and seems to prepare the gold hunter for the faro bank and the monte table. The life was free and spiced with tragedy. The men were reckless, the women few, and not wholly select. The conventionalities of older communities were ignored. People dressed and talked as they pleased, and were a law unto themselves. Even a parson could gallop at full speed through a mining camp without exciting remark. To me it was all new, and at first a little bewildering, but there was a charm about it that lingers pleasantly in the memory after the lapse of all these long years from 1855 to date sonora was a picture unique in its beauty as i first looked down upon it from the crest of the highest hill above the town that bright may morning the air was exhilarating electric the sky was deep blue without a speck of cloud the town lay stretched between two ranges of hills the cosy cottages and rude cabins straggling along their sides while the full tide of life flowed through washington street in the centre where thousands of miners jostled one another as they moved to and fro high hills encircled the place on all sides protectingly and bald mountain dark and bare lifted above all the rest seemed to watch the queen city of the mines like a dusky duenna the far-off sierras white and cold lay propped against the sky like shrouded giants under their winding sheets of snow near me stood a lone pine which had escaped the ruthless axe because there was a grave under it marked by a rude cross descending to the main street again i found it crowded with flannel-shirted men they seemed to be excited judging from their loud tones and fierce gesticulations they've caught philippe at french camp and they will have him here by ten o'clock said one of the group near me yes and the boys are getting ready to swing the cursed greaser when he gets here said another savagely on inquiry i learned that the gentleman for whose arrival such preparation was being made was a mexican who had stabbed to the heart a policeman named sheldon two nights before the assassin fled the town but the sheriff and his posse had gotten on his track and pursuing rapidly had overtaken him at french camp and were now returning with their prisoner in charge sheldon was a good-natured generous fellow popular with the boys he was brave to a fault perhaps a little too ready at times to use his pistol two mexicans had been shot by him since his call to police duty and though the americans justified him in so doing the mexicans cherished a bitter feeling toward him sheldon knew that he was hated by those swarthy fellows whose strong point is not forgiveness of enemies and not long before the tragedy was heard to say in a half serious tone i expect to die in my boots poor fellow it came sooner than he thought by ten o'clock washington street was densely thronged by red and blue-shirted men whose remarks showed that they were ripe for mischief hang him i say if we allow the officers who watch for our protection when we are asleep to be murdered in this way nobody is safe i say hang him shouted a thick-chested miner gritting his teeth that's the talk swing him hang him put cold lead through him and such-like expressions were heard on all sides suddenly there was a rush of the crowd toward the point where washington street intersected with the jamestown road then the tide flowed backward and came surging by the place where i was standing there he comes adam boys a rope a rope go for him shouted a hundred voices the object of the popular execration guarded by the sheriff and a posse of about twenty men was hurried along in the middle of the street his hat gone his bosom bare a red sash around his waist he was a bad-looking fellow and in the rapid glances he cast at the angry crowd around him there was more of hate than fear 
The flashes of his dark eyes made one think of the gleam of the deadly Spanish dirk. The twenty picked men guarding him had each a revolver in his hand, with Major Solomon, the sheriff, at their head. The mob knew Solomon. He had distinguished himself for cool courage in the Mexican War, and they were well aware that those pistols were paraded for use if occasion demanded. The prisoner was taken into the Placer Hotel, where the coroner's jury was held, the mob surrounding the building and roaring like a sea. "'There they come! Go for him, boys!' was shouted as the doors were flung open, and Philippe appeared, attended by his guard. A rush was made, but there was Solomon with his twenty men, pistol in hand, and no man dared to lay a hand on the murderer. With steady step they marched to the jail, the crowd parting as the sheriff and his posse advanced, and the prisoner was hurried inside and the doors locked. Baffled thus for a few moments, the mob was silent, and then it exploded with imprecations and yells, "'Break open the door! Tear down the jail! Bring him out! Who has a rope? Out with him!' Cool and collected, Solomon stood on the doorstep, his twenty men standing, holding their revolvers ready." The county judge, Quint, attempted to address the excited mass, but his voice was drowned by their yells. The silver-tongued Henry P. Barber, an orator born, and whose sad career would make a romance of thrilling interest, essayed to speak, but even his magic voice was lost in the tornado of popular fury. I had climbed a high fence above the jail-yard, where the whole scene was before me. When Barbara gave up the attempt to get a hearing from the mob, there was a momentary silence. Solomon saw the opportunity, and, lifting his hand, he said, "'Will you hear me a moment? I am not fool enough to think that with these twenty men I can whip this crowd. You can overcome us by your number and kill us if you choose. Perhaps you will do it. I am ready for that. I don't say I can prevent you, but I do say—' and here his eye kindled and his voice had a steel-like ring, the first man that touches that jail door dies. There was a perceptible thrill throughout the dense mass of human beings. No man volunteered to lead an assault on the jail door. Solomon followed up this stroke. Boys, when you take time to reflect, you will see that this is all wrong. I was elected by your votes, and you are acting in bad faith when you put me in a position where I must violate my sworn duty or fight you. This is the holy Sabbath day. Back in our old homes we have been used to different scenes from this. The prisoner will be kept and tried and duly punished by the law. Let us give three cheers for the clergy of California, two of whom I see present, pointing to where my Presbyterian neighbor, the Rev. S. S. Harmon and I were perched conspicuously, and then go home like good citizens. Courage and tact prevailed. The mob was conquered. The cheers were given with a will. The crowd melted away, and in a few minutes the jail-yard was clear. I lingered alone, and was struck with the sudden transition. The sun was sinking in the west. Already the town below was wrapped in shade, the tops of the encircling hills caught the lingering beams, the loftier crest of Bald Mountain blazing as if it were a mass of burnished gold. It was the calm and glory of nature in sharp contrast with the turbulence and brutality of men. Wending my way back to the hotel, I seated myself on the piazza of the second story, and watched the motley crowd going in and out of the Long Tom drinking and gambling saloon across the street, musing upon the scenes of my first Sunday in the mines. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Sisaha I first noticed him one night at prayer meeting at Sonora in the Southern Mines in 1855. He came in timidly and took a seat near the door. His manner was reverent, and he watched the exercises with curious interest, his eyes following every gesture of the preacher, and his ears losing not a word that was said or sung. I was struck with his peculiar physiognomy, as he sat there with his thin, swarthy face, his soft, sad black eyes, 
and long black hair i could not make him out he might be mexican spanish portuguese kanaka or what not he waited until i passed out at the close of the meeting and bowing very humbly placed half a dollar in my hand and walked away this happened several weeks in succession and i noticed him at church on sunday evenings he would come in after the crowd had entered and take his place near the door he never failed to hand me the half dollar at the close of every service his dark wistful-looking eyes lighting up with pleasure as i took the coin from his hand he never waited to talk but hurried off at once my curiosity was excited and i began to feel a special interest in this strange-looking foreigner i was sitting one morning in the little room on the hillside which was at once dining-room parlor bedchamber and study when lifting my eyes a moment from the book i was reading there stood my strange foreigner in the door come in i said kindly making profound salaams he rushed impulsively toward me exclaiming in broken english my good brahmin my good brahmin with a torrent of words i could not understand i invited him to take a seat but he declined he looked flushed and excited his dark eyes flashing i soon found that he could understand english much better than he could speak it himself what is your name i asked sisaha he answered accenting strongly the last syllable of what nation are you was my next question me hindu me good caste he added rather proudly after gratifying my curiosity by answering my many questions he told his business with me it was with great difficulty that i could make out what he said his pronunciation was sadly imperfect at best and when he talked himself into an excited state his speech was a curious jargon of confused and strange sounds the substance of his story was that though belonging to a caste which was above such work necessity had forced him to take the place of a cook in a miner's boarding-house at a notorious camp called aptly whisky hill which was about three miles from sonora after six months service the proprietor of the establishment had dismissed him with no other pay than a bogus title to a mining claim when the poor fellow went to take possession the rightful owners drove him away with many blows and much of that peculiarly emphatic profanity for which california was rather noted in those early days on going back to his employer with the story of his failure to get possession of the mining claim he was driven away with cursings and threats without a dollar for months of hard work this was sisaha's story he had come to me for redress i felt no little sympathy for him as he stood before me so helpless in a strange land he had been shamefully wronged and i felt indignant at the recital but i told him that while i was sorry for him i could do nothing he had better put the case in the hands of a lawyer i suggested the name of one no no he said passionately you my good brahmin you go whisky hill you make frank powell pay me money he seemed to think that as a teacher of religion i must be invested also with some sort of authority in civil matters i could not make him understand that this was not so you ride horse me walk flank powell see my good brahmin come he pay money urged sisaha yielding to a sudden impulse i told him i would go with him he bowed almost to the floor and the tears which had flowed freely as he told his tale of wrongs were wiped away mounting dr jack franklin's sorrel horse my pen pauses as i write the name of that noble tennessean that true and generous friend i started to whisky hill my client keeping alongside on foot as we proceeded i could not help feeling that i was on a sort of fool's errand it was certainly a new role for me but my sympathy had been excited and i fortified myself by repeating mentally all those scriptures of the old and new testaments which enjoin kindness to strangers i found that sisaha was well known in the camp and that he was generally liked everybody seemed to know how he had been treated and the popular feeling was on his side several parties confirmed his statement of the case in every particular walking along among the mining claims with a proud and confident air he would point to me saying there my good brahmin he make flank powell pay my money now 
powell is a rough customer said a tall young fellow from new york who stood near the trail with a pick in his hand he will give you trouble before you get through with him sissaha only shook his head in a knowing way and hastened on keeping my sorrel in a brisk trot a stout and ill-dressed woman was standing in the porch of mr powell's establishment as i rode up is mr powell at home i asked yes he is in the house she said dryly scowling alternately at sissaha and me please tell him that i would like to see him she went into the house after giving us a parting angry glance and in a few minutes mr powell made his appearance he looked the ruffian that he was all over a huge fellow with enormous breadth between the shoulders and the chest of a bull with a fiery red face blear blue eyes red at the corners coarse sandy hair and a villainous tout ensemble every way he was as bad a specimen of my kind as i had ever met what do you want with me he growled out after taking a look at us i understand i answered in my blandest tones that there has been some difficulty in making a settlement between you and this hindu man and at his request i have come over to see if i can help to adjust it damn you said the ruffian if you come here meddling with my affairs i'll knock you off that horse he was a rough customer to look at just then sissaha looked a little alarmed and drew nearer to me i looked the man in the eye and answered i am not afraid of any violence at your hands you dare not attempt it you have cruelly wronged this poor foreigner and you know it every man in the camp condemns you for it and is ashamed of your conduct now i intend to see this thing through i will devote a year to it and spend every dollar i can raise if necessary to make you pay this debt by this time quite a crowd of miners had gathered around us and there were unmistakable expressions of approval of my speech that's the right sort of talk exclaimed a grizzly bearded man in a red shirt stand up to him parson said another there was a pause powell as i learned afterward was detested in the camp he had the reputation of a bully and a cheat i think he was likewise a coward at any rate as i warmed with virtuous indignation he cooled perhaps he did not like the expressions on the faces of the rough athletic men standing around what do you want me to do he asked in a sullen tone i want you to pay this man what you owe him i answered the negotiations begun thus unpromisingly ended very happily after making some deduction on some pretext or other the money was paid much to my relief and the joy of my client mr powell indulged in no parting courtesies nor did he tender me the hospitalities of his house i have never seen him from that day to this i have never wished to renew his acquaintance sissaha marched back to sonora in triumph a few days after the whisky hill adventure as i was sitting on the rear side of the little parsonage to get the benefit of the shade i had another visit from sissaha he had on his shoulder a miner's pick and shovel which he laid down at my feet what is that for i asked my good brahmin look at pick and shovel then no break and find heap gold said he his face full of trust and hopefulness i cast a kindly glance at the implements and did not think it worth while to combat his innocent superstition if good wishes could have brought him good luck the poor fellow would have prospered in his search after gold from that time on he was scarcely ever absent from church services never omitting to pay his weekly half dollar more than once i observed the tears running down his cheeks as he sat near the door eye and ear all attent to the service a day or two before my departure for conference at the end of my two years in sonora sissaha made me a visit he looked sad and anxious you go away he inquired yes i must go i answered you no come back sonora he asked no i cannot come back i said he stood a moment his chest heaving with emotion and then said me go with you me live where you live me die where you die almost the very words of the fair young moabite sissaha went with us how could i refuse to take him at san jose he lived with us doing our cooking nursing our little paul and making himself generally useful 
he taught us to love curry and to eat cucumbers hindu fashion that is stewed with veal or chicken he was the gentlest and most docile of servants never out of temper and always anxious to please little paul was very fond of him and often he would take him off in his baby wagon and they would be gone for hours together he never tired of asking questions about the christian religion and manifested a peculiar delight in the words and life of jesus one day he came into my study and said me want you to make me christian i can't make you a christian jesus can do it i answered he looked greatly puzzled and troubled at this reply but when i had explained the whole matter to him he brightened up and intimated that he wanted to join the church i enrolled his name as a probationer and his delight was unbounded one day sisaha came to me all smiling and said me want to give all the preachers one big dinner very well i answered i will let you do so how many do you want me want heap preachers table all full he said he gave me to understand that the feast must be altogether his own his money must buy everything even to the salt and pepper for seasoning the dishes he would use nothing that was in the house but bought flour fowls beef vegetables confectionery coffee tea everything for the great occasion he made a grand dinner not forgetting the curry and with a table full of preachers to enjoy it he was a picture of happiness his dark face beamed with delight as he handed around the viands to the smiling and appreciative guests he had some hindu notion that there was great merit in feasting so many belonging to the brahman caste to him the dinner was a sort of sacrifice most acceptable to heaven my oriental domestic seemed very happy for some months and became a general favorite on account of his gentle manners docile temper and obliging disposition his name was shortened to tom by the popular usage and under the instructions of the mistress of the parsonage he began the study of english poor fellow he never could make the sound of f or z the former always turning to p and the latter to g upon his tongue i believe there are no p's or g's in the hindu stani a change came over sisaha he became all at once moody and silent several times i found him in tears something was the matter with him that was clear one afternoon the secret came out he came into my room there were traces of tears on his cheeks i go away can stay with my potter father no more he said with a quiver in his voice why what is the matter i asked devil in here he answered touching his forehead devil tell me drink whiskey me no drink where my potter stay so must go why i did not know you ever drank whiskey where did you learn that i asked me drink with the boys at flank powell's drink beer and whiskey no drink for long time but devil in here touching his forehead say must drink he was a picture of shame and grief as he stood there before me how hard he must have fought against the appetite for strong drink since he had been with me and how full of shame and sorrow he was to confess his weakness to me he told me all about it how he had been treated to beer and whiskey by the good-natured miners and how the taste for liquor had grown on him and how he had resisted for a time and how he had at last yielded to the feeling that the devil was too strong for him that the devil was in it he seemed to have no doubt and truly it was so the cruelest deadliest of devils the devil of drink as a hindu in his own country no strong drink had ever passed his lips the fiery potations of whisky hill were too much for him you could pray sisaha me pray all night but devil too strong me must drink whisky he said vehemently he left us the parting was very sad to him and us he had a special cry over little paul you my potter to me you my mutter to my wife i go but me pack you both always in my belly we could but smile through our tears the poor fellow meant to say he would still bear us in his grateful heart in his wanderings after a few months he came to see us he looked seedy and sad he had found employment but did not stay long at a place 
he had stopped a while with a presbyterian minister in the sacramento valley and was solicited by him to join the church me tell him no he said his eyes flashing me tell him my potter done make me christian me no want to be made christian again the poor fellow was true to his first love sad christian as he was me drink no whiskey for four five week me now try to stop give me prayer to say when devil get in here touching his head that was what he had come for chiefly i gave him the form of a short and simple prayer he repeated it after me in his way until he had it by heart and then he left once or twice a year he came to see us and always had a pathetic tale to tell of his struggles with strong drink and the greed and violence of men who were tempted to oppress and maltreat a poor creature whose weakness invited injustice he told us of an adventure when acting as a sheep herder in southern california whither he had wandered a large flock of sheep which he had in charge had been disturbed in the corral a couple of nights in succession on the third night hearing a commotion among them he sprang up from his bunk and rushed out to see what was the matter but let him tell the story me run out to see what's matter star shine bright me get into corral sheep all very much scared and very much run and very much jump big black bear jump over corral fence and come right for me me so flighten me know nothing but raise my arms and run at bear and say eee! prolonging the shrill scream and becoming terribly excited as he went on well how did it end i asked me scream so loud that bear get scared too and he turn run very fast jump over corral and run away we did not doubt this story the narration was too vivid to have been invented and that scream was enough to upset the nerves of any grizzly we got to looking for him at regular intervals he would bring candies and little presents for the children and would give a tearful recital of his experiences and take a tearful leave of us he was fighting his enemy and still claiming to be a christian he said many things which showed that he had thought earnestly and deeply on religious subjects and he would end by saying jesus help me jesus help me he came to see us after the death of our paul and he wept when we told him how our dear boy had left us he had had a long sickness in the hospital he had before expressed a desire to go back to his own country and now this desire had grown into a passion his wan face lighted up as he looked wistfully seaward from the bay window of our cottage on the hill above the golden gate he left us with a slow and feeble step often looking back as long as he was in sight that was the last of sisaha i know not whether he is in hindustan or the world of spirits end of chapter two Chapter Three of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Lost on Table Mountain. Table Mountain is a geological curiosity. It has puzzled the scientist, excited the wonder of the vulgar, and aroused the cupidity of the gold hunter. It is a river without water, a river without banks a river whose bed is hundreds of feet in the air rising in calaveras county it runs southward more than a hundred miles winding gracefully in its course and passing through what was one of the richest gold belts in the world but now the bustling camps are still the thousands who delved the earth for the shining ore are gone the very houses have disappeared the scarred bosom of mother earth alone tells of the intensely passionate life that once throbbed among these rocky hills a deserted mining camp is in more senses than one like a battlefield both leave the same tragic impression upon the mind what is now table mountain was many ages ago a river flowing from the foot of the sierras into the san joaquin valley a volcano at its head discharged its lava into it and it slowly rolled down its bed and cooling left the hard volcanic matter to resist the action of the elements
by which the surrounding country was worn away until it was left high in the air a phenomenon to exercise the wits of the learned and a delight to the lover of the curious in nature i can modestly claim the honour of having preached the first sermon on the south side of table mountain where mormon creek was thronged with miners who filled davy jameson's dining-room to attend religious service on wednesday nights it was a big day for us all when we dedicated a board-house to the worship of god and the instruction of youth it was both a church and schoolhouse i have still a very vivid remembrance of that occasion my audience was composed of the gold diggers on the creek with half a dozen women and nearly as many babies who insisted on being heard as well as the preacher i kept the floor until two long lean yellow dogs had a disagreement showed their teeth erected their bristles sidled up closer and closer growling until they suddenly flew at each other like tigers and fought all over the house my plan was not to notice the dogs and so elevating my voice i kept on speaking the dogs snapped and bit fearfully the women screamed the children became frantic stiffening themselves and turning purple in the face a bushy whiskered man with a red head kicked the dogs from him with loud imprecations while davy jameson used a long broom upon them with great energy but with unsatisfactory result those yellow dogs were mad and didn't care for kicks or brooms they stuck to each other and fought over and under the benches and along the aisle and under my table and everywhere i did not keep on i had changed my mind or rather had lost it and found myself standing bewildered and silent the thread of my discourse gone a good-humoured miner winked at me in a way that said they were too much for you the dogs were finally ejected the last i saw of them they were rolling down the hill still fighting savagely i resumed my discourse and finished amid a steady but subdued ah, 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 ah of the quartet of babies it is astonishing how long a delicate baby can keep up this sort of crying and never get hoarse there were such strong signs of a storm one wednesday afternoon that i almost abandoned the idea of filling my appointment on mormon creek the clouds were boiling up around the crests of the mountains and the wind blew in heavy gusts but mounting the famous iron-gray pacing pony i felt equal to any emergency and at a rapid gait climbed the great hill dividing sonora from shaw's flat and passing a gap in table mountain was soon dashing along the creek facing a high wind and exhilarated by the exercise my miners were out in force and i was glad i had not disappointed them it is best in such doubtful cases to go by the time the service was over the weather was still more portentous the heavens were covered with thick clouds and the wind had risen to a gale you can never find your way home such a night as this said a friendly miner you can't see your hand before you it was true the darkness was so dense that not the faintest outline of my hand was visible an inch from my face but i had confidence in the lively gray pony and resolved to go home having left the mistress of the parsonage alone in the little cabin which stood unfenced on the hillside and unprotected by lock or key to the doors mounting i touched the pony gently with the whip and he struck off at a lively pace up the road which led along the creek i had confidence in the pony and the pony seemed to have confidence in me it was riding by faith not by sight i could not see even the pony's neck the darkness was complete i always feel a peculiar elation on horseback and delighted with the rapid speed we were making was congratulating myself that i would not be long in getting home when horror i felt that horse and rider were falling through the air the pony had blindly paced right over the bank of the creek no more able to see than i was quick as a thought i drew my feet out of the stirrups and went headlong over the horse's head 
striking on my hands and knees i was stunned at first but soon found that beyond a few bruises and scratches i was not much hurt though my watch was shattered getting on my feet i listened for the pony but in vain nothing could be heard or seen groping around a little i stumbled into the creek erebus could not be darker than was that night having no notion of the points of the compass i knew not which way to move long and loud i called for help and at length when i had almost exhausted myself an answer came through the darkness and soon a party appeared with a lantern they found me on the edge of the creek and the pony about midway down the bank where he had lodged in his fall bracing himself with his forefeet afraid to move with great difficulty the poor beast which was trembling in every limb with fright was rescued from his perilous and uncomfortable position and the whole party marched back to jameson's the pony was lamed in the fore shoulder and my hands and knees were bleeding taking a small hand lantern with half a candle and an umbrella i started for sonora on foot leaving the pony in the corral the rain began to fall just as i began to ascend the trail leading up the mountain and the wind howled fearfully a particularly heavy gust caught my umbrella at a disadvantage and tore it into shreds and i threw it away and manfully took the rain which now poured in torrents mingled with hail saturated as i was the exercise kept me warm my chief anxiety was to prevent my candle from being put out by the wind and i protected my lantern with the skirt of my coat while i watched carefully for the narrow trail winding around the ascent climbing the mining ditches and dripping with the rain i reached the crossing of table mountain and began picking my way among the huge lava blocks on the summit the storm king of the sierras was on a big frolic that night i soon lost the narrow trail my piece of candle was burning low if it should go out a text came into my mind from which i preached the next sunday walk while ye have the light it was strange that the whole structure of the discourse shaped itself in my mind while stumbling among those rugged lava blocks and pelted by the storm which seemed every moment to rage more furiously i kept groping for the lost trail shivering now with cold and the candle getting very low in my lantern i was lost and it was a bad night to be lost in the wind seemed to have a mocking sound as it shrieked in my ears and as it died away in a temporary lull it sounded like a dirge i began to think it would have been better for me to have taken the advice of my mormon creek friends and waited until morning all the time i kept moving though aimlessly thank god here is the trail i came upon it again just where it left the mountain and crossed the jamestown road recognizing the place by a gap in a brush fence i started forward at a quickened pace following the trail among the manzanita bushes and winding among the hills a tree had fallen across the trail at one point and in going round it i lost a little thread of pathway and could not find it again the earth was flooded with water and one spot looked just like another holding my lantern near the ground i scanned keenly every foot of it as i made a circle in search of the lost trail but soon found i had no idea of the points of the compass in a word i was lost again the storm was unabated it was rough work stumbling over the rocks and pushing my way through the thick manzanita bushes bruising my limbs and scratching my face almost exhausted i sat down on the lee side of a large pine tree thinking i would thus wait for daylight but the next moment the thought occurred to me that if i sat there much longer i would never leave alive for i was getting very cold and would freeze before morning i thought it was time to pray and i prayed a calm came over me and rising i resumed my search for the lost trail in five minutes i found it and following it i soon came in sight of a light which issued from a cabin at the door of which i knocked at first there was no answer and i repeated the thumps on the door with more energy 
I heard whispering inside, a step across the floor, then the latch was drawn, and as the door was partially opened, a gruff voice said, "'Who are you, and what do you want here at this time of night?' let me in out of the storm and i will tell you i said not so fast stranger robbers are mighty plenty and sassy around here and you don't come in till we know who you are said the voice i told them who i was where i had been and all about it the door was opened cautiously and i walked in a coarse frowsy-looking woman sat in the corner by the fireplace a rough-looking man sat in the opposite corner while the fellow who had let me in took a seat on a bench in front i stood dripping and ready to sink from fatigue but no seat was offered me this is a pretty rough night said one of the men complacently but it's nothing to the night we had the storm on the plains when our wagon covers was blowed off and the cattle stampeded and stop said i your troubles are over and mine are not i want you to give me a piece of candle for my lantern here and tell me the way to sonora the fact is i was disgusted at their want of hospitality and too tired to be polite it is vain to expect such politeness from a man who is very tired or very hungry most wise find this out but i mention it for the sake of the young and inexperienced after considerable delay the frowsy woman got up found a candle cut off about three inches and sulkily handed it to me lighting and placing it in my lantern i made for the door receiving these directions as i did so go back the way you came about two hundred yards then take a left-hand trail which will carry you to sonora by way of dragoon gulch plunging into the storm again i found the trail as directed and went forward the rain poured down as if the bottom of the heavens had fallen out and the earth was a sea the water coming above my gaiters at every step and the wind almost lifting me from my feet i soon found that it was impossible to distinguish the trail and trusting to my instinct i pressed on in the direction of sonora which could scarcely be more than a mile away seeing a light in the distance i bent my steps toward it in my eagerness to reach it i came very near walking into a deep mining shaft a single step more and this sketch would never have been written making my way among huge boulders and mining pits i reached the house in which was the light i had followed knocking at the door a cheerful voice said come in pushing open the door i entered and found that i was in a drinking saloon several men were seated around a table playing cards with money piled before them and glasses of strong drink within reach a red-faced corpulent and good-natured dutchman stood behind the bar and was in the act of mixing some stimulant with the flourish of an expert where am i i asked thoroughly bewildered and not recognizing the place or the persons before me this is de shaw's flat lager beer saloon said the dutchman so this was not sonora after losing the trail i had lost my course and gone away off north of my intended destination the men knew me and were very polite the kind-hearted dutchman offered me alcoholic refreshment which i politely declined placed a whole candle in my lantern and gave me many good wishes as i again took the road and faced the storm gambling is a terrible vice but it was a good thing for me that the card players lingered so long at their sport that rough night taking the middle of the road i struck a good pace and meeting with no further mishap except a fall and tumble in the red mud as i was descending the high hill that separated the two camps about two o'clock in the morning i came in sight of the parsonage and saw an anxious face at the door looking out into the darkness after a sound sleep i rose next day a little bruised and stiff but otherwise none the worse for being lost on table mountain the gallant gray pony did not escape so well he never did get over his lameness End of chapter three Chapter Four of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Fulton. 
He was a singular compound, hero, hypochondriac, and saint. He came aboard the Antelope as we, my wife and I, were on our way to the annual conference at Sacramento in 1855. Coming into our stateroom, he introduced himself as Brother Fulton a thin pale-faced man with weak blue eyes and that peculiar look which belongs to the real ascetic he seemed out of place among that motley throng i am glad to see you and hope you will live wholly and be useful in california he said as this is the first time we have met he continued let us have a word of prayer that all our intercourse may be sanctified to our mutual good down he kneeled among the trunks valises and bandboxes in the little stateroom and we with him though it was tight squeezing amid the baggage and prayed long and fervently with many groans and sighs rising at length from our knees we entered into conversation after a few inquiries and answers he said it is very difficult to maintain a spiritual frame of mind among all these people let us have another word of prayer down he went again on his knees we following and he wrestled long and earnestly in supplication oblivious of the peculiarities of the situation conversation was resumed on rising confined exclusively to religious topics a few minutes had thus been spent when he said we are on our way to the annual conference where we shall be engaged in looking after the interests of the church let us have another word of prayer that we may be prepared for these duties and that the session may be profitable to all again he knelt upon his knees and prayed with great fervour when we rose there was a look of inquiry in the eyes of my fellow missionary which seemed to ask where is this to end just then the dinner bell rang and we had no opportunity for further devotions with brother fulton it was observed during the conference session that there was a cloud in fulton's sky he sat silent and gloomy taking no part in the proceedings about the third morning while some important measure was pending he rose and addressed bishop andrew who was in the chair bishop i am in great mental distress you will excuse me for interrupting the business of the conference but i can bear it no longer what's the matter brother fulton asked that bluff wise old preacher i am afraid i have sinned was the answer with bowed head and faltering voice in what way asked the bishop i will explain on my way from the mountains i became very hungry in the stagecoach i am afraid i thought too much of my food you know bishop that if we fix our affections for one moment on any creature more than on god it is sin well brother fulton said the bishop if at your hungriest moment the alternative had been presented whether you would give up your god or your dinner would you have hesitated no sir said brother fulton meekly after a short pause well then my dear brother the case is clear you have done no wrong said the bishop in his hearty off-hand way the effect was magical fulton stood thoughtful a moment and then as he sat down burst into tears of joy poor morbidly sensitive soul we may smile at such scruples so foreign to the temper of these after times but they were the scruples of a soul as true and as unworldly as that of a kempis he was sent to the mines and he was a wonder to those nomadic dwellers about vallecito douglas's flat murphy's camp and lancha plana they were puzzled to determine whether he was a lunatic or a saint many stories of his eccentricities were afloat and he was regarded with a sort of mingled curiosity and awe it was but seldom that even the roughest fellows would utter profane language in his presence and when they did they received a rebuke that made them ashamed before the year was out he had won every heart by the power of simple truthfulness courage and goodness the man who insulted or in any way mistreated him would have lost caste with those wild adventurers who with all their grievous faults never failed to recognize sincerity and pluck fulton's sincerity was unmistakable and he feared not the face of man he made converts among them too 
many a profane lip became familiar with the language of prayer in those mining camps where the devil was so terribly regnant and took no pains to hide his cloven foot one of fulton's eccentricities caused a tedious trial to an old hen belonging to a good sister at vallecito he was a dyspeptic too great abstemiousness the cause his diet was tea crackers and boiled eggs being a rigid sabbath keeper he would eat nothing cooked on sunday so his eggs were boiled on saturday and warmed over for his sunday meals about the time of one of his visits to vallecito the sister referred to had occasion to set a hen the period of incubation was singularly protracted running far into the summer the eggs would not hatch investigation finally disclosed the fact that by somebody's blunder the boiled eggs had been placed under the unfortunate fowl whose perseverance failed of its due reward bless me said the good-natured sister laughing those were brother fulton's eggs i wonder if he ate the raw ones fulton had his stated times for private devotion and allowed nothing to stand in the way the hour of twelve was one of these seasons sacred to prayer one day he was ascending a mountain leading his horse and assisting a teamster by scotching the wheels of his heavy wagon when his horses stopped to get breath when about halfway up fulton's large old-fashioned silver watch told him it was twelve instantly he called out my hour of prayer has arrived and i must stop and pray wait till we get to the top of the mountain won't you exclaimed the teamster no said fulton i never allow anything to interfere with my secret prayers and down he kneeled by the roadside bridle in hand and with closed eyes he was soon wrapped in devotion the teamster expressed his view of the situation in language not exactly congress to the exercise in which his fellow-traveller was engaged but he waited until the prayer was ended and then with a serene face fulton resumed his service as scotcher and the summit was reached in triumph while on the san ramon circuit in contra costa county he met a man with a drove of hogs in a narrow muddy lane the swine took fright and despite the frantic efforts of their driver they turned bolted by him and rushed back the way whence they had come the swineherd was furious with rage and let loose upon fulton a volley of oaths and threats fulton paused looked upon the angry fellow calmly for a few moments and then dismounted and kneeling by the roadside began to pray for the man whose profanity was filling the air the fellow was confounded at the sight of that ghostly-looking man on his knees before him he took a panic and turning back he followed his hogs in rapid flight the sequel must be given the fleeing swineherd became one of fulton's converts dating his religious concern from the prayer in the lane fulton itinerated in this way for years fasting rigidly and praying incessantly some thinking him a lunatic others reverencing him as a saint thinner and thinner did he grow his pallid face becoming almost transparent thinking its mild climate might benefit his health he was sent to southern california one morning on entering his room he was found kneeling by his bedside dead with his bible open before him and a smile on his face end of chapter four Chapter Five of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Fatal Twist. Alcohol and opium were his masters. He alternated in their use. Only a brain of extraordinary strength and nerves of steel could have stood the strain. He had a large practice at the Sonora Bar, was a popular politician, made telling stump speeches, and wrote pungent and witty editorials for the Union Democrat, conducted by that most genial and unselfish of party pack horses, A. N. Francisco. He was a fine scholar, and so thoroughly a gentleman in his instincts, that even when drunk he was not vulgar or obscene 
cynicism and waggery were mingled in his nature but he was more cynic than wag an accidental meeting under pleasant circumstances and agreement in opinion concerning certain current issues that were exciting the country developed a sort of friendship between us he affected scepticism and was always ready to give a thrust at the clergy it sometimes happened that a party of the wild blades of the place would come in a body to my little church on the hillside to hear such a discourse as my immaturity could furnish but he was never among them all he seemed to want from the community in which he lived was something to sneer or laugh at and the means wherewith to procure the narcotics with which he was destroying his body and brain as we met oftener i became interested in him more and more looking at his splendid head and handsome face it was impossible not to admire him and think of the possibilities of his life could he be freed from his vices he was still under thirty but he was a drunkard he was shy of all allusions to himself and i do not know how it was that he came to open his mind to me so freely as he did one morning i found him alone in his office he was sober and sad and in a different mood from any in which i had ever before met him our conversation touched upon many topics for he seemed disposed to talk how slight a circumstance i remarked will sometimes give colouring to our whole character and affect all our after life yes he answered bitterly do i realise the truth of your remark when i was in my fourteenth year an incident occurred which has influenced all my subsequent life i was always a favourite with my school teachers and i loved them with a hearty boyish affection especially did i entertain a most affectionate reverence for the kind old man who presided over the boys academy in my native town in massachusetts he became my instructor when i was ten years old and i was his favourite pupil with a natural aptness for study my desire to win his approbation stimulated me to make exertions that always kept me at the head of my class and i was frequently held up to the other pupils as an example of good behaviour i was proud of his opinion and sought to deserve it stimulated both by ambition and affection nothing seemed too difficult for me the three years i was under his tuition were the best employed and happiest of my life but my kind old preceptor died the whole town was plunged in sorrow for his loss and my boyish grief was bitter here he paused a few moments and then went on soon a new teacher took his place he was unlike the one we had lost he was a younger man and he lacked the gentleness and dignity of his predecessor but i was prepared to give him my confidence and affection for then i had learned nothing else i sought to gain his favour and was diligent in study and careful of my behaviour for several days all went on smoothly a rule of the school forbade whispering one day a boy sitting just behind me whispered my name involuntarily i half inclined my head toward him when the new teacher called to me angrily come here sir i obeyed grasping me tightly by the collar he said how dare you whisper in school i told him i had not whispered hearing my name called i only turned to don't dare to tell me a lie he thundered lifting me from the floor as he spoke and tripping my feet from under me causing me to fall violently my head striking first i was stunned by the fall but soon rose to my feet bruised and bewildered yet burning with indignation take your seat sir said he enforcing the command by several sharp strokes of the rod and be careful in future how you lie to me i walked slowly to my seat a demon had entered my soul for the first time i had learned to hate i hated that man from that hour and i hate him still he still lives and if i ever meet him i will be even with him yet he had unconsciously risen from his seat while his eyes flashed and his face was distorted with passion after a few moments he continued this affair produced a complete change in my conduct and character i hated my teacher i looked upon him as an enemy and treated him accordingly 
losing all relish for study from being at the head i dropped to the foot of my class instead of seeking to merit a name for good behaviour my only ambition was to annoy the tyrant placed over me he treated me harshly and i suffered severely he beat me constantly and cruelly under these influences my nature hardened rapidly i received no sympathy except from my mother and she did not understand my position i felt that she loved me although she evidently thought i must be in the wrong my father laid all the blame on me and with a stern sense of justice refused to interfere in my behalf at last i began to look upon him as an accomplice of my persecutor and almost hated him too i became suspicious and misanthropic i loved no one but my mother and sought the love of no other thus passed several years my time was wasted and my nature perverted i was sent to college for which i was poorly prepared here a new life began my effort to rise above the influences that had been so hurtful to me failed my college career soon terminated i could not shake off the effects of the early injustice and mismanagement of which i was the victim i came to california in a reckless spirit and am now mortgaged to the devil what i might have been under other circumstances i know not but i do know that the best elements of my nature were crushed out of me by the infernal tyrant who was my teacher and that i owe him a debt i would be glad to pay he spoke truly the mortgage was duly foreclosed he died of delirium tremens a single act of injustice sowed the seeds of bitterness that marred the hopes of a whole life the moral of this sketch is commended to teachers and parents. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 – Stranded just as the sun was going down after one of the hottest days of the summer of eighteen fifty five while we were sitting in the rude piazza of the parsonage in sonora enjoying the coolness of the evening breeze a man came up and in a hurried tone inquired does the preacher live here getting an affirmative answer he said there is a very sick man at the hospital who wishes to see the southern methodist preacher immediately i at once obeyed the summons on reaching the hospital my conductor said you will find him in there pointing to one of the rooms on entering i found four patients in the room three of whom were young men variously affected with chronic diseases rough-looking fellows showing plainly in their sensual faces the insignia of vice the fourth was a man perhaps fifty years old as he lay there in the light of the setting sun i thought i had never beheld a more ghastly object the death-like pallor the pinched features the unnatural gleam of his eyes in their sunken sockets telling of days of pain and nights without sleep all told me this was the man by whom i had been sent for are you the preacher he asked in a feeble voice as i approached the bedside yes i am the preacher can i do anything for you i am glad you have come i was afraid i would not get to see you take a seat on that stool the accommodations are rather poor here he paused to recover breath and then went on i want you to pray for me i was once a member of the methodist church in georgia but oh sir i have been a bad man in california a wicked wicked wretch i have a family in georgia a dear wife and here he broke down again i had hoped to see them once more but the doctors say i must die and i feel that i am sinking no tongue could tell what i have suffered but the worst of all is my shameful denial of my saviour what a fool i have been to think that i could prosper in sin here i am stranded wrecked by my own folly i have been here in the hospital two months and have suffered intensely all the time what a fool i have been will you pray for me after directing his attention to various passages of the bible expressive of the tender love of god toward the erring i knelt by his cot and prayed 
his sighs and sobs gave indication of deep feeling and when i arose from my knees the tears were running from his eyes return unto me and i will return unto you he said repeating the words which i had quoted from the word of god return unto me and i will return unto you lingering upon the words with peculiar satisfaction he seemed to have caught a great truth i continued my visits to him for several weeks he gave me the history of his life which had been one of vicissitude and adventure he had been a soldier in the seminole war in florida and he had much to say of alligators and indians and andrew jackson all the time his strength was failing his eyes glittering more intensely his bodily sufferings were frightful the only sleep he obtained was by the use of opiates but an extraordinary change had taken place in his mental state to say that he was happy would be putting it too tamely there was some unseen presence or power that lifted his soul above his suffering body making that lonely room all bright and peaceful what it was no true believer in the saviour and lover of our souls will doubt there is a great change in the old man said the nurse one day he doesn't fret at all now oh i have been so happy all night and all day he said to me the last time that i saw him i have only refrained from shouting for fear of disturbing these poor fellows my sick roommates i have felt all day as if i could take them all in my arms and fly with them to the skies and his face was radiant the next morning he was found on the floor by his bedside dead he had died so quietly that none knew it his papers were placed in my possession in his well-worn pocket-book among letters from his wife in georgia receipts and private papers of various kinds i found the following lines which he had clipped from some newspaper and which seemed tear-blotted come home papa a little girl's thoughts about her absent papa come home papa the ashes of night are gathering in the sky the firefly shines with a fitful light the stars are out on high and twinkles bright the evening star we have waited long come home papa come home the birds have gone to rest in many a forest tree within thy quiet home thy nest thy bird is waiting thee she softly sings to cheer mamma the while she waits come home papa come home a tear is glistening bright within my mother's eye why stay away so late to-night from home mamma and i alas alas her moanings are that thou canst not return papa she says the white-sailed ship hath borne thee far upon the sea that many a night and many a morn will pass nor bring us thee but bear thee from us swift and far and thou mayst not come home papa i thought thou wouldst return when light had faded on the sea how can i fall asleep to-night without a kiss from thee thy picture in my hand i hold but oh the lips are hard and cold come home i'm sad where'er i go to find no father there how can we live without thee so i'll say my evening prayer and ask the god who made each star to bring me home my dear papa answered i'll come i'll come my darling one though long from thee i've tarried for thee within my anxious breast the fondest love i've carried where'er i've roamed o'er land or sea be not dismayed i'll come to thee when evening shades around thee fall and birds have gone to rest o oh, sing thou sweetest bird of mine within thy lonely nest sing on sing on to cheer mamma the while she waits for thy papa o oh, tell thy mother not to weep but let her tears be dry and ne'er for me to let them creep into her cheerful eye for though i've strayed from her afar she soon shall welcome home papa though white-sailed ship hath borne me far across the restless sea though many nights and morns have passed since last i dwelt with thee yet loved one i tell thee true but death can never sever me from you o oh, lay that picture down sweet child and calmly rest in peace and for my absence long from thee i pray thee not to weep 
i'll come i'll come again to thee in white-sailed ship across the sea but no white-sailed ship ever bore him to the loved ones across the sea he sleeps on one of the red hills overlooking sonora awaiting the resurrection as these are not fancy sketches but simple recitals of actual california life the lines above were copied as found the friendly reader therefore will not judge them with critical severity End of chapter six chapter seven of california sketches by oscar penn fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven lockley he was eccentric and he was lazy very eccentric and very lazy the miners crowded his church on sundays and he moved around among them in a leisurely familiar way during the week saying the quaintest things eating their slapjacks and smoking their best cigars he occupied a little frame house near the church in columbia then the richest mining camp in the world in whose streets ten thousand miners lounged ate drank gambled quarrelled and fought every lord's day that bachelor parsonage was unique in respect of the furniture it did not contain and also in respect to the condition of that which it did contain lockley was not a neat housekeeper i have said he was lazy he knew the fact accepted it and gloried in it on one occasion he invited four friends to dinner they all arrived at the hour lockley was stretched at full length on a lounge which would have been better for the attention of an upholsterer or washerwoman the friends looked at each other and at their host one of them spoke lockley where's your supper oh it isn't cooked yet he drawled out parker continued lockley make a fire in that stove toman you go uptown and get some crackers and oysters and coffee and a steak oxley go after a bucket of water porterfield you hunt up the crockery and set the table his orders were obeyed by the amused guests who entered into the spirit of the occasion with great good humour oyster cans were opened the steak was duly sliced seasoned and broiled the coffee was boiled and in due time the supper was ready and lockley arose from the lounge and presided at the table with perfect enjoyment two of these guests had a tragic history oxley and parker were killed in mexico at the massacre of the crab party porterfield died in stockton toman i think lives somewhere in indiana i saw one of loxley's letters from los angeles whither he had been sent by bishop andrew in eighteen fifty five it was as follows los angeles august eighteen fifty five dear porterfield i have been here six months there are three protestant churches in the place their united congregations amount to ten persons my receipts from collections during six months amount to ten dollars i have been studying a great scientific question namely the location of the seat of hunger is it in the stomach or in the brain after consulting all the best authorities and no little experience i have concluded that it is migratory first in one and then in the other take care of my cats lockley i had a letter from him once it was in reply to one from me asking him to remit the amount of a bill he owed for books as it was brief i print it entire mariposa april eighteen fifty eight dear fitz your dunning letter has been received and placed on file yours e b lockley the first time i ever heard him preach was at san jose during a special meeting poising himself in his peculiar way with an expression half comic half serious he began i have a notion my friends that in a gospel land every man has his own preacher that is for every man there is some one preacher who from similarity of temperament and mental constitution is adapted to be the instrument of his salvation now he continued there may be some man in this audience so peculiar so cranky so much out of the common order that i am his man if so 
may the holy spirit send the truth to his heart this remark riveted attention and he held it to the close lazy as he was out of the pulpit in it he was all energy and fire he had read largely had a good memory and put the quaintest conceits into the quaintest setting of fitting words his favorite text was there remaineth a rest to the people of god that was his idea of heaven rest to sit down with abraham isaac and jacob in the kingdom of god on this theme he was indeed eloquent the rapturous songs the waving palms the sounding harps of the new jerusalem were not to his taste what he wanted and looked for was rest and all the images by which he described the felicity of the redeemed were drawn from that one thought his idea of hell was antithetic to this the terrible thought with him was that there was no rest there i heard him bring out this idea with awful power one sunday morning at linden in san joaquin county in this world said lockley there is respite from every grief every burden every pain in the body the mourner weeps herself to sleep the agony of pain sinks exhausted into slumber sleep sweet sleep brings surcease to all human griefs and pains in this life but there will be no sleep in hell the accusing conscience will hiss its reproaches into the ear of the lost the memory will reproduce the crimes and follies by which the soul was wrecked for ever the fires of retribution will burn on unintermittingly one hour of sleep in a thousand years would be some mitigation but the worm dieth not the fire is not quenched god deliver me from a sleepless hell he exclaimed his swarthy face glowing and his dark eyes gleaming his whole frame quivering with horror at the thought his mind had conceived he was original in the pulpit as everywhere else at one time the preachers of the pacific conference seemed to have a sort of epidemic of preaching on a certain topic the choice of moses the elders preached it at the quarterly meetings and it was carried round from circuit to circuit and from station to station there was not much variety in these sermons they all bore a generic likeness to each other indicating a common paternity at least for the outlines the matter had become a subject of pleasant banter among the brethren there was consequently some surprise when at the session of the annual conference lockley announced for his text moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of god than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season it was the old text but it was a new sermon the choice of moses was in his hands a topic fresh and entertaining as he threw upon it the flashes of his wit and evoked from it suggestions that never would have occurred to another mind mind you he said at point moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of god i tell you my brethren the people of god are sometimes very aggravating they fretted moses almost to death but did he forsake them did he leave them in the wilderness to perish in their foolishness no he stood by them to the last his application of this peculiar exegesis to the audience of preachers and church members was so pointed that the ripple of amusement that swept over their faces gave way to an expression that told that the shot had hit the mark one warm day in eighteen fifty eight he started out with me to make a canvas of the city of stockton for the church paper we kept in pretty brisk motion for an hour or two lockley giving an occasional sign of dissatisfaction at the unwanted activity into which he had been beguiled passing down weber avenue on the shady side of a corner store he saw an empty chair and with a sigh of relief he sunk into it come on lockley said i we are not half done our work i shan't do it he drawled why not i asked the scripture is against it he answered with great seriousness of tone how is that i asked with curiosity the scripture says do thyself no harm said he and it does me harm to walk as fast as you do i shan't budge nor did he 
I spent two or three hours in different parts of the city, and on my return found him sitting in exactly the same attitude in which I had left him, a picture of perfect contentment. Literally, he had not budged. While on the Santa Clara circuit, he drove a remarkable little sorrel mare named by him Ginzy. Ginzy was very small, very angular, with long fetlocks and mane, a shade lighter than her other parts, a short tail that had a comic sort of twist to one side, and a lame eye. The buggy was in keeping with Ginzy. It was battered and splintered, some of the spokes were new and some were old, the dashboard was a wreck, the wheels seesawed in a curious way as it moved. And the harness! It was too much for my descriptive powers. It was a conglomerate harness composed of leather, hay rope, fragments of suspenders, whipcord, and rawhide. The vehicle announced its approach by an extraordinary creaking of all its unoiled axles, a sort of calliopean quartet that regaled the ears of the fat and happy genius who held the reins. Lockley, Ginzy, and that buggy made a picture worth looking at while lockley was on this circuit the annual conference was held at san jose as bishop kavanaugh was to preach on sunday morning it was expected that an overwhelming congregation would crowd the san jose church that eloquent kentuckian being a favorite with all classes in california lockley asked that a preacher be sent to fill the pulpit of his little church in the town of santa clara three miles distant the genial and zealous james kelsey was sent at eleven o'clock he and lockley entered the church and ascended the pulpit after kneeling a few moments in the usual way they seated themselves and faced the uh, not the audience for none was there nobody had come in a few minutes an old man came in and took a seat in the farthest corner from the pulpit he eyed the two preachers and they eyed him in silence the minutes passed on there they sat as might have been expected everybody had gone to hear the bishop in san jose that old man was the only person who entered the church it was evident however that he had come to stay he rigidly kept his place never taking his eyes from the two preachers who repaid him with an attention equally fixed a pin might have been heard to drop not a sound was uttered as they thus sat and gazed at each other an hour passed and still they sat speechless lockley broke the silence turning to his companion in the pulpit he said gravely brother kelsey how shall we bring these solemn services to a close let us pray said kelsey they knelt and kelsey led in prayer the old man keeping his place and sitting position the benediction was then formally pronounced and that service ended his death was tragic and pitiful a boy standing in the sunken channel of a dry creek shot at a vicious dog on the bank above the bullet after striking and killing the dog struck lockley in the chest as he was approaching the spot he staggered backward to a fence close at hand fell on his knees and died praying. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 – An Interview As I was coming out of the San Francisco Post Office one morning in the year 1859, a tall dark-skinned man placed himself in front of me and fixing his intensely glittering eyes upon me said in an excited tone sir can you give me a half hour of your time this morning yes i replied if i can be of any service to you by so doing not here but in your office privately he continued i must speak to somebody and having heard you preach in the church on pine street i felt that i could approach you i am in great trouble and danger and must speak to some one his manner was excited his hand trembled and his eye had an insane gleam as he spoke we walked on in silence until we reached my office on montgomery street after entering i laid down my letters and papers and was about to offer him a chair 
when he hurriedly locked the door on the inside, saying as he did so, This conversation is to be private, and I do not intend to be interrupted. As he turned toward me, I saw that he had a pistol in his hand, which he laid on the desk and then sat down. I waited for him to speak, eyeing him and the pistol closely, and, feeling a little uncomfortable, locked in thus with an armed madman of almost giant-like size and strength. The pistol had a sinister look that I had never before recognized in that popular weapon. It seemed to grow bigger and bigger. "'Have you ever been haunted by the idea of suicide?' he asked abruptly, his eyes glaring upon me as he spoke. "'No, not particularly,' I answered. "'But why do you ask?' "'Because the idea is haunting me,' he said in an agitated tone, rising from his chair as he spoke. "'I have lain for two nights with a cocked pistol in my hand, calculating the value of my life. I bought that pistol to shoot myself with, and I wonder that I have not done it, but something has held me back.' "'What has put the idea of suicide into your mind?' I inquired. "'My life's a failure, sir, and there is nothing else left for such a fool as I have been,' he said bitterly. "'When a man has no hope left, he should die.' I was making some reply when he broke in. "'Hear my history, and then tell me if death is not the only thing left for me,' laying his hand upon the pistol as he spoke." When he told me his name, I recognized it as that of a man of genius, whose contributions to a certain popular periodical had given him a wide fame in the world of letters. He was the son of a venerable New England bishop and a graduate of Harvard University. I will give his story in his own words as clearly as I can. In 1850 I started to California with honorable purpose and high ambition my father being a clergyman and poor and greatly advanced in years i felt that it was my duty to make some provision for him and for the family circle to which i belonged and of which i was the idol animated by this purpose i was full of hope and energy on the ship that took me to california i made the acquaintance and fell into the snares of a beautiful but unprincipled woman for whom i toiled and sacrificed everything for eight years of weakness and folly never remitting a dollar to those i had intended to provide for at home carrying all the while an uneasy conscience and despising myself i made immense sums of money but it all went for nothing but to feed the extravagance and recklessness of my evil genius tortured by remorse i made many struggles to free myself from the evil connection that blighted my life but in vain i had almost ceased to struggle against my fate when death lifted the shadow from my path the unhappy woman died and i was free i was astonished to find how rapid and how complete was the reaction from my despair i felt like a new man the glowing hopes that had been smothered revived and i felt something of the buoyancy and energy with which i had left my new england hills i worked hard and prospered i made money and saved it making occasional remittances to the family at home who were overjoyed to hear from me after my long and guilty silence i hadn't the heart to write to them while pursuing my evil life I had learned to gamble, of course, but now I resolved to quit it. For two years I kept this resolution, and had in the meantime saved over six thousand dollars. Do you believe that the devil tempts men? I tell you, sir, it is true. I began to feel a strange desire to visit some of my old haunts. This feeling became intense, overmastering. My judgment and conscience protested, but I felt like one under a spell. I yielded and found my way to a well-known gambling hell where I lost every dollar of my hard-earned money. It seems like a dream. I seemed to be drawn on to my ruin by some invisible but resistless evil power. When I had lost all, a strange calm came over me, which I have never understood. It may have been the reaction, after nights of feverish excitement, or possibly it was the unnatural calm that follows the death of hope. My self-contempt was complete. No language could have expressed the intensity of my self-scorn. 
I sneaked to my lodgings, feeling that I had somehow parted with my manhood as well as my money. The very next day I was surprised by the offer of a lucrative subordinate position in a federal office in San Francisco. This was not the first coincidence of the sort in my life, where an unexpected influence had been brought to bear upon me, giving my plans and prospects a new direction. Has God anything to do with these things? or is it an accident i took the place which was offered to me and went to work with renewed hope and energy i made a vow against gambling and determined to recover all i had thrown away i saved every dollar possible pinching myself in my living and supplementing my liberal salary by literary labors my savings had again run high up in the thousands and my gains were steady the fraser river mining excitement broke out an old friend of mine came to me and asked the loan of a hundred dollars to help him off to the new mines i told him he should have the money and that i would have it ready for him that afternoon after he had left the thought occurred to me that one hundred dollars was a very poor outfit for such an enterprise and that he ought to have more then the thought was suggested yes sir it was suggested that i might take the hundred dollars to a faro bank and win another hundred to place in the hands of my friend i was fully resolved to risk not a cent beyond this the idea took possession of my mind and when he came for the money i told him my plan and proposed that he accompany me to the gambling hell he was a free and easy sort of fellow and readily assented we went together and after alternate successes and losses at the faro bank it ended in the usual way i lost the hundred dollars i went home in a frenzy of anger and self-reproach the old passion was roused again a wild determination to break the faro bank took hold of me i went night after night betting recklessly until not a dollar was left this happened last week can you wonder that i have concluded there is no hope for as weak a fool as i am he paused a moment in his rapid recital pacing the floor with his hand on the hammer of the pistol which he had taken up now sir candidly don't you think that the best thing i can do is to blow out my brains said he cocking the pistol as he spoke the thought occurred to me that it was no uncommon thing for the suicidal to give way to the homicidal mania the man was evidently half mad and ready for a tragedy that pistol seemed almost instinct with conscious evil intention if a suicide or a homicide was to end the scene i preferred the former how old are you i asked aiming to create a diversion i am forty-five he answered apparently brought to a little more recollection of himself by the question i should think i continued having arrested his attention that whatever may have been your follies and however dark the future you have to face you have too much manhood to sneak out of life by the back door of suicide the shot struck an instantaneous change passed over his countenance suicide appeared to him in a new light as a cowardly not a heroic act he had been fascinated with the notion of having the curtain fall upon his career amid the blaze of blue lights and the glamour of romance and the dignity of tragedy with the wonder of the crowd and the tears of the sentimental that was all gone the suicide was but a poor creature weak as well as wicked he was saved he sunk into a chair as he handed me the pistol which i was very glad indeed to get into my hands you should be ashamed of yourself sir i continued you are only forty-five years old you are in perfect health with almost a giant's strength a classical education extensive business experience and a knowledge of the world gained by your very mistakes that should be a guarantee against the possibility of their repetition a brave man should never give up the battle the bravest men never give up give me the pistol he said quietly you need not be afraid to trust me with it the devil has left me i will not act the part of a coward you will hear from me again permit me to thank you good morning i did hear from him again 
the devil seemed indeed to have left him he went to british columbia where he prospered in business and got rich became a pillar in the church of which his father was one of the great lights and committed not suicide but matrimony marrying a sweet and cultured english girl who thinks her tall yankee husband the handsomest and noblest of men End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. Father Cox. Father Cox was a physical and intellectual phenomenon. He was of immense girth, weighing more than three hundred pounds. His face was ruddy and almost as smooth as that of a child. His hair snow white and fine as floss silk his eyes a deep blue his features small his great size and the contrast between the infantile freshness of his skin and white hair made him a notable man in the largest crowd he was converted and joined the methodist church after he had passed his fiftieth year he had been as he himself phrased it the keeper of a doggery and was no doubt a rough customer reaching california by way of texas he at once began to preach his style took with the californians great crowds flocked to hear him and marvelous effects were produced he was a fine judge of human nature and knew the direct way to the popular heart under his preaching men wept prayed repented believed and flocked into the church by scores and hundreds father cox was in his glory at a camp meeting to his gift of exhortation was added that of song he had a voice like a flute in its softness and purity of tone and his solos before and after preaching melted and broke the hard heart of many a wild and reckless californian his sagacity and knowledge of human nature were exhibited at one of his camp meetings held at gilroy in santa clara county there was a great crowd and a great religious excitement father cox riding its topmost wave the general of the army of israel seated in the preacher's stand he was leading in one of the spiritual lyrics suited to the occasion when a young man approached him and said father cox there's a friend of mine out here who wants you to come and pray for him where is he just out there on the edge of the crowd answered the young fellow father cox followed him to the outskirts of the congregation where he found a group of rough-looking fellows standing round with their leggings and huge spanish spurs in the centre of which a man was seen kneeling with his face buried between his hands there he is said the guide is he a friend of yours gentlemen asked father cox turning to the expectant group yes answered one of them and you want me to pray for him do you he continued we do was the answer all right all of you kneel down and i'll pray for him they looked at one another in confusion and then one by one they sheepishly kneeled until all were down father cox kneeled down by the mourner and prayed as follows o lord thou knowest all things thou knowest whether this man is a sincere penitent or not if he is sincerely sorry for his sins and is bowing before thee with a broken heart and a contrite spirit have mercy upon him hear his prayer pardon his transgressions give him thy peace and make him thy child but o oh lord if he is not in earnest if he is here as an emissary of satan to make mockery of sacred things and to hinder thy work kill him kill him lord at this point the uh, mourner became frightened and began to crawl father cox following him on his knees and continuing his prayer the terror-stricken sinner could stand it no longer but sprang to his feet and bounded away at full speed leaving father cox master of the field while the kneeling roughs rose and sneaked off abashed and discomfited the sequel of this incident should be given the mock penitent was taken into the church by father cox soon after he left the campground in a state of great alarm on account of his sacrilegious frolic 
when the old man put his hand on me as i kneeled there in wicked sport and prayed as he did it seemed to me that i felt hot flashes from hell rise in my face said he right there i became a true penitent the man thus strangely converted became a faithful soldier of the cross at a camp meeting near the town of sonoma in eighteen fifty eight father cox who was a preacher in charge of that circuit rose to exhort after the venerable judge shattuck had preached one of his strong earnest sermons the meeting had been going on several days and the sonoma sinners had hitherto resisted all appeals and persuasions the crowd was great and every eye was fixed upon the old man as he began his exhortation boys he began in a familiar kindly way boys you are treating me badly i have been with you all the year and you have always had a kind word and a generous hand for the old man i love you and i love your immortal souls i have entreated you to turn away from your sins to repent and come to christ and be saved i have preached to you i have prayed for you i have wept over you you harden your hearts and stiffen your necks and will not yield you will be lost you will go to hell in the judgment day you will be left without excuse and boys he continued his mighty chest heaving his voice quivering and the tears running down his cheeks boys i will have to be a witness against you i shall have to testify that i warned persuaded and entreated you in vain i shall have to testify of the proceedings of this sabbath night and tell how you turned a deaf ear to the call of your saviour i shall have to hear your sentence of condemnation and see you driven down to hell my god the thought is dreadful spare me this agony don't oh don't force this upon me don't compel the old man to be a witness against you in that awful day rather he concluded hear my voice of invitation to-night and come to christ so that instead of being a witness against you in that day i may be able to present you as my spiritual children and say lord jesus here is the old man and his sonoma children all saved and all ready to join together in a glad hallelujah to the lamb that was slain it was overwhelming the pathos and power of the speaker were indescribable there was a breakdown all over the vast congregation and a rush of penitence to the altar as one of the stirring camp-meeting choruses pealed forth from the full hearts of the faithful father cox's ready wit was equal to any occasion at a camp-meeting in the bodega hills in opening the doors of the church he said many souls have been converted and now i want them all to join the church when i was a boy i learned that it was best to string my fish as i caught them lest they should flutter back into the water i want to string my fish that is take all the young converts into the church and put them to work for christ lest they go back into the world you can't catch me loudly interrupted a rowdyish looking fellow who sat on a slab near the rostrum i am not fishing for gar reported father cox casting a contemptuous glance at the fellow and then went on with his work the gar fish is the abomination of all true fishermen hard to catch coarse flavored bony and nearly worthless when caught the vulgar fellow became the butt of the campground and soon mounted his mustang and galloped off amid the derision even of his own sort father cox had a naturally hot temper which sometimes flamed forth in a way that was startling it would have been a bold man who would have tested his physical prowess in a combat beside him an ordinary sized person looked like a pygmy near san juan in monterey county he had occasion to cross a swollen stream by means of the water fence above the ford the fence was flimsy and father cox was heavy the undertaking was not an easy one at best and father cox's difficulty and annoyance were enhanced by the ungenerous and violent abuse and curses of an infidel blacksmith on the opposite side of the stream who had worked himself into a rage because the immense weight of the old man had broken a rail or two of the fence the situation was too critical for reply as the mammoth preacher cox cooned his way cautiously and painfully across the rickety bridge 
at the imminent risk every moment of tumbling headlong into the roaring torrent below meanwhile the wicked and angry blacksmith kept up a volley of oaths and insulting epithets the old adam was waking up in the old preacher by the time he had reached the shore he was thoroughly mad and rushing forward he grasped his persecutor and shook him until his breath was nearly out of him saying oh you foul-mouthed villain if it were not for the fear of my god i would beat you into a jelly the blacksmith a stalwart fellow was astonished and when father cox let him go he had a new view of the church militant this scene was witnessed by a number of bystanders who did not fail to report it and it made the old preacher a hero with the rough fellows of san juan who thenceforward flocked to hear his preaching as they did to hear nobody else the image of father cox that is most vivid to my mind as i close this unpretentious sketch is that which he presented as he stood in the pulpit at stockton one night during the conference session and sung i am going home to die no more his ruddy face aglow his blue eyes swimming in tears his white hair glistening in the lamplight he sleeps on the bodega hills amid the oaks and madronas whose branches wave in the breezes of the blue pacific he has gone home to die no more End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The Ethics of Grizzly Hunting. On the Petaluma boat, I met him. He was on his way to Washington City for the purpose of presenting to the President of the United States a curious chair made entirely of buckhorns, a real marvel of ingenuity of which he was quite vain dressed in buckskin with fringed leggings and sleeves belted and bristling with hunter's arms strongly built and grisly bearded he was a striking figure as he sat the centre of a crowd of admirers his countenance was expressive of a mixture of brutality cunning and good humour he was a thorough animal wild frontier life had not sublimated this old sinner in the way pictured by writers who romance about such things at a distance contact with nature and indians does not seem to exalt the white man except in fiction it tends rather to draw him back toward barbarism the renegade white only differs from the red savage in being a shade more devilish this is seth kinman the great indian fighter and bear hunter said an officious passenger thus introduced i shook hands with him he seemed inclined to talk and was kind enough to say he had heard of me and voted for me making due acknowledgment of the honour done me i seated myself near enough to hear but not so near as to catch the fumes of the alcoholic stimulants of which he was in the habit of indulging freely his talk was of himself in connection with the indians and bears he seemed to look upon them in the same light as natural enemies to be circumvented or destroyed as opportunity permitted you can't trust an injun he said i know em if they get the upper hand of you they'll cinch you sure the only way to get along with them is to make em afear to you they'd a put a hour through me long ago if i hadn't made em believe i was a conjurer it happened this way i had a contract for furnishing venison for the troops in humboldt and took along a lot of injuns for the hunt we had mighty good luck and started back to eureka loaded down with the finest sort of deer meat i saw the injuns lagging behind and whispering to one another and mistrusted things wasn't exactly right so i keeps my eye on em and had old cotton blossom here caressing a long rusty-looking rifle ready in case anything should turn up you can't trust a injun they're all alike if they get the upper hand of you you're done he winked knowingly and chuckled and then went on i stopped and let the injuns come up and then got to talkin with them about huntin and shootin i told em i was a conjurer and couldn't be killed by a bullet or error and to prove it i took off my buckskin shirt and set it up twenty steps off and told em the man who could put a error through it might have it they were more than an hour shootin at that shirt the same one i've got on now 
but they couldn't phase it. How was that? asked an open-mouthed young fellow, blazing with cheap jewelry. Why, you see, young man, this shirt is well tanned and tough, and I just stood it up on the edge so that when a arrow struck it, it would naturally give way. If I had only had it on, the arrows would have gone clean through it, and me, too. Engines are mighty smart in some things, but they all believe in devils, conjuring, and such like. I played em fine on this idea, and they were feared to touch me, though they were ready enough if they had dared. While I was out chopping wood one day, I see a smoke rising, and thinking something must be wrong, I got back as soon as I could, and sure enough my house was burning. I knowed it was engines, and circling round I found the track of a big engine. It was plain enough to see where he had crossed the creek coming and going. I got his scalp. Why, his hair was that long, he said, measuring to his elbow, and leering hideously. Whether or not this incident was apocryphal I could not decide, but it was evident enough that he intensely relished the notion of scalping an Indian. "'I want you to come up to Humboldt and see me kill a grizzly,' he continued, addressing himself to me. "'And let me tell you now, if ever you shoot a grizzly, hit him about the ear. If you hit him right, you will kill him. If you don't kill him, you spile his mind. I have seen a grizzly, after he had been hit about the ear, go round and round like a top. No danger in a bar after you have hit him in the ear. It's his tender place. But a bar's mighty dangerous if you hit him anywhere else.' and don't kill him. Me and an engine was hunting in the chaparral and come across a big grizzly. We both blazed away at him at close range. I saw he was hit, for he whirled half round and partly keeled over. But he got up and started for us, mad as fury. We had no time to load, and there was nothing left but to run for it. It was nip and tuck between us. I'm a good runner, and the engine wasn't slow." Looking back, I saw the bar was gaining on us. I knowed he'd get one of us, and so I hauled off and knocked the engine down. Before he could get up, the bar had him. He paused and looked around complacently. Did the bear kill the Indian? asked the young man with abundant jewelry. No, he chawed him up a while and then left him, and the engine finally got well. If it had been a white man, he would have died. Engines can stand a great deal of hurtin' and not die. At this point the thought came into my mind that if this incident must be taken as a true presentation of the ethics of bear-hunting, as practiced by Mr. Kinman, I did not aspire to the honor of becoming his hunting companion. Are the ethics of the stock exchange any higher than those of the Humboldt bear-hunter? Let the bear, bankruptcy, or the devil take the hindmost, is the motto of human nature on its dark side, whether on Wall Street or in the California chaparral. "'Were you ever in Napa City?' he inquired of me. I answered in the affirmative. "'Did you see the big stuffed grizzly in the drug store? "'Yeah, huh? Eh? Well, I killed that bar, the biggest ever shot in California.' I was out one day looking for a deer about sundown, and heard the dogs a barkin' as they was comin' down Eel River. In a little while here come the bar, and a whopper he was. I raised old Cotton Blossom and let him have it as he passed me. I saw I had hit him, for he seemed to drag his lines, loins, as he plunged down the bank of the river among the grapevines and thick bushes. Next morning I took the dogs and put him on his trail. I could see that his back was broke, because I could see the print where his hind parts had dragged down the sandy bed of the river. By and by, I heard the dogs obeying, and I knowed they'd come up with him. I hurried up and found the bar sitting on his rump in a hole of water about three feet deep, snapping his teeth at the dogs as they swum around him, barking like fury. He couldn't get any further. Old Cotton Blossom had done his work for him. I thought I would have a little fun by aggravating him a while. "'What do you mean by aggravating the bear?' asked a bystander. "'I would just take big rocks and go up close to him and hit him between the eyes. You ought to have heard him yowl. His eyes actually turned green. He was so mad, and his jaws champed like a sawmill. But he couldn't budge. Every time he tried to get on his feet, he fell back again, the maddest bar ever seen.' At this point in the narrative, Kinman's sinister blue eyes gleamed with brute ferocity. 
my aversion to making him my hunting companion increased after i had my fun with him i took old cotton blossom and planted a bullet under his shoulder and he tumbled over dead it took four of us to pull him out of that hole and he weighed thirteen hundred pounds i had enough of this and left the group reflecting on the peculiar ethics of bear hunting the last glimpse i had of this child of nature he was chuckling over a grossly obscene picture which he was exhibiting to some congenial spirits his invitation to join him in a bear hunt has not yet been accepted End of chapter ten Chapter eleven of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eleven Stewart. I first met him in New Orleans in February eighteen fifty five. He was small, sandy haired, and whiskered, blue eyed, bushy headed, with an impediment in his speech, rapid in movement, and shy in manner. We were on our way to California and were fellow missionaries. At the advocate office on Magazine Street, he was discussed in my presence. He won't do for California, said one who has since filled a large space in the public eye. He won't do for that fast country. He is too timid and too slow. Never did a keen observer make a greater mistake in judging a man. Stewart stood with us on the deck of the Daniel Webster that afternoon as we swept down the mighty Mississippi, taking a last lingering look at the shores we were leaving, perhaps forever, and gazing upon the glories of the sunset on the gulf. I remember well the feelings of mingled sadness and curiosity and youthful hopefulness that swayed me until just as the twilight deepened into darkness we struck the long heavy sea swell and I lost at once my sentiment and my dinner. Seasickness is the only very distinct remembrance of those days on the gulf. Seasick, seasicker, seasickest. Stuart succumbed at once. He was very sick and very low-spirited. One day, in the Caribbean Sea, he had crawled out of his hot stateroom to seek a breath of fresh air under the awning on deck. He looked unutterably miserable as he said to me, do you believe in presentiments yes i do was my half jocular reply so do i he said with great solemnity and i have had a presentiment ever since we left new orleans that we should never reach california that we should be caught in a storm and the ship and all on board lost i have had a presentiment i answered that we shall arrive safe and sound in san francisco and that we shall live and labor many years in california and do some good now i will put my presentiment against yours he looked at me sadly and sighed as he looked out upon the boiling sea that seemed like molten copper under the midday blaze of the tropical sun and no more was said about presentiments he was with us at Greytown, where we went ashore and got our first taste of tropical scenery, and where we declined a polite invitation from a native to dine on stewed monkey and boiled iguana. The iguana is a species of big lizard, highly prized as a delicacy by the Nicaraguans. He enjoyed with us the sights and adventures of the journey across the isthmus this was a new world to him and us and not even the horrible profanity and vulgarity of the ninety roughs who came in the steerage from new york could destroy the charm and glory of the tropics among those ninety drinking swearing gambling fellows there were ninety revolvers and as we ascended the beautiful san juan river flowing between gigantic avenues of lofty teak and other trees and past the verdant grass islands that waved with the breeze and swayed with the motion of the limpid waters the volleys of oaths and firearms were alike incessant huge lazy rusty-looking alligators lined the banks of the rivers by hundreds and furnished targets for these free and easy americans who had left one part of their country for its good to seek a field congenial to their tastes and adapted to their talents the alligators took it all very easy in most cases rolling leisurely into the water as the bullets rattled harmlessly against their scaly sides 
one lucky shot hit a great monster in the eye and he bounded several feet into the air and lashed the water into foam with his struggles as the steamer swept out of sight the sport was now and then enlivened by the appearance of a few monkeys at whom or which the revolvered americans would blaze away as they the monkeys clambered in fright to the highest branches of the trees whiskey profanity and gunpowder three things dear to the devil and that go well together ruled the day and gave proof that north american civilization had found its way to those solitudes of nature birds of gayest plumage fluttered in the air and on either hand the forest blazed in all the vividness of the tropical flora now and then we would meet a bungo a long narrow river boat usually propelled by oars worked by eight tawny fellows whose costume was a panama hat and a cigar despite their primitive style of dress their manners contrasted favorably with the fellow passengers of whom i have spoken but i must hurry on nor suffer this sketch to be diverted from its proper course how we had to stop at night on the river and lie on the open deck while the woods echoed with the revelry of the roughs how we were detained at fort castillo and how i fared sumptuously being taken for a padre how i didn't throw the contemptible little whiffet who commanded the lake steamer overboard for his unbearable insolence how we landed in the surf at san juan del sur and got drenched how we rode mules in the darkness how nearly we escaped a massacre when a drunken american slapped the face of a native at the halfway house and got stabbed for it and five hundred muskets and the ninety revolvers were about to be used in shooting how we averted the catastrophe by a little strategy and galloped away on our mules the ladies thundering along after in concord wagons how at midnight we reached the blue pacific and gave vent to our joy in rousing cheers and how in due time we passed the golden gate in the night and waked up in san francisco harbor may not be told farther than what is given in this paragraph stuart was sent to the mines to preach this suited him some men shrink from hardships he seemed to dread only an easy place walking his mountain circuit sleeping in the rude miners cabins and sharing their rough fare he was looked upon as a strange sort of man who loved toil and forgot self such a man he was his greatest joy was the thought that he could do a work for his master where others could not or would not go it was with this feeling that he took the work of agent for the church paper and the college and wandered over california and oregon doing what was intensely repugnant to his natural feelings he once told me that he had been such a sinner in his youth that he felt it was right that he should bear the heaviest cross the idea of penance unconsciously entered into his view of christian duty and when he was roughing it in the mountains in midwinter his letters were most cheerful in tone in the city he was restive and the more comfortable were his quarters the more eager was he to get away he had fits of fearful mental depression at times when he would pass whole nights rapidly pacing his room with sighs and groans and tears his temper was quick and hot at a camp meeting in sacramento county he astonished beyond measure a disorderly fellow by giving him a sudden and severe caning after it was over stuart's shame and remorse were great everybody else however applauded the deed he had seen service as a soldier in the mexican war and was noted for his daring but now that he belonged to a non-combatant order he was mortified that for the moment his martial instincts had prevailed his moral courage was equal to any test no man dealt more plainly and sternly with the prevalent vices of california nor dealt more faithfully with a friend many a gambler and debauchee winced under his reproofs and many a methodist preacher and layman had his eyes opened by his rebukes but he was tender as well as faithful and he rarely gave offence he loved and was loved by little children and there is no stronger proof of a pure and gentle nature than that he was a protestant carmelite shunning ease and glorying only in what the flesh naturally abhors 
he would have been pained by popularity in the usual sense of the word any unusual attention distressed him and he always shrank from observation except when duty called him out a graduate of davidson college north carolina and a graduate in medicine he was more anxious to conceal his learning than most men are to parade theirs but the luster of such a jewel could not be hid and that popular instinct which recognizes true souls had given stuart his proper rank before his fellow preachers knew his full value when the war broke out in eighteen sixty one stuart was preaching in los angeles county the roar of the great conflict reached him and he became restless he felt that he ought to share the dangers and sufferings of the south in reply to a letter from him asking my advice i advised him not to go but in a few days i got a note from him saying that he had prayed over the matter and felt it his duty to go he was needed in the hospital work and he could not shrink i doubt not there was a subtle attraction to him in the danger and hardship to be met and endured the next news was that he had started across mexico to the rio grande alone on horseback with his saddle-bags bible and a hymn-book shortly after crossing the mexican border he fell in with a man who gave his name as mcmanus who told him he was also bound to texas and offered his company stuart consented and they rode on together in what proved to be the path of fate to both on the third day that they had journeyed in company they stopped in a lonely place under the shade of some trees near a spring of water to rest and eat as usual stuart read a chapter or two in his pocket bible and then took out his diary and began to write mcmanus now saw the opportunity he was seeking seizing stuart's gun he placed the muzzle against his breast and fired he staggered back and fell the life-blood gushing from his heart and with a few gasps and moans he was dead the last words he had just traced in his diary were these lord jesus guide and keep me this day providence has presented to my mind no greater or sadder mystery than such a death for such a man mcmanus rode back to the little town of rosario scarcely caring to conceal his awful crime among the desperadoes with whom he associated he rode stuart's horse and took with the well-worn saddle-bags the bible the hymn-book and the eight hundred dollars in gold which had led him to commit the cruel murder a small party of texans happened to be passing through that region who hearing what had been done arrested the murderer but mcmanus's mexican friends interfered and forced the texans to liberate him but the devil lured the murderer on to his fate he started again toward the rio grande still mounted on the murdered preacher's horse and again he fell into the hands of the texans what befell him then was not stated definitely in the narrative given by one of the party it was merely said mcmanus will kill no more preachers this does not leave a very wide field for the exercise of the imagination stuart was buried where he met his strange and tragic end of all the men who bore the banner of the cross in the early days of california there was no truer or knightlier soul than his End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of california sketches by oscar penn fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve a mendocino murder among my occasional hearers when i preached on weber avenue in stockton was a handsome sunny-faced young man who i was informed was studying for the ministry of the presbyterian church his manners were easy and graceful his voice pleasant his smile winning and his whole appearance prepossessing to an unusual degree he was one of the sort of men that everybody likes at first sight i lost trace of him when i left the place but retained a decidedly pleasant remembrance of him and a hopeful interest in his welfare and usefulness my surprise may be imagined when a few years afterwards i found him in jail charged with complicity in one of the most horrible murders ever perpetrated in any country 
it was during my pastorate in santa rosa in 1873 that i was told that geiger a prisoner confined in the county jail awaiting trial for murder had asked to see me upon visiting him in his cell i found that his business with me was not concerning his soul but his family they were very poor and since his imprisonment matters had been going worse and worse with them until they were in actual want knowing well the warm-hearted community of santa rosa i did not hesitate to promise in their name relief for his wife and children after having satisfied him on this point i tried to lead the conversation to the subject of religion but seeing he was not disposed to talk further i withdrew before leaving the jail however i was asked to visit another prisoner charged with participation in the same murder on going into his cell the recognition was mutual it was alexander whom i had known and to whom i had preached at stockton i little thought when i saw you last that we would meet in such a place as this he said with emotion how comes it that you are here surely you cannot be the murderer of a woman i asked perhaps a little abruptly it is a curious case and a long story he said it will come out on the trial i looked at him with an interrogation point in my eyes could that pale meditative scholarly looking young man be capable of taking part in such a dark tragedy as that of the murder of which he had been accused i left him inclined to pronounce him innocent despite the strong evidence against him but the conviction of many who watched the trial a few months later was clear that he was one of mrs strong's slayers briefly given here is the story of the murder as gathered from the evidence on the trial and recollected after the lapse of several years mrs strong was a middle-aged woman with a violent temper and hardened nature so often met with in women who have been subjected to the influences of such a life as she had led among rough men and in a rough country where might too often makes right geiger and alexander lived not far from the strongs in the wildest region of mendocino county a quarrel arose between these two men on one side and mrs strong on the other concerning land the particulars of which have passed my memory it seems that the right of the case lay rather with the men and that mrs strong with a woman's peculiar talent for provocation rather presumed on her sex in ignoring their claims at the same time forfeiting all right to consideration on that score by violent language and unwomanly taunts whenever she met them according to the most charitable theory and to me it seems the most reasonable geiger and alexander previously angered by unreasonable opposition accidentally met mrs strong in a piece of woods the subject of dispute was brought up and it is supposed that the unfortunate woman became more and more violent and abusive until finally maddened by her words one of the men geiger it is supposed struck her down then seeing that she was injured fatally and fearing discovery he and alexander finished the job and fastening a heavy stone to her neck hid the body in one of the darkest holes of the stream that flowed through those wild hills piling stones on the breast and limbs of the corpse to ensure concealment of course mrs strong was missed and search for her began in which her two murderers were forced to join what a terrible time that was for the two men those rides through the woods and canyons a hundred times passing the dreadful spot with its awful secret surely worse punishment on earth for their terrible crime could not be conceived those two instruments of human torture which the inquisition has never surpassed remorse and fear were both gnawing at the hearts of these wretched men during all of that long and futile search but it was given up at last and they breathed easier a few weeks after an indian on his pony riding through the woods felt thirsty and turned down the canyon to a spot where the trees stood thick and the rocks jutted out over the water like greedy monsters looking at their helpless prey beneath 
he stooped to quench his thirst in the primitive fashion but before his lips had touched the water his roving eye caught sight of a swaying something a little way up the stream that made even that stolid red man shrink from drinking that sparkling fluid for it had flowed over the body of a dead woman mrs strong was found the force of the stream had washed away the weighing stones from the lower limbs and the stream having fallen several feet since the heavy rains of the past weeks the feet of the corpse were visible above the water the stone was still attached to the neck thus keeping all but these ghastly feet under the water the long hidden murder was out at last and the quiet indian riding away on his tired pony carried with him the fate of geiger and alexander when the news was told it was remembered how unwilling they had been to search near that spot and how uneasy and excited they had seemed whenever it was approached indeed they had been objects of suspicion to many and the discovery of the body was followed immediately by their arrest the trial resulted in the acquittal of alexander the justice of which was questioned by many and a sentence of lifelong imprisonment for geiger before his removal to the state prison however he made his escape aided it is supposed by his wife who is thought to have brought him tools for that purpose secreted in her clothing he has never been found and in all probability never will be some say he has never left the country and is living the life of a wild animal in the mountains there but it is more likely that he like the first murderer fled to far lands where he must ever bear the scarlet letter of remorse in his heart end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen My First California Camp Meeting. A California camp meeting I had never seen, and so when the eccentric Dr. Cannon, who was dentist, evangelist, and many other things all at once, sent me an invitation to be present at one that was soon to come off near Vallecito in Calaveras County, I promptly signified my acceptance and began preparation for the trip it was in eighteen fifty six when we occupied the parsonage in sonora that had been bequeathed to us in all its peculiar glory by our bachelor predecessors it had one room which served all the purposes of parlor library dining-room and boudoir the bookcase was two dry good boxes placed lengthways one above the other the safe or cupboard was a single dry goods box nailed to the redwood boards of which the house was built with cleats for our breakfast dinner and tea sets which though mentioned here in plural form were singular in more than one sense of the word the establishment boasted a kitchen the roof of which was less than the regulation height of the american soldier the floor of which was made by nature the one window of which had neither sash nor glass the door of which had no lock but was kept shut by a small leather strap and an eightpenny nail and its successors the thieves did not steal from us they couldn't dear old cabin on the hillside it brings up only pleasant memories of a time when life was young and hope was bright when we closed the door of the parsonage and sitting behind mccarthy and cooper's two-horse team one a beautiful white the other a shining bay dashed out of town in the direction of the bold and brawling stanislaus no fear was felt for any valuables left behind the prancing of that spirited white horse on the narrow grade that wound its way a thousand feet above the bed of the river was a more serious matter suggesting the possibility of an adventure that would have prevented the writing of these sketches the stanislaus having its sources among the springs and snows of the sierras was a clear and sparkling stream before the miners muddied it by digging its banks and its bed for gold it cuts its way through a wild and rugged region dashing foaming fighting for its passage along narrow passes where the beetling cliffs and toppling crags repel the invasion of a human foot it seems in hot haste to reach the valley and fairly leaps down its rocky channel 
in high water it roars and rushes with terrific violence but it was behaving quietly as we passed it keeping within its narrow channel along which a number of patient chinamen were working over some abandoned gold diggings wearing satisfied looks indicating success success is the rule with the chinaman he is acquisitive by nature and thrifty from necessity he has taught the conceited americans some astonishing lessons in the matter of cheap living but they are not thankful for the instruction nor are they disposed to reduce it to practice they are not yet prepared to adopt asiatic ideas of living and labor the contact of the two civilizations produces only friction now what the future may bring forth i will not here prophesy as this has properly nothing to do with the camp meeting an expected circus had rather thrown the camp meeting into the background the highly colored sensational posters were seen in every conspicuous place and the talk of the hotel keepers hostlers and straggling pedestrians was all about the circus the camp meeting was a bold experiment under the circumstances the campground was less than a mile from Vallecito, a mining camp whose reputation was such as to suggest the need of special evangelical influences. It was attacking the enemy in his stronghold. The spot selected for the encampment was a beautiful one. On a gentle slope, in the midst of a grove of live oaks, a few rude tents were pitched with sides of undressed redwood and covered with nothing so that the stars could be gazed at during the still hours of the cloudless california summer night the preacher's stand was erected under one of the largest of the oaks in front of which were ranged rough backless seats for the accommodation of the worshippers a well of pure water was close at hand and a long table composed of undressed boards was spread under clustering pines conveniently situated nobody thought of a tablecloth and the crockery used was small in quantity and plain in quality during the first day and night of the meeting small but well-behaved audiences waited upon the word manifesting apparently more curiosity than religious interest the second night was a solemn and trying time the crowd had rushed to the circus three or four preachers and about a dozen hearers held the campground the lanterns swung in the oaks gave a dim uncertain light the gusts of wind that rose and fell and moaned among the branches of the trees threatening their extinguishment every moment one or two of the lights flickered out entirely increasing the gloom and the weirdness of the scene it was a solemn time the sermon was solemn the hearers were solemn and there was a solemnity of cadence in the night wind everybody seemed gloomy and discouraged but the irrepressible canon he was in high glee the lord is going to do a great work here he said at the close of the service rubbing his hands together excitedly what makes you think so the devil is busy working against us and when the devil works the lord is sure to work too the people are all at the circus tonight, but their consciences will be uneasy the holy spirit will be at work with them tomorrow night you will see a great crowd here and souls will be converted perhaps there were few that endorsed his logic or shared his faith but the result singularly verified his prophecy the circus left the camp the reaction seemed to be complete a great crowd came out the next night the lights burned more brightly the faithful felt better the preachers took fire penitents were invited and came forward for prayers and for the first time the old camp meeting choruses echoed among the calaveras hills the meeting continued day and night the crowd increasing at every service until sunday many a wandering believer coming in from the hills and gulches had his conscience quickened and his religious hopes rekindled and the little handful that sung and prayed at the beginning of the meeting swelled to quite an army on sunday bishop kavanaugh preached to an immense crowd that eloquent kentuckian was in one of his inspired moods and swept everything before him for nearly two hours he held the vast concourse of people spellbound and toward the end of his sermon his form seemed to dilate his face kindled with its pulpit radiance and his voice was like a golden trumpet 
amens and shouts burst forth all around the stand and tears rained from hundreds of eyes long unused to the melting mood california had her camp meeting christening that day attracted by curiosity a digger indian chief with a number of bucks and squaws had come upon the ground the chief had seated himself against a tree on the outer edge of the crowd and never took his eyes from the bishop for a moment i watched him almost as closely as he watched the bishop for i was curious to know what were the thoughts passing through his benighted mind and to see what effect the service would have upon him his interest seemed to increase as the discourse proceeded at length he showed signs of profound emotion his bosom heaved tears streamed down his tawny cheeks and finally in a burst of irrepressible admiration he pointed to the bishop and exclaimed capitaine capitaine the chief did not understand english what was it that so stirred his soul was it the voice the gesture the play of feature the magnetism of the true orator the good bishop said it was the holy spirit the wind that bloweth where it listeth the sunday night service drew another large audience and culminated in a great victory the singing and prayers were kept up away beyond midnight the impression of one song i shall never forget the bishop was my bedfellow we had retired for the night and were stretched on our primitive couch gazing unobstructed upon the heavenly host shining on high hark listen to that song said the bishop as a chorus in a clear bugle-like voice floated out upon the midnight air the words i do not clearly recall there was something about the sweet fields of eden on the other side of jordan and a chorus ending in hallelujah i seemed to float upward on the wings of that melody beyond the starry depths through the gates of pearl until it seemed to mingle with the sublime doxologies of the great multitude of the glorified that no one can number what opera can equal that there is a religious melody that has a quality of its own which no art can imitate the bishop's thought was not new but i had a new perception of its truth at that moment one of the converts of this camp meeting was levi van slyke a wilder mustang was never caught by the gospel lasso excuse this figure it suits the case he was what was termed a capper to a gambling hell in the town tall excessively angular jerky in movement with singularly uneven features his face and figure were very striking he drifted with the crowd to the campground one night and his destiny was changed he never went back to gambling his conscience was awakened and his soul mightily stirred by the preaching prayers and songs amid the wonder and smiles of the crowd he rose from his seat went forward and kneeled among the penitents exhibiting signs of deep distress an arrow of conviction had penetrated his heart and brought him down at the foot of the cross there he knelt praying the services were protracted far into the night exhortations songs and prayers filling up the time suddenly van slyke rose from his knees with a bound his face beaming with joy and indulged in demonstrations which necessitated the suspension of all other exercises he shouted and praised god he shook hands with the brethren he exhorted his late associates to turn from their wicked ways in fact he took possession of the campground and the regular program for the occasion was entirely superseded the wild Vallecito boys were awestruck and quailed under his appeals. Van Slyke was converted, a brand plucked from the burning. No room was left for doubt. He abandoned his old life at once. Soon he felt inward movings to preach the gospel and began to study theology. He was a hard student, if not an apt one, and succeeded in passing the examinations, which in those days were not very rigid and in due time was standing as a watchman on the walls of zion he was a faithful and useful minister of jesus christ there was no backward movement in his religious life he was faithful unto death taking the hardest circuits uncomplainingly always humble self-denying and cheerful doing a work for his master which many a showier man might covet in the day when he will reckon with his servants 
he traveled and preached many years a true soldier of jesus christ he died in great peace and is buried among the hills of southern oregon an episode connected with this camp meeting was a visit to the big tree grove of calaveras every reader is familiar with descriptions of this wonderful forest but no description can give an adequate impression of its solemn grandeur and beauty the ride from murphy's camp in the early morning the windings of the road among the colossal and shapely pines the burst of wonder and delight of some of our party and the silent yet perhaps deeper enjoyment of others as we rode into the midst of the titanic grove all this made an experience which cannot be transferred to the printed page the remark of the thoughtful woman who walked by my side expressed the sentiment that was uppermost in my own consciousness as i contemplated these wonders of the almighty's handiwork god has created one spot where he will be worshipped and it is this end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of california sketches by oscar penn fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the tragedy at algerine how algerine camp got its name i cannot tell it was named before my day in california the miners called it simply algerine for short they had a peculiar way of abbreviating all proper names san francisco was frisco chinese camp was chinee and jamestown was jimtown so algerine was as many syllables as could be spared for this camp whose fame still lingers as one of the richest rowdiest bloodiest camps of the southern mines situated some seven or eight miles from sonora if in the early days it did not rival that lively city in size it surpassed it in the recklessness with which its denizens gave themselves up to drinking fighting gambling and general licentiousness the name suited the place whatever may have been its etymology it was at the height of its glory for rich diggings and bad behavior in eighteen fifty one lucky strikes and wild doings were the order of the day a tragedy at algerine ceased to excite more than a feeble interest tragedies there had become commonplace the pistol was the favorite weapon with the algerines but the monotony of shooting was now and then broken by a stabbing affair of which a mexican or native californian was usually the hero it was a disputed point whether the revolver or the dirk was the safer and more effective weapon in a free fight strong arguments were used on both sides of this interesting question and popular opinion in the camp vacillated taking direction according to the result of the last encounter with all its wickedness algerine had a public opinion and moral code of its own the one sin that had no forgiveness was stealing the remaining nine of the ten commandments nobody seemed to remember but a stand was taken upon the eighth men that swore ignored the sabbath gambled got drunk and were ready to use the pistol or knife on the slightest pretext would flame with virtuous rage and clamor for capital punishment if a sluice were robbed or the least article of any sort stolen a thief was more completely outlawed than a murderer the peculiar conditions existing and the genius of the country combined to develop this anomalous public sentiment which will be illustrated by an incident that occurred in the year above referred to about nine o'clock one morning a messenger was seen riding at full speed through the main street of sonora his horse panting and white with foam he made his way to the sheriff's office and on the appearance of one of the deputies cried well i won't give his exact words for they are not quotable but the substance of his message was that a robbery had been committed at algerine that a mob had collected and that one of the supposed robbers was in their hands hurry up captain or you'll be too late to do any good the camp is just boiling captain stewart the deputy sheriff was soon in the saddle and on the way to algerine stewart was a soldierly-looking man over six feet high square-shouldered brawny and with a dash of gracefulness in his bearing he had fought in the war with mexico was known to be as brave as a lion and was a general favorite on a wider field he has since achieved a wider fame 
there they are captain said the messenger pointing to the hill overlooking the camp from the north my god it's only a boy exclaimed stuart as his eyes took in the scene stripped of all but his shirt and white pants bareheaded and barefooted with a rope around his neck the other end of which was held by a big brutal-looking fellow in a blue flannel shirt stood the victim of mob fury he could scarcely be more than eighteen years old his boyish face was pale as death and was turned with a pleading look toward the huge fellow who held the rope and who seemed to be the leader of the mob he had begged hard for his life and many hearts had been touched with pity it's a shame boys to hang a child like that said one with a choking voice it would be an eternal disgrace to the camp to allow it said another immediately surrounding the prisoner there was a growing party anxious to save him whose intercessions had made quite a delay already but the mob was bloodthirsty and loud in its clamor for the hanging to go on up with him what are you waiting for lift him bill and similar demands were made by a hundred voices at once in the midst of this contention stuart having dismounted pushed his way by main strength through the crowd and reached the side of the prisoner whose face brightened with hope as the tall form of the officer of the law towered above him the appearance of the officer seemed to excite the mob and a rush was made for the prisoner amid a storm of oaths and yells stuart's eye kindled as he cried keep back you hounds i'll blow out the brains of the first man that touches this boy the front rank of the mob paused keeping in check the yelling crowd behind them the big fellow holding the rope kept his eye on stuart and seemed for the moment ready to surrender the honors of leadership to anybody who was covetous of the same the cowardly brute quailed before a brave man's glance he still held the rope but kept his face averted from his intended victim stuart taking advantage of the momentary silence made an earnest appeal to the mob pointing to the pale and trembling boy he reminded them that he was only a youth the mere tool and victim of the older criminals who had made their escape to hang him would be simply murder and every one who might have a hand in it would be haunted by the crime through life men you are mad when you talk of hanging a mere boy like that are you savages where is your manhood instead of murdering him it would be better to send him back to his poor old mother and sisters in the states the central group at this point presented a striking picture the poor boy standing bareheaded in the sun looking in his white garments as if he were already shrouded gazing wistfully around stuart holding the crowd at bay standing like a rock his tall form erect his face flushed and his eyes flashing the burly leader of the mob rope in hand his coarse features expressing mingled fear and ferocity the faces of the rabble some touched with compassion others turned upon the prisoner threateningly while the great mass of them wore only that look of thoughtless animal excitement which makes a mob at once so dangerous and so contemptible a thing all made a scene for an artist again cries of up with him hang him no more palaver were raised on the outer ranks of the mob and another rush was made toward the prisoner stuart's voice and eye again arrested the movement he appealed to their manhood and mercy in the most persuasive and impassioned manner and it was evident that his appeals were not without effect on some of the men nearest to him seeing this several of the more determined ruffians with oaths and cries of fury suddenly rushed forward with such impetuosity that stuart was borne backward by their weight the rope was grasped by several hands at once and the prisoner was jerked with such violence as to pull him off his feet at this moment the sound of horses hoofs was heard and in another instant the reckless daredevil billy worth mounted on a powerful bay pistol in hand had opened a lane through the crowd and quick as thought he cut the rope that bound the prisoner and with the assistance of two or three friendly hands lifted him into the saddle before him and galloped off in the direction of sonora the mob was paralyzed by the audacity of this proceeding and attempted no immediate pursuit the fact is worth's reputation as a desperate fighter and sure shot was such that none of them had any special desire to get within range of his revolver if his virtues had equalled his courage billy worth's name would have been one of the brightest on the roll of california's heroes
at this time he was an attache of the sheriff's office and was always ready for such desperate service he never paused until he had his prisoner safely locked in jail at sonora the mob dispersed slowly and sullenly and as the sequel proved still bent on mischief the next morning the early risers in sonora were thrilled with horror to find the poor boy hanging by the neck from a branch of an oak on the hillside above the city hotel the algerine mob had reorganized marched into town at dead of night overpowered the jailer taken out their victim and hung him by sunrise thousands drawn by the fascination of horror had gathered to the spot and now that the poor lad was hanging there dead there was only pity felt for his fate and detestation of the crime committed by his cruel murderers the body was cut down and tenderly buried women's hands placing flowers upon his coffin and women's tears falling upon the cold face a singular fact must be added to this narrative the tree on which the boy was hanged was a healthy vigorous young oak in full leaf in a few days its every leaf had withered this statement is made on the testimony of respectable living witnesses whose reputation for veracity is unquestioned the next year the tree put forth its buds and leaves as usual this fact is left to the incredulity superstition or scientific inquiry of the reader the tree may be still standing as a memento of a horrible crime End of chapter fourteen Chapter fifteen of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifteen The Blue Lakes It is not strange that the Indians think the Blue Lakes are haunted, and that even the white man's superstition is not proof against the weird and solemn influence that broods over this spot of almost unearthly beauty. They are about ten miles from Lakeport, the beautiful county seat of Lake County, which nestles among the oaks on the margin of Clear Lake, a body of water about thirty miles long and eight miles wide, surrounded by scenery so lovely as to make the visitor forget for the time that there is any ugliness in the world. The first sight of Clear Lake from the highest point of the great range of hills shutting it in on the south will never be forgotten by anyone who has a soul after winding slowly up 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 the mountain road a sharp turn is made and you are on the summit the driver stops his panting team you spring out of the thoroughbrace and look and look immediately below you is a sea of hills stretching away to where they break against the lofty rampart of the coast range on your left and in front sinking gradually down into the valley below the lake lies beneath you flashing like a mirror in the sunlight its northern shore marked by rugged brown acclivities the nearer side dotted with towns villages and farms while uncle sam the monarch peak of all the region lifts his awful head into the clouds the sparkling waters kissing his feet i once saw uncle sam transfigured it was a day of storm the wind howled among the gorges of the hills and the dark clouds swept above them in mighty masses the rain falling in fitful and violent showers pausing at the summit to rest the horse and to get a glance at the scene in its wintry aspect i drew my gray shawl closer and leaned forward and gazed it was about the middle of the afternoon suddenly a rift in the clouds westward let the sunshine through and falling on uncle sam lo a miracle the whole mountain from base to summit softened blushed and blazed with the prismatic colors it was a transfiguration the scene is symbolic behind me and about me are cloud and tempest typing the humanity of the past and the present with its conflicts and trials and dangers before me the glorified mountain typing the humanity of the future enveloped in the rainbow of peace showing that the storms are all over this was my interpretation to my friend who sat by my side but i do not insist upon it as canonical the blue lakes lie among the hills above clear lake and the road leads through the dense forests of which the gigantic white oaks are the most striking feature 
it passes through scott's valley a little body of rich land the terraced hills behind and the lake before winding upward the ascent is so gradual that you do not realize until you are told that the blue lakes are six hundred feet above the level of clear lake the lakes are three in number and in very high water they are connected they are each perhaps a mile in length and only a few hundred yards in width their depth is immense their waters are a particularly bright blue color and so clear that objects are plainly seen many fathoms below the surface they are hemmed in by the mountains the road being cut in the side of the overhanging bluff while on the opposite side bold rugged brown cliffs rise in almost perpendicular walls from the water's edge a growth of oaks shades the narrow vale between the lakes and the mountain pine and oak madrona and manzanita clothe the heights there are the blue lakes a solemnity and awe steal over you speech seems almost profane the very birds seem to hush their singing as they flit in silence among the trees the chatter of a gray squirrel has an audacious sound as the bushy-tailed little hoodlum dashes across the grade and rushes up a tree the coo of a turtle dove away off in a distant canyon falls on the ear like the echo of a human sorrow that had found soothing but not healing the sky overhead is as blue as the drapery of guido's madonna and there is just a hint of a breeze sighing over the still waters like the respiration of a peaceful sleeper the cliffs above the lake duplicate themselves in the water beneath with startling lifelikeness and with the spell of the place upon you it would scarcely surprise you to see unearthly shapes emerge from the crystal depths the feeling of superstitious awe is perhaps increased by the knowledge of the fact that no indian will go near these lakes they say a monster inhabits the upper lake and has subterranean communication with the two lower ones and of this monster they have a mortal terror this terror is explained by the following legend many many moons ago when the ukiah indians were great and strong people a fair-haired white man of great stature came from the seashore alone and took up his abode with them he knew many things and was stronger than any warrior of the tribe the chief took him to his own campudi and gave him his daughter for his wife made him his son she loved the white man and never tired in looking upon his fair face and into his bright blue eyes but by and by the white man tiring of his indian bride and longing to see his own people turned his face again toward the sea and fled she followed him swiftly and overtaking him at the blue lakes gently reproached him for his desertion of her and entreated him to return they were standing on the rock overhanging the lake on its northern side he took her hand smiling and spoke deceitful words and then suddenly seizing her hurled her with all his strength headlong into the lake she sunk to the bottom while the white man resumed his flight and was seen no more his murdered bride was transformed into an evil genius of the lake the long and sinuous outline of a serpentine form would be seen on the surface of the water out of which would be lifted at intervals the head of a woman with long bright hair and sad filmy blue eyes into which whosoever looked would die before another twelve moons had passed the indians would go miles out of their way to avoid the haunted spot and more than one white man affirmed that they had seen the monster of clear lake one stormy day in the winter of eighteen hundred and sixty something i was with a friend on my way from ukiah to lakeport by way of the blue lakes after swimming russian river always a bold and rapid stream but then swollen and angry from recent heavy rains urging our trusty span of horses through the storm at length we reached the grade winding along above the lakes the darkened heavens hung pall-like over the waters the clouds weeping and the wind moaning dense clouds boiled up along the mountain peaks veiling their heads in white folds no sign of life was visible we drove slowly and were silent feeling the spell of the place there's the monster i suddenly exclaimed where 
asked my companion starting and straining his gaze upon the lake below there it was a long dark mass with serpent-like movement winding its way across the lake it suddenly vanished without lifting above the water the woman's head with the bright hair and filmy eyes my companion expressed the prosaic idea that it was a school of fish swimming near the surface but i am sure we saw all there was of the monster of the blue lakes End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of california sketches by oscar pen fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen old tuolumne footnote tuolumne county fondly called old tuolumne by former residents was in the early days one of the richest and most populous of the mining regions of california here the author lived in the fifties End note the bearded men in rude attire with nerves of steel and hearts of fire the women few but fair and sweet like shadowy visions dim and fleet again their voices fill my ear as through the past i faintly hear the muse o'er buried joy and pain and tread the hills of youth again as speed the torrents strong and wild adown the mountains roughly piled to find the plain and there must sink in thirsty sands that eager drink so tides of life that early rolled through old tuolumne's hills of gold are spread and lost in other lands or swallowed in the desert sands o days of youth o days of power again ye come for one glad hour to let us taste once more the joy that time may dim but not destroy ye are not lost our pulses thrill to hear sweet voices long since still again hope's air-built castles bright float full before the enchanted sight and as the streams that sink from sight in desert sands and leave the light to the far seas make silent way to swell their tides some distant day so lives that sink and fade from view like scattered drops of rain and dew shall gather with the deathless souls where the eternal ocean rolls End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of california sketches by oscar pen fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen ben ben was a black man his african blood was unmixed his black skin was true ebony his lips were as thick as the thickest his nose was as flat as the flattest his head as woolly as the wooliest his immense lips were red and their redness was not a mark of beauty only giving a grotesque effect to a physiognomy no part of which presented the least element of the aesthetic he had neither feet nor legs but was quite a lively pedestrian shuffling his way on his stumps which were protected by thick leather coverings ben when i first knew him kept a bootblack stand near the post office in san francisco he also kept postage stamps on sale he was talkative and all his talk was about religion his patrons listened with wonder or amusement a bootblack that talked religion in the very vortex of the seething sea of san francisco mammonism was a new thing and then ben's quaint way of speaking lent a special interest to his words and his enjoyment of his one theme was catching he was more given to the relation of experience than to polemics when he touched upon some point that moved him he would unconsciously pause in his work his exulting voice arresting the attention of many a hurried passer-by as he spoke of the love of jesus and of the peace of god he slept at night in the little cage of a place in which he polished boots and shoes by day many a time when i have passed the spot at early dawn on my way to take the first boat for sacramento i have heard his voice singing a hymn inside a lark's matin song could not be freer or more joyful it seemed to be the literal bubbling over of a soul full of love and joy 
the melody of ben's morning song has followed me many and many a mile by steamboat and by rail it was the melody of a soul that had learned the sublime secret which the millionaires of the metropolis might well give their millions to buy ben had been a slave in missouri in the old days antebellum he spoke kindly of his former owners who had treated him well being liberated he emigrated to california and found his way to san francisco a waif that had floated into a new world how came you to be so crippled ben i asked him one day as he was lingering on the final touches on my second boot being in one of his happiest and most voluble moods my feet and legs got froze in missouri sir and they had to be cut off that was a hard trial for you wasn't it no sir it didn't hurt me as much as i expected it would and i knowed it was all for de best else twouldn't have happened ter me de loss of dem legs don't keep me from gettin round and my health's as good as anybody's de lord treats me kind and most everybody has a kind word for ben bless god he makes me happy without legs the plantation patois clave to ben and among the sounds of the many-tongued multitude of san francisco it had a charm to ears to which it was familiar in early days it was like the song of a land bird at sea ben had a great joy when his people bought and moved into their house of worship he gave a hundred dollars which he had laid by for that object a dime at a time it made him happier to give that money than to have been remembered in vanderbilt's will wanted to give a hundred dollars to help buy de house and i know de lord wanted me to do it too cause de customers poured in and kept me busy all day long once in a while a gentleman would hand me a quarter or half dollar and wouldn't wait for change i knowed what dat meant it was for dat hundred dollars ben's big dull white eyes were not capable of much expression but his broad black face beamed with grateful satisfaction as he gave me this little bit of personal history a trustee of his church told me that they were not willing at first to take the money from ben but that they saw plainly it would not do to refuse it was the fulfillment of a cherished object that he had carried so long in his simple trusting heart that to have rejected his gift would have been cruelty the last time i saw ben he was working his way along a crowded thoroughfare dragging his heavy leathers his head reaching to the waist of the average man how are you ben i said as we met bless god i'm first-rate he said grasping my hand warmly his face brightening and every tooth visible it was clear he had not lost the secret ben was not a methodist he was what is popularly called a campbellite end of chapter seventeen Chapter Eighteen of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen: A Youthful Desperado. There's a young chap in the jail over there. You ought to go and see. It's the one who killed the two Chinamen on Woods Creek a few weeks ago. He goes by the name of Tom Ellis. He is scarcely more than a boy, but he is a hard one. Maybe you can do him some good this was said to me by one of the sheriff's deputies a kind-hearted fellow but brave as a lion one of those quiet low-voiced men who do the most daring things in a matter-of-course way a man who never made threats and never showed a weapon except when he was about to use it with deadly effect the next day i went over to see the young murderer i was startled at his youthful appearance and struck with his beauty his features were feminine in their delicacy and his skin was almost as soft and fair as a child's he had dark hair bright blue eyes and white teeth he was of medium size and was faultless in physique though heavily ironed his step was vigorous and springy indicating unusual strength and agility this fair-faced almost girlish youth had committed one of the most atrocious double murders ever known approaching two chinamen who were working an abandoned mining claim on the creek he demanded their gold dust exhibiting at the same time a bowie knife 
the chinamen terrified dropped their mining tools and fled pursued by the young devil who fleet of foot soon overtook the poor creatures and with repeated stabs in the back cut them down a passer-by found him engaged in rifling their pockets of the gold dust to the value of about twenty dollars which had tempted him to commit the horrid crime these were the facts in the case as brought out in the trial it was also shown that he had borne a very bad name associating with the worst characters and being suspected strongly of other crimes against life and property he was convicted and sentenced to death this was the man i had come to see he received me politely but i made little progress in my attempt to turn his thoughts to the subject of preparation for death he allowed me to read the bible in his cell and pray for him but i could see plainly enough that he took no interest in it i left a bible with him with the leaves turned down to mark such portions of the word of god as would be most likely to do him good and he promised to read it but it was evident he did not do it for weeks i tried in every possible way to reach his conscience and sensibilities but in vain i asked him one day have you a mother living yes she lives in ohio and is a member of the baptist church does she know where you are no she thinks i'm dead and she will never know any better it's just as well it would do the old lady no good the name i go by here is not my real name no man in california knows my true name even this cord did not respond he was as cold and hard as ice i kept up my visits to him and continued my efforts to win him to thoughts suitable to his condition but he never showed the least sign of penitence or feeling of any kind he was the only human being i have ever met who did not have a tender spot somewhere in his nature if he had any such spot my poor skill failed to discover it one day after i had spent an hour or more with him he said to me you mean well in coming here to see me and i'm always glad to see you as i get very lonesome but there's no use in keeping up any deception about the matter i don't care anything about religion and all your talk on that subject is wasted but if you could help me to get out of this jail so that i could kill the man whose evidence convicted me i would thank you damn him i would be willing to die if i could kill him first as he spoke his eyes glittered like a serpent's and i felt that i was in the presence of a fiend from this time on there was no disguise on his part he thirsted for blood and hated to die chiefly because it cut him off from his revenge he did not deny the commission of the murders and cared no more for it than he would for the shooting of a rabbit as a psychological study he profoundly interested me and i sought to learn more of his history that i might know how much of his fiendishness was due to organic tendency and how much to evil association but he would tell nothing of his former life and i was left to conjecture as to what were the influences that had so completely blasted every bud and blossom of good in one so young and he was so handsome he made several desperate attempts to break jail and was loaded down with extra irons and put under special guard the night before his execution he slept soundly and ate a hearty breakfast next morning at the gallows he showed no fear or emotion of any kind he was brooding on his revenge to the last moment it is well for short that i didn't get out of this i would like to live long enough to kill him were about the last words he uttered in a sort of soliloquizing way the black cap was drawn over his fair face and without a quiver of the nerves or the least tremor of the pulse he was launched into the world of spirits the rabble looking on with mingled curiosity awe and pity End of chapter eighteen Chapter 19 of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 North Beach, San Francisco. 
north beach in its gentle mood is as quiet as a quaker maiden and as lovely but when fretted by the rude sea wind it is like a virago in her tantrums i have looked upon it at the close of a bright clear day fascinated by the changing glories of a gorgeous sunset the still ships seemed asleep upon the placid waters above the golden gate hung a drapery of burning clouds almost too bright for the naked eye tamopius footnote a lofty peak of the coast range that shoots its bare summit high into the sky north of the bay and within a few miles of the golden gate from which the view is one of marvellous scope and surpassing beauty End note. Tamopius, towering above the Marin Hills, wrapped in his evening robe of royal purple, sat like a king on his throne. The islands in sight, sunlit and calm, seemed to be dreaming in the soft embrace of the blue waters. Above the golden glow of the breezy Contra Costa hills, the sky blushed rosy red, as if conscious of its own charms as the sun sunk into the pacific in a blaze of splendor the bugle of fort alcatraz pealing over the waters told that the day was done and then the scene gradually changed the cloud fires that blazed above the gates of gold died out the purple of tamopias deepened into blackness in the thickening twilight the sunlit islands faded from sight the rose-tinted sky turned into sober gray the stars came out one by one and a night of beauty followed a day of brightness many a time from my bay window on such evenings as this have i seen young men and maidens walking side by side or hand in hand along the beach whispering words that only the sea might hear and uttering vows that only the stars might witness here i have seen the weary man of business linger as if he were loath to leave a scene so quiet and go back to the din and rush and worry of the city and pale sad-faced women in black have come alone to weep by the seaside and have gone back with the traces of fresh tears upon their cheeks and the light of renewed hope in their eyes on bright mornings new married couples climbing the hill whose western declivity overlooks the golden gate and the vast pacific have felt that the immensity and calm of the ocean were emblematic of the serene and immeasurable happiness they had in each other they might have remembered that even that pacific sea is swept by storms and that beneath its quiet waters lies many a noble ship wrecked on its way to port but they felt no fear for there is no shipwreck of true love human or divine it always survives the storm north beach in its stormy mood had also its fascination for the storm-tossed and the desolate and the despairing it was hither that ralston hurried on that fatal day when the crash came his death was like his life he was a strong swimmer but he ventured too far the wind sweeping in through the golden gate chill and angry the white-capped waters of the bay in wild unrest the gathering fog darkening the sky were all symbolic of the days of struggle and the nights of anguish that preceded the final tragedy he died struggling if he had come out of that wrestle with the sea alive he would have been on his feet to-day for he embodied in himself the energy the dash the invincible courage of the true californian ralston did not commit suicide he was not a man of that type sitting in my bay window above the beach one stormy evening about sunset my attention was arrested by the movements of a man sitting on the rocks in the edge of the water where the spray drenched his person every time a wave broke against the shore suddenly he took a pistol from his pocket placed the muzzle against his head and fired i sprang to my feet as he tumbled forward into the water and rushed down the long steps and reached the spot just as an incoming wave bore him back to the beach dragging him out of the water it was found that he was still breathing and had a faint pulse the blood was oozing from an ugly bullet wound back of his right ear the ball had struck the bone and slightly glanced brandy was brought which he swallowed in large quantities 
his pulse grew quicker and stronger and looking around upon the curious and pitying group that had gathered about him he seemed suddenly to comprehend the whole situation with a desperate effort he rose to his feet exclaiming why didn't you let me alone if you had it would all have been over now am i doomed to live against my will the very sea refuses me a grave i made some remark with the view to calm and encourage him you mean well and i ought to thank you sir but you have done me an ill turn i want to die and get out of it all what is the trouble my friend i inquired the question prompted by pity and curiosity he turned suddenly stared at me a moment and said fiercely never mind what my trouble is it is what death only can relieve why didn't you let me die he was a heavy-set man of fifty with iron-gray whiskers a good open intelligent face and neatly dressed in a suit of gray cloth he reeled as he spoke and would have fallen had he not been supported by kind hands he was taken to the hospital where the bullet was extracted from his head and he got well who he was and what was his story were never found out he kept his secret about sunrise one morning looking out of my window i saw a crowd huddled around some object on the beach their subdued behavior suggested a tragedy the north beach rabble in its ordinary mood is rather noisy and demonstrative the hoodlum reaches his perfection here the hoodlum is a young californian in the intermediate stage between a wharf rat and a desperado combining all the bad qualities of both he is dishonest lewd insolent and unspeakably vulgar he glories in his viciousness and his swagger is inimitable there is but one thing about him that has the resemblance of a virtue and that is his courageous fidelity to his fellow hoodlums he will defend one of his kind to the death in a street fight or swear to anything to help him in a court of justice this element is usually largely represented in any popular gathering at north beach but they were not numerous at that early hour they run late at night and are not early risers but the women that sold beer on the flat the men that drove dirt carts the fishermen who fished in the bay and the crowd of fellows that lived nobody knew where or how that appear as by magic when an exciting event calls them forth were all there as i made my way through the throng and reached the object that had drawn them to the spot it was a man hanging by his neck from the highest tier of a lot of damaged hay bales that had been unloaded on the beach he had come out there in the night taken a piece of hay rope adjusted it to his neck with great skill fastened it to a topmost bale of hay and then leaped into eternity it was a horrid spectacle the man was a frenchman who had slept two nights in a recess of the hay pile the popular verdict was insanity or starvation from a look at the ghastly face and poor thin frame with its tattered garments fluttering in the breeze you might think it was both the previous night had been colder than usual perhaps hanging was to his mind a shorter and easier death than freezing nobody knows he too kept his secret almost opposite my bay window was a large rock which was nearly covered by the tide at high water and over which the surf broke with great violence when a north wind drove the waters upon the beach the north beach breakers sometimes run so high as to send their spray over the high embankment of bay street and their thunder makes sublime music on a stormy night one day when the bay was lashed into anger by a strong wind from the northwest and the surf was rolling in heavily a slender young girl was seen hurrying along the beach with downcast look and a veil over her face without pausing she waded through the surf and climbed the rock and lifting her veil for a moment and disclosing a pale beautiful face as she cast a look at the sky she threw herself into the sea her veil floating away as she sunk a rush of the waves dashed her body back against the rock and as it swayed to and fro fragments of her dress were visible a passing cartman who had witnessed her wild leap plunged into the water and with some difficulty caught the body and brought it to the shore 
"'Poor thing, she's only a child,' said a red-faced stout woman, who was the mistress of a notorious beer-house on the flat, but whose coarse features were softened into a pitying expression as she looked upon the fair girlish face and slender form lying at her feet, the blood running from two or three gashes cut upon her temple and forehead by the sharp rocks.' god pity the child she is still alive said another woman of the same class as she stooped down and put her hand upon the girl's heart lifting her tenderly in their strong arms she was carried into a house close at hand and by the use of proper means brought back to consciousness what were her thoughts when she opened her eyes and in the half-darkened room looked around upon the rough denizens of the flat i know not her first thought may have been that she had awaked in the world so awfully pictured by the grand and gloomy florentine hiding her face with her hands she gave way to an agony of grief her secret was the old story though but a schoolgirl she had loved sinned and despaired her weakness and folly culminating in attempted self-murder beyond this no more will be told i will keep her secret having reason to hope that the young life which she tried to throw away at north beach is not wholly blighted she is scarcely out of her teens now here a famous gambler tom h came in the early part of an afternoon and lying down at the foot of the huge sand hill above the beach shot himself through the breast a boatman found him lying on his back the blood streaming from the wound and crimsoning the white sand it was a woman that caused him thus to throw up the game of life he was a handsome fellow muscular clean-limbed and full-chested but it was a sad spectacle as they drove him away in an open wagon the blood dripping along the street the poor fellow gasping and moaning so piteously recovering consciousness that night he tore away the bandages with which his wound had been staunched declaring he would die for the game was up before daybreak next morning he had his wish and died above us on the hillside lived a family consisting of the mother and father and three children one of the children was a bright active little fellow five or six years old who had the quickest foot and merriest laugh of all the little people that were in the habit of gathering on the beach to pick up shells or play in the moist sand or toy with the waves as they ended in a fringe of foam at their feet on a windy day the little fellow had gone down to the beach and amused himself by watching the waves as they broke upon the embankment of the new street that was rising out of the sea at one point there was a break in the embankment leaving a passage for the waters that ebbed and flowed with the tide a narrow plank was thrown across the place for foot passengers the little boy started to cross it just as a huge wave rolled in from the sea and was struck by it and carried by its force into the deep water beyond his little playmates paralyzed with terror instead of giving the alarm at once stood watching the spot where he went down but at last the alarm was given and a score of men plunged into the water and began to search for the child's body a crowd gathered on the bank looking on with the fascination that so singularly attracts men and women to the tragic and the horrible at length a strong swimmer and good diver found the little body and brought it to the shore it was cold and stark the eyes staring the sunny curls matted over the marble brow and his little jacket stained with the mud one of the men took him in his arms and followed by the crowd slowly ascended the hill the mother was standing at the gate wondering what such a procession meant no one having had the presence of mind to prepare her for the blow when she caught sight of the little face resting on the shoulder of the rough but kind-hearted man who carried the dead child she shrieked as she fell to the earth oh god my child my child the fatal spot was where the poor mother could see it every time she looked from her door or window and i was glad when the place was filled up there is yet another aspect of north beach that lingers in memory i have lain awake during many a long night of bodily pain and mental anguish 
listening to the plash of the waves as they broke gently upon the beach just below and the music of the billows soothed my tortured nerves and the voice of the mighty sea spoke to my troubled soul as the voice of him whose footsteps are upon the great waters and whose paths are in the seas and it was from our cottage at north beach that we bore to the grave our child of suffering our paul whose twenty summers were all clouded by affliction but beautiful in goodness and whose resting place beside another little grave near san jose makes us turn many a wistful look toward the sunset End of chapter 19chapter twenty of california sketches by oscar pin fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty my mining speculation i believe the lord has put me in the way of making a competency for my old age said the dear old doctor as he seated himself in the armchair reserved for him at the cottage at north beach how i asked i met a texas man to-day who told me of the discovery of an immensely rich silver mining district in deep spring valley mono county and he says he can get me in as one of the owners i laughingly made some remark expressive of incredulity the honest and benignant face of the old doctor showed that he was a little nettled i have made full inquiry and am sure this is no mere speculation the stock will not be put upon the market and will not be accessible they propose to make me a trustee and the owners limited in number will have entire control of the property but i will not be hasty in the matter i will make it a subject of prayer for twenty-four hours and then if there be no adverse indications i will go on with it the next day i met the broad-faced texan and was impressed by him as the old doctor had been it seemed a sure thing an old prospector had been equipped and sent out by a few gentlemen and he had found outcroppings of silver in a range of hills extending not less than three miles assays had been made of the ores and they were found to be very rich all the timber and water power of deep spring valley had been taken up for the company under the general and local preemption and mining laws it was a big thing the beauty of the whole arrangement was that no mining sharps were to be let in we were to manage it ourselves and reap all the profits we went into it the old doctor and i feeling deeply grateful to the broad-faced texan who had so kindly given us the chance i was made a trustee and began to have a decidedly business feeling as such at the meetings of the board my opinions were frequently called for and were given with great gravity the money was paid for the shares i had taken and the precious evidences of ownership were carefully put in a place of safety a mill was built near the richest of the claims and the assays were good there were delays and more money was called for and sent up the assays were still good and the reports from our superintendent were glowing the biggest thing in the history of california mining he wrote and when the secretary read his letter to the board there was a happy expression on each face at this point i began to be troubled it seemed from reasonable ciphering that i should soon be a millionaire it made me feel solemn and anxious i lay awake at night praying that i might not be spoiled by my good fortune the scriptures that speak of the deceitfulness of riches were called to mind and i rejoiced uh, with trembling many beneficent enterprises were planned principally in the line of endowing colleges and paying church debts i had had an experience in this line there were further delays and more money was called for the oars were rebellious and our process did not suit them freiburg and deep spring valley were not the same a new superintendent one that understood rebellious oars was employed at a higher salary he reported that all was right and that we might expect big news in a few days as he proposed to crush about seventy tons of the best rock by a new and improved process the board held frequent meetings and in view of the nearness of great results did not hesitate to meet the requisitions made for further outlays of money 
they resolved to pursue a prudent but vigorous policy in developing the vast property when the mill should be fairly in operation all this time i felt an undercurrent of anxiety lest i might sustain spiritual loss by my sudden accession to great wealth and continued to fortify myself with good resolutions as a matter of special caution i sent for a parcel of the ore and had a private assay made of it the assay was good the new superintendent notified us that on a certain date we might look for a report of the result of the first great crushing and clean-up of the seventy tons of rock the day came on kearney street i met one of the stockholders a careful presbyterian brother who loved money he had a solemn look and was walking slowly as if in deep thought lifting his eyes as we met he saw me and spoke it is lead what is lead our silver mine in deep spring valley yes from the seventy tons of rock we got eleven dollars in silver and about fifty pounds of as good lead as was ever molded into bullets the board held a meeting the next evening it was a solemn one the fifty-pound bar of lead was placed in the midst and was eyed reproachfully i resigned my trusteeship and they saw me not again that was my first and last mining speculation it failed somehow but the assays were all very good End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One Dick. Dick was a Californian. We made his acquaintance in Sonora about a month before Christmas, Anno Domini, eighteen fifty five. This is the way it happened. At the request of a number of families, the lady who presided in the curious little parsonage near the church on the hillside had started a school for little girls. The public schools might do for the boys, but were too mixed for their sisters, so they thought. Boys could rough it, they were a rough set anyhow, but the girls must be reared according to the traditions of the old times and the old homes that was the view taken of the matter then and from that day to this the average california girl has been superior to the average california boy the boy gets his bias from the street the girl from her mother at home the boy plunges into the life that surges around him the girl only feels the touch of its waves as they break upon the embankments of home the boy gets more of the father the girl gets more of the mother this may explain their relative superiority the school for girls was started on condition that it should be free the proposed teacher refusing all compensation that part of the arrangement was a failure for at the end of the first month every little girl brought a handful of money and laid it on the teacher's desk it must have been a concerted matter that quiet unselfish woman had suddenly become a money-maker in spite of herself use was found for the coin in the course of events the school was opened with a psalm a prayer and a little song in which the sweet voices of the little jewish spanish german irish and american maidens united heartily dear children they are scattered now some of them have died and some of them have met with what is worse than death there was one bright spanish girl slender graceful as a willow with the fresh castilian blood mantling her cheeks her bright eyes beaming with mischief and affection she was a beautiful child and her winning ways made her a pet in the little school but surrounded as the bright beautiful girl was satan had a mortgage on her from her birth and her fate was too dark and sad to be told in these pages she inherited evil condition and perhaps evil blood and her evil life seemed to be inevitable poor child of sin whose very beauty was thy curse let the curtain fall upon thy fate and name we leave thee in the hands of the pitying christ who hath said where little is given little will be required little was given thee in the way of opportunity for it was a mother's hand that bound thee with the chains of evil 
among the children that came to that remarkable academy on the hill was little mary kenneth a thin delicate child with mild blue eyes flaxen hair a peach complexion and the blue veins on her temples that are so often the sign of delicacy of organization and the presage of early death mike kenneth her father was a drinking irishman a good-hearted fellow when sober but pugnacious and disposed to beat his wife when drunk the poor woman came over to see me one day she had been crying and there was an ugly bruise on her cheek your reverence will excuse me she said curtsying but i wish you would come over and spake a word to me husband mike's a kind good creature except when he's drinking but then he is a very satan himself did he give you that bruise on your face mrs kenneth yes he came home last night mad with the whisky and it was breaking everything in the house i tried to stop him and then he bait me oh he never did that before my heart is broke here the poor woman broke down and cried hiding her face in her apron little mary was asleep and she waked up frightened and crying to see her father in such a way he and the child seemed to sober him a little and he stumbled onto the bed and fell asleep he was always kind to the child drunk or sober and there is a kind heart in him if he will only stay away from the drink would you let me talk to him yes we belong to the old church but there is no priest here now and the kindness your lady has shown to little mary has softened his heart to you both and i think he feels a little sick and ashamed this morning and he will listen to kind words now if ever i went to see mike and found him half sick and in a penitent mood he called me father fitzgerald and treated me with the utmost politeness and deference i talked to him about little mary and his warm irish heart opened to me at once she is a good child your reverence and shame on the father that would hurt or disgrace her the tears stood in mike's eyes as he spoke the words all the trouble comes from the whisky why not give it up by the help of god i will said mike grasping my hand with energy and he did i confess that the result of my visit exceeded my hopes mike kept away from the saloons worked steadily little mary had no lack of new shoes and neat frocks and the kenneth family were happy in a humble way mike always seemed glad to see me and greeted me warmly one morning about the last of november there was a knock at the door of the little parsonage opening the door there stood mrs kenneth with a turkey under her arm christmas will soon be coming on i have bought you a turkey for your kindness to little mary and your good talk to mike he has not touched a drop since the blessed day you spake to him will you take the turkey am i thanked with it the turkey was politely and smilingly accepted and mrs kenneth went away looking mightily pleased i extemporized a little coop for our turkey having but little mechanical ingenuity it was a difficult job but it resulted more satisfactorily than did my attempt to make a door for the miniature kitchen attached to the parsonage my object was to nail some cross pieces on some plain boards hang it on hinges and fasten it on the inside by a leather strap attached to a nail the model in my mind was as the reader sees of the most simple and primitive pattern i spent all my leisure time for a week at work on that door i spoiled the lumber i blistered my hands i broke several dollars worth of carpenter's tools for which i had to pay and then i hired a man to make that door this was my last effort in that line of things excepting the turkey coop which was the very last it lasted four days at the end of which time it just gave way all over and caved in fortunately it was no longer needed our turkey would not leave us the parsonage fare suited him and he stayed and throve and made friends we named him dick he is the hero of this sketch dick was intelligent sociable and had a good appetite he would eat anything from a crust of bread to the pieces of candy that the schoolgirls would give him as they passed he became as gentle as a dog and would answer to his name 
he had the freedom of the town and went where he pleased returning at meal times and at night to roost on the western end of the kitchen roof he would eat from our hands looking at us with a sort of human expression in his shiny eyes if he were a hundred yards away all we had to do was to go to the door and call out dick dick once or twice and here he would come stretching his long legs and saying oot, oot, oot. is that the way to spell it he got to like going about with me he would go with me to the post office to the market and sometimes he would accompany me on a pastoral visit dick was well known and popular even the bad boys of the town did not throw stones at him his ruling passion was the love of eating he ate between meals he ate all that was offered to him dick was a pampered turkey and made the most of his good luck and popularity he was never in low spirits and never disturbed except when a dog came about him he disliked dogs and seemed to distrust them the days rolled by and dick was fat and happy it was the day before christmas we had asked two bachelors to take christmas dinner with us having room and chairs for just two more persons one of our four chairs was called a stool it had a bottom and three legs one of which was a little shaky and no back there was a constraint upon us both all day i knew what was the matter but said nothing about four o'clock in the afternoon dick's mistress sat down by me and after a pause remarked do you know that to-morrow is christmas day yes i know it another pause i had nothing to say just then well if 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 anything is to be done about that turkey it is time it were done do you mean dick yes with a little quiver in her voice i understand you you mean to kill him poor dick the only pet we ever had she broke right down at this and began to cry what is the matter here said our kind energetic neighbor mrs t who came in to pay us one of her informal visits she was from philadelphia and though a gifted woman with a wide range of reading and observation of human life was not a sentimentalist she laughed at the weeping mistress of the parsonage and going to the back door she called out dick 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 who was taking the air high up on the hillside came at the call making long strides and sounding his oot 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 which was the formula by which he expressed all his emotions varying only the tone dick as he stood with outstretched neck and a look of expectation in his honest eyes was scooped up by our neighbor and carried off down the hill in the most summary manner in about an hour dick was brought back he was dressed he was also stuffed End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of california sketches by oscar penn fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two the diggers the digger indian holds a low place in the scale of humanity he is not intelligent he is not handsome he is not very brave he stands near the foot of his class and i fear he is not likely to go up any higher it is more likely that the places that know him now will soon know him no more for the reason that he seems readier to adopt the bad white man's whiskey and diseases than the good white man's morals and religion ethnologically he has given rise to much conflicting speculation with which i will not trouble the gentle reader he has been in california a long time and he does not know that he was ever anywhere else his pedigree does not trouble him he is more concerned about getting something to eat it is not because he is an agriculturalist that he is called a digger but because he grabbles for wild roots and has a general fondness for dirt i said he was not handsome and when we consider his rusty dark brown color his heavy features fishy black eyes coarse black hair and clumsy gait nobody will dispute the statement but one digger is uglier than another and an old squaw caps the climax 
the first digger i ever saw was the best looking he had learned a little english and loafed around the mining camps picking up a meal where he could get it he called himself captain charlie and like a true native american was proud of his title it was self-assumed he was still following the precedent set by a vast host of captains majors colonels and generals who never wore a uniform or hurt anybody he made his appearance at the little parsonage on the hillside in sonora one day and thrusting his bare head into the door he said me cap'n charlie tapping his chest complacently as he spoke returning his salutation i waited for him to speak again you got grub coche carne he asked mixing his spanish and english some food was given him which he snatched rather eagerly and began to eat at once it was evident that captain charlie had not breakfast that morning he was a hungry indian and when he got through his meal there was no reserve of rations in the unique repository of dishes and food which has been mentioned heretofore in these sketches peering about the premises captain charlie made a discovery the modest little parsonage stood on a steep incline the upper side resting on the red gravelly earth while the lower side was raised three or four feet from the ground the vacant space underneath had been used by our several bachelor predecessors as a receptacle for cast-off clothing malone lockley and evans had thus disposed of their discarded apparel and drury bond and one or two other miners had also added to the treasures that caught the eye of the inquisitive digger it was a museum of sartorial curiosities seedy and ripped broadcloth coats vests and pants flannel mining shirts of gay colors and of different degrees of wear and tear linen shirts that looked like battle flags that had been through the war and old shoes and boots of all sorts from the high rubber waterproofs used by miners to the ragged slippers that had adorned the feet of the lonely single parsons whose names are written above me take em asked captain charlie pointing to the treasure he had discovered leave was given and captain charlie lost no time in taking possession of the coveted goods he chuckled to himself as one article after another was drawn forth from the pile which seemed to be almost inexhaustible when he had gotten all out and piled up together it was a rare-looking sight mucho bueno exclaimed captain charlie as he proceeded to array himself in a pair of trousers then a shirt then a vest and then a coat were put on and then another and another and yet another suit were donned in the same order he was fast becoming a big indian indeed we looked on and smiled sympathizing with the evident delight of our visitor in his superabundant wardrobe he was in full dress and enjoyed it but he made a failure at one point his feet were too large or were not the right shape for white men's boots or shoes he tried several pairs but his huge flat foot would not enter them and finally he threw down the last one tried by him with a spanish exclamation not fit to be printed in these pages that language is a musical one but its oaths are very harsh in sound a battered stovepipe hat was found among the spoils turned over to captain charlie placing it on his head jauntily he turned to us saying adios and went strutting down the street the picture of gratified vanity his appearance on washington street the main thoroughfare of the place thus gorgeously and abundantly arrayed created a sensation it was as good as a show to the jolly miners always ready to be amused captain charlie was known to most of them and they had a kindly feeling for the good-natured fool injun as one of them called him in my hearing the next digger i noticed was of the gentler but in this case not lovelier sex she was an old squaw who was in mourning the sign of her grief was the black adobe mud spread over her face she sat all day motionless and speechless gazing up into the sky her grief was caused by the death of a child and her sorrowful look showed that she had a mother's heart poor degraded creature 
what were her thoughts as she sat there looking so pitifully up into the silent far-off heavens all the livelong day she gazed thus fixedly into the sky taking no notice of the passers-by neither speaking eating nor drinking it was a custom of the tribe but its peculiar significance is unknown to me it was a great night at an adjoining camp when the old chief died it was made the occasion of a fearful orgy dry wood and brush were gathered into a huge pile the body of the dead chief was placed upon it and the mass set on fire as the flames blazed upward with a roar the indians several hundred in number broke forth into wild wailings and howlings the shrill soprano of the women rising high above the din as they marched around the burning pyre fresh fuel was supplied from time to time and all night long the flames lighted up the surrounding hills which echoed with the shouts and howls of the savages it was a touch of pandemonium at dawn there was nothing left of the dead chief but ashes the mourners took up their line of march toward the stanislaus river the squaws bearing their papooses on their backs and the bucks leading the way the digger believes in a future life and in future rewards and punishments good indians and bad indians are subjected to the same ordeal at death each one is rewarded according to his deeds the disembodied soul comes to a wide turbid river whose angry waters rush on to an unknown destination roaring and foaming from high banks on either side of the stream is stretched a pole smooth and small over which he is required to walk upon the result of this post-mortem blondinizing his fate depends if he was in life a very good indian he goes over safely and finds on the other side a paradise where the skies are cloudless the air balmy the flowers brilliant in color and sweet in perfume the springs many and cool the deer plentiful and fat in this fair clime there are no bad indians no briars no snakes no grizzly bears such is the paradise of good diggers the indian who was in life a mixed character not all good or bad but made up of both starts across the fateful river gets on very well until he reaches about halfway over when his head becomes dizzy and he tumbles into the boiling flood below he swims for his life every indian on earth can swim and he does not forget the art in the world of spirits buffeting the waters he is carried swiftly down the rushing current and at last makes the shore to find a country which like his former life is a mixture of good and bad some days are fair and others are rainy and chilly flowers and brambles grow together there are some springs of water but they are few and not all cool and sweet the deer are few and shy and lean and grizzly bears roam the hills and valleys this is the limbo of the moderately wicked digger the very bad indian placing his feet upon the attenuated bridge of doom makes a few steps forward stumbles falls into the whirling waters below and is swept downward with fearful velocity at last with desperate struggles he half swims and is half washed ashore on the same side from which he started to find a dreary land where the sun never shines and the cold rains always pour down from the dark skies where the water is brackish and foul where no flowers ever bloom where leagues may be traversed without seeing a deer and grizzly bears abound this is the hell of very bad indians and a very bad one it is the worst indians of all at death are transformed into grizzly bears the digger has a good appetite and he is not particular about his eating he likes grasshoppers clover acorns roots and fish the flesh of a dead mule horse cow or hog does not come amiss to him i mean the flesh of such as die natural deaths he eats what he can get and all he can get in the grasshopper season he is fat and flourishing in the suburbs of sonora i came one day upon a lot of squaws who were engaged in catching grasshoppers 
stretched along in line armed with thick branches of pine they threshed the ground in front of them as they advanced driving the grasshoppers before them in constantly increasing numbers until the air was thick with the flying insects their course was directed to a deep gully or gulch into which they fell exhausted it was astonishing to see with what dexterity the squaws would gather them up and thrust them into a sort of covered basket made of willow twigs or tule grass while the insects would be trying to escape but would fall back unable to rise above the sides of the gulch in which they had been entrapped the grasshoppers are dried or cured for winter use a white man who had tried them told me they were pleasant eating having a flavor very similar to that of a good shrimp i was content to take his word for it when bishop soule was in california in eighteen fifty three he paid a visit to a digger campudi or village in the calaveras hills he was profoundly interested and expressed an ardent desire to be instrumental in the conversion of one of these poor kin it was yet early in the morning when the bishop and his party arrived and the diggers were not astir save here and there a squaw in primitive array who slouched lazily toward a spring of water hard by but soon the arrival of the visitors was made known and the bucks squaws and papooses swarmed forth they cast curious looks upon the whole party but were specially struck with the majestic bearing of the bishop as were the passing crowds in london who stopped in the streets to gaze with admiration upon the great american preacher the digger chief did not conceal his delight after looking upon the bishop fixedly for some moments he went up to him and tapping first his own chest and then the bishop's he said me big man you big man it was his opinion that two great men had met and that the occasion was a grand one moralizing to the contrary notwithstanding greatness is not always lacking in self-consciousness i would like to go into one of their wigwams or huts and see how they really live said the bishop you had better drop that idea said the guide a white man who knew more about digger indians than was good for his reputation and morals but who was a good-hearted fellow always ready to do a friendly turn and with plenty of time on his hands to do it the genius born to live without work will make his way by his wits whether it be in the lobby at washington city or as a hanger-on at a digger camp the bishop insisted on going inside the chief's wigwam which was a conical structure of long tule grass airtight and weatherproof with an aperture in front just large enough for a man's body in a crawling attitude sacrificing his dignity the bishop went down on all fours and then a degree lower and following the chief crawled in the air was foul the smells were strong and the light was dim the chief proceeded to tender to his distinguished guest the hospitalities of the establishment by offering to share his breakfast with him the bill of fare was grasshoppers with acorns as a side dish the bishop maintained his dignity as he squatted there in the dirt his dignity was equal to any test he declined the grasshoppers tendered him by the chief pleading that he had already breakfast but watching with peculiar sensations the movements of his host as handful after handful of the crisp and juicy grillis vulgaris were crammed into his capacious mouth and swallowed what he saw and smelled and the absence of fresh air began to tell upon the bishop he became sick and pale while a gentle perspiration like unto that felt in the beginning of seasickness beaded his noble forehead with slow dignity but marked emphasis he spoke brother bristow i propose that we retire they retired and there is no record that bishop soul ever expressed the least desire to repeat his visit to the interior of a digger indian's abode the whites had many difficulties with the diggers in the early days in most cases i think the whites were chiefly to blame it is very hard for the strong to be just to the weak the weakest creature pressed hard will strike back 
white women and children were massacred in retaliation for outrages committed upon the ignorant indians by white outlaws then there would be a sweeping destruction of indians by the excited whites who in those days made rather light of indian shooting the shooting of a buck was about the same thing whether it was a male digger or a deer there is not much fight in a digger unless he's got the dead wood on you and then he'll make it rough for you but these injuns are of no use and i'd about as shoot one of em as a coyote the speaker was a very red-faced sandy-haired man with bloodshot blue eyes whom i met on his return to the humboldt country after a visit to san francisco did you ever shoot an indian i asked i first went up into the eel river country in forty six he answered they give us a lot of trouble in them days they would steal cattle and our boys would shoot but we've never had much difficulty with em since the big fight we had with em in eighteen forty nine a good deal of devilment had been going on all round and some had been killed on both sides the injuns killed two women on a ranch in the valley and then we sought in just to wipe em out their camp was in a bend of the river near the head of the valley with a deep slough on the right flank there was about sixty of us and dave blank was our captain he was a hard rider a dead shot and not very tender-hearted the boys sorter of liked him but kept a sharp eye on him knowing he was so quick and handy with the pistol our plan was to get to their camp and fall on em at daybreak but the sun was rising just as we come in sight of it a dog barked and dave sung out out with your pistols pitch in and give em the hot lead in we galloped at full speed and as the injuns come out to see what was up we let em have it we shot forty bucks about a dozen got away by swimming the river were any of the women killed a few were knocked over you can't be particular when you are in a hurry and a squaw when her blood is up will fight equal to a buck the fellow spoke with evident pride feeling that he was detailing a heroic affair having no idea that he had done anything wrong in merely killing bucks i noticed that this same man was very kind to an old lady who took the stage for bloomfield helping her into the vehicle and looking after her baggage when we parted i did not care to take the hand that had held a pistol that morning when the digger camp was wiped out the scattered remnants of the digger tribes were gathered into a reservation in round valley mendocino county north of the bay of san francisco and were there taught a mild form of agricultural life and put under the care of government agents contractors and soldiers with about the usual results one agent who was also a preacher took several hundred of them into the christian church they seemed to have mastered the leading facts of the gospel and attained considerable proficiency in the singing of hymns altogether the result of this effort at their conversion showed that they were human beings and as such could be made recipients of the truth and grace of god who is the father of all the families of the earth their spiritual guide told me he had to make one compromise with them they would dance extremes meet the fashionable white christians of our gay capitals and the tawny digger exhibit the same weakness for the fascinating exercise that cost john the baptist his head there is one thing a digger cannot bear and that is the comforts and luxuries of civilized life a number of my friends who had taken digger children to raise found that as they approached maturity they fell into a decline and died in most cases of some pulmonary affection the only way to save them was to let them rough it avoiding warm bedrooms and too much clothing the digger seems to be doomed civilization kills him and if he sticks to his savagery he will go down before the bullets whiskey and vices of his white fellow sinners end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of california sketches by oscar pin fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three father fisher he came to california in eighteen fifty five 
the pacific conference was in session at sacramento it was announced that the new preacher from texas would preach at night the boat was detained in some way and he just had time to reach the church where a large and expectant congregation were in waiting below medium height plainly dressed and with a sort of peculiar shuffling movement as he went down the aisle he attracted no special notice except for the profoundly reverential manner that never left him anywhere but the moment he faced his audience and spoke it was evident to them that a man of mark stood before them they were magnetized at once and every eye was fixed upon the strong yet benignant face the capacious blue eyes the ample forehead and massive head bald on top with silver locks on either side his tones in reading the scripture and the hymns were remarkably solemn and very musical the blazing fervor of the prayer that followed was absolutely startling to some of the preachers who had cooled down under the depressing influence of the moral atmosphere of the country it almost seemed as if we could hear the rush of the pentecostal wind and see the tongues of flame the very house seemed to be rocking on its foundations by the time the prayer had ended all were in a glow and ready for the sermon the text i do not now call to mind but the impression made by the sermon remains i had seen and heard preachers who glowed in the pulpit this man blazed his words poured forth in a molten flood his face shone like a furnace heated from within his large blue eyes flashed with the lightning of impassioned sentiment and anon swam in pathetic appeal that no heart could resist body brain and spirit all seemed to feel the mighty afflatus his very frame seemed to expand and the little man who had gone into the pulpit with shuffling step and downcast eyes was transfigured before us when with radiant face upturned eyes and upward sweep of his arm and trumpet voice he shouted hallelujah to god the tide of emotion broke over all barriers the people rose to their feet and the church re-echoed with their responsive hallelujahs the new preacher from texas that night gave some californians a new idea of evangelical eloquence and took his place as a burning and a shining light among the ministers of god on the pacific coast he is the man we want for san francisco exclaimed the impulsive b t crouch who had kindled into a generous enthusiasm under that marvelous discourse he was sent to san francisco he was one of a company of preachers who have successively had charge of the southern methodist church in that wondrous city inside the golden gate boring evans fisher fitzgerald gober brown bailey wood miller ball haas chamberlain mahon tuggle simmons henderson there was an almost unlimited diversity of temperament culture and gifts among these men but they all had a similar experience in this that san francisco gave them new revelations of human nature and of themselves some went away crippled and scarred some sad some broken but perhaps in the great day it may be found that for each and all there was a hidden blessing in the heart throes of a service that seemed to demand that they should sow in bitter tears and know no joyful reaping this side of the grave o oh, my brothers who have felt the fires of this furnace heated seven times hotter than usual shall we not in the resting place beyond the river realize that these fires burned out of us the dross that we did not know was in our souls the bird that comes out of the tempest with broken wing may henceforth take a lowlier flight but will be safer because it ventures no more into the region of storms fisher did not succeed in san francisco because he could not get a hearing a little handful would meet him on sunday mornings in one of the upper rooms of the old city hall and listen to sermons that sent them away in a religious glow but he had no leverage for getting at the masses he was no adept in the methods by which the modern sensational preacher compels the attention of the novelty-loving crowds in our cities
an evangelist in every fiber of his being he chaffed under the limitations of his charge in san francisco and from time to time he would make a dash into the country where at camp meetings and other special occasions he preached the gospel with a power that broke many a sinner's heart and with a persuasiveness that brought many a wanderer back to the good shepherd's fold his bodily energy like his religious zeal was unflagging it seemed little less than a miracle that he could day after day make such vast expenditure of nervous energy without exhaustion he put all his strength into every sermon and exhortation whether addressed to admiring and weeping thousands at a great camp meeting or to a dozen or less standbys at the saturday morning service of a quarterly meeting he had his trials and crosses those who knew him intimately learned to expect his mightiest pulpit efforts when the shadow on his face and the unconscious sigh showed that he was passing through the waters and crying to god out of the depths in such experiences the strong man is revealed and gathers new strength the weak one goes under but his strength was more than mere natural force of will it was the strength of a mighty faith in god that unseen force by which the saints work righteousness subdue kingdoms escape the violence of fire and stop the mouths of lions as a flame of fire fisher itinerated all over california and oregon kindling a blaze of revival in almost every place he touched he was mighty in the scriptures and seemed to know the book by heart his was no rosewater theology he believed in a hell and pictured it in bible language with a vividness and awfulness that thrilled the stoutest sinner's heart he believed in heaven and spoke of it in such a way that it seemed that with him faith had already changed to sight the gates of pearl the crystal river the shining ranks of the white-robed throngs their songs swelling as the sound of many waters the holy love and rapture of the glorified hosts of the redeemed were made to pass in panoramic procession before the listening multitudes until the heaven he pictured seemed to be a present reality he lived in the atmosphere of the supernatural the spirit world was to him most real i have been out of the body he said to me one day the words were spoken softly and his countenance always grave in its aspect deepened in its solemnity of expression as he spoke how was that i inquired it was in texas i was returning from a quarterly meeting where i had preached one sunday morning with great liberty and with unusual effect the horses attached to my vehicle became frightened and ran away they were wholly beyond control plunging down the road at a fearful speed when by a slight turn to one side the wheel struck a large log there was a concussion and then a blank the next thing i knew i was floating in the air above the road i saw everything as plainly as i see your face at this moment there lay my body in the road there lay the log and there were the trees the fence the fields and everything perfectly natural my motion which had been upward was arrested and as poised in the air i looked at my body lying in the road so still i felt a strong desire to go back to it and found myself sinking toward it the next thing i knew i was lying in the road where i had been thrown out with a number of friends about me some holding up my head others chaffing my hands or looking on with pity or alarm yes i was out of the body for a while and i know there is a spirit world his voice had sunk into a sort of whisper and the tears were in his eyes i was strangely thrilled both of us were silent for a time as if we heard the echoes of voices and saw the beckonings of shadowy hands from that other world which sometimes seemed so far away and yet is so near to each one of us surely yon heaven where angels see god's face is not so distant as we deem from this low earth tis but a little space tis but a veil the winds might blow aside yes this is all that us of earth divide 
from the bright dwellings of the glorified the land of which i dream but it was no dream to this man of mighty faith the windows of whose soul opened at all times godward to him immortality was a demonstrated fact an experience he had been out of the body intensity was his dominating quality he wrote verses and whatever they may have lacked of the subtle element that marks poetical genius they were full of his ardent personality and devotional abandon he compounded medicines whose virtues backed by his own unwavering faith wrought wondrous cures on several occasions he accepted challenge to polemic battle and his opponents found in him a fearless warrior whose onset was next to irresistible in these discussions it was no uncommon thing for his arguments to close with such bursts of spiritual power that the doctrinal duel would end in a great religious excitement bearing disputants and hearers away on mighty tides of feeling that none could resist i saw in the texas christian advocate an incident related by dr f a mood that gives a good idea of what fisher's eloquence was when in full tide about ten years ago says dr m when the train from houston on the central railroad on one occasion reached hempstead it was peremptorily brought to a halt there was a strike among the employees of the road on what was significantly called by the strikers the death warrant the road it seems had required all of its employees to sign a paper renouncing all claims to moneyed reparation in case of their bodily injury while in its service the excitement incident to a strike was at its height at hempstead when our train reached there the tracks were blocked with trains that had been stopped as they arrived from the different branches of the road and the employees were gathered about in groups discussing the situation the passengers peering around with hopeless curiosity when our train stopped the conductor told us that we would have to lie over all night and many of the passengers left to find accommodation in the hotels of the town it was now night when a man came into the car and exclaimed the strikers are tarring and feathering a poor wretch out there who has taken sides with the road come out and see it nearly every one in the car hastened out i had risen when a gentleman behind me gently pulled my coat and said to me sit down a moment he went on to say i judge sir that you are a clergyman and i advise you to remain here you may be put to much inconvenience by having to appear as a witness in a mob of that sort too there is no telling what may follow i thanked him and resumed my seat he then asked me to what denomination i belonged and upon my telling him that i was a methodist preacher he asked eagerly and promptly if i had ever met a methodist preacher in texas by the name of fisher describing accurately the appearance of our glorified brother finding that i knew him well he proceeded to give the following incident i give it as nearly as i can in his own words said he i am a californian have practiced law for years in that state and at the time i allude to was district judge i was holding court at blank i cannot now recall the name of the town he mentioned and on saturday was told that a methodist camp meeting was being held a few miles from town i determined to visit it and reach the place of meeting in good time to hear the great preacher of the occasion father fisher the meeting was held in a river canyon the rocks towered hundreds of feet on either side rising over like an arch through the ample space over which the rocks hung the river flowed furnishing abundance of cool water while a pleasant breeze fanned a shaded spot a great multitude had assembled hundreds of very hard cases who had gathered there like myself for the mere novelty of the thing i am not a religious man never have been thrown under religious influences i respect religion and respect its teachers but have been very little in contact with religious things at the appointed time the preacher rose he was small with white hair combed back from his forehead and he wore a venerable beard 
i do not know much about the bible and i cannot quote from his text but he preached on the judgment i tell you sir i have heard eloquence at the bar and on the hustings but i never heard such eloquence as that old preacher gave us that day at the last when he described the multitudes calling on the rocks and mountains to fall on them i instinctively looked up to the arching rocks above me will you believe it sir as i looked up to my horror i saw the walls of the canyon swaying as if they were coming together just then the preacher called on all that needed mercy to kneel down i recollect he said something like this every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and you might as well do it now as then the whole multitude fell on their knees every one of them although i had never done so before i confess to you sir that i got down on my knees i did not want to be buried right then and there by those rocks that seemed to be swaying to destroy me the old man prayed for us it was a wonderful prayer i want to see him once more where will i be likely to find him when he had closed his narrative i said to him judge i hope you have bowed frequently since that day alas no sir he replied not much but depend upon it father fisher is a wonderful orator he made me think that day that the walls of the canyon were falling he went back to texas the scene of his early labors and triumphs to die his evening sky was not cloudless he suffered much but his sunset was calm and bright his waking in the morning land was glorious if it was at that short period of silence spoken of in the apocalypse we may be sure it was broken when fisher went in end of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four The California Madhouse. On my first visit to the State Insane Asylum at Stockton, I was struck by the beauty of a boy of some seven or eight years who was moving about the grounds clad in a straight jacket. In reply to my inquiries, the resident physician told me his history about a year ago he was on his way to california with the family to which he belonged he was a general pet among the passengers on the steamer handsome confiding and overflowing with boyish spirits everybody had a smile and a kind word for the winning little fellow even the rough sailors would pause a moment to pat his curly head as they passed one day a sailor yielding to a playful impulse in passing caught up the boy in his arms crying i'm going to throw you into the sea the child gave one scream of terror and went into convulsions when the paroxysm subsided he opened his eyes and gazed around with a vacant expression his mother who bent over him with a pale face noticed the look and almost screamed tommy here is your mother don't you know me the child gave no sign of recognition he never knew his poor mother again he was literally frightened out of his senses the mother's anguish was terrible the remorse of the sailor for his thoughtless freak was so great that it in some degree disarmed the indignation of the passengers and crew the child had learned to read and had made rapid progress in the studies suited to his age but all was swept away by the cruel blow he was unable to utter a word intelligently since he has been here there have been signs of returning mental consciousness and we have begun with him as with an infant he knows and can call his own name and is now learning the alphabet how is his health his health is pretty good except that he has occasional convulsive attacks that can only be controlled by the use of powerful opiates i was glad to learn on a visit made two years later that the unfortunate boy had died this child was murdered by a fool the fools are always murdering children though the work is not always done as effectually as in this case they cripple and half kill them by terror 
there are many who will read this sketch who will carry to the grave and into the world of spirits natures out of which half the sweetness and brightness and beauty has been crushed by ignorance or brutality in most cases it is ignorance the hand that should guide smites the voice that should soothe jars the sensitive chords that are untuned forever he who thoughtlessly excites terror in a child's heart is unconsciously doing the devil's work he that does it consciously is a devil there is a lady here whom i wish you would talk to she belongs to one of the most respectable families in san francisco is cultivated refined and has been the center of a large and loving circle her monomania is spiritual despair she thinks she has committed the unpardonable sin there she is now i will introduce you to her talk with her and comfort her if you can she was a tall well-formed woman in black with all the marks of refinement in her dress and bearing she was walking the floor to and fro with rapid steps wringing her hands and moaning piteously indescribable anguish was in her face it was a hopeless face it haunted my thoughts for many days and it is vividly before me as i write now the kind physician introduced me and left the apartment there is a sacredness about such an interview that inclines me to veil its details i am willing to talk with you sir and appreciate your motive but i understand my situation i have committed the unpardonable sin and i know there is no hope for me with the earnestness excited by intense sympathy i combated her conclusion and felt certain that i could make her see and feel that she had given away to an illusion she listened respectfully to all i had to say and then said again i know my situation i denied my saviour after all his goodness to me and he has left me for ever there was the frozen calmness of utter despair in look and tone i left her as i found her i will introduce you to another woman the opposite of the poor lady you have just seen she thinks she is a queen and is perfectly harmless you must be careful to humour her illusion there she is let me present you she was a woman of immense size enormously fat with broad red face and a self-satisfied smirk dressed in some sort of flaming scarlet stuff profusely tinseled all over making a gorgeously ridiculous effect she received me with a mixture of mock dignity and smiling condescension and surveying herself admiringly she asked how do you like my dress it was not the first time that royalty had shown itself not above the little weaknesses of human nature on being told that her apparel was indeed magnificent she was much pleased and drew herself up proudly and was a picture of ecstatic vanity are the real queens as happy when they lay aside their royal robes for their grave clothes will not the pageantry which was the glory of their lives seem as vain as that of this tinselled queen of the madhouse where is happiness after all is it in the circumstances the external conditions or is it in the mind such were the thoughts passing through my mind when a man approached me with a violin every eye brightened and the queen seemed to thrill with pleasure in every nerve this is the only way we can get some of them to take any exercise the music rouses them and they will dance as long as they are permitted to do so the fiddler struck up a lively tune and the queen with marvellous lightness of step and ogling glances ambled up to a tall raw-boned methodist preacher who had come with me and invited him to dance with her the poor parson seemed sadly embarrassed as her manner was very pressing but he awkwardly and confusedly declined amid the titters of all present it was a singular spectacle that dance of the mad woman the most striking figure on the floor was the queen her great size her brilliant apparel her astonishing agility the perfect time she kept the bows the smiles and blandishments she bestowed on an imaginary partner were indescribably ludicrous 
now and then in her evolutions she would cast a momentary reproachful glance at the ungallant clergyman who had refused to dance with feminine royalty and who stood looking on with a sheepish expression of face he was a kentuckian and lack of gallantry is not a kentucky trait during the session of the annual conference at stockton in eighteen fifty nine or eighteen sixty the resident physician invited me to preach to the inmates of the asylum on sunday afternoon the novelty of the service which was announced in the daily papers attracted a large number of visitors among them the greater part of the preachers the day was one of those bright clear beautiful october days peculiar to california that make you think of heaven i stood on the steps and the hundreds of men and women stood below me with their upturned faces among them were old men crushed by sorrow and old men ruined by vice aged women with faces that seemed to plead for pity women that made you shrink from their unwomanly gaze lion-like young men made for heroes but caught in the devil's trap and changed into beasts and boys whose looks showed that sin had already stamped them with its foul insignia and burned into their souls the shame which is to be one of the elements of its eternal punishment a less impressible man than i would have felt moved at the sight of that throng of bruised and broken creatures a hymn was read and when burnet kelsey neal and others of the preachers struck up an old tune voice after voice joined in the melody until it swelled into a mighty volume of sacred song i noticed that the faces of many were wet with tears and there was an indescribable pathos in their voices the pitying god amid the rapturous hallelujahs of the heavenly hosts bent to listen to the music of these broken harps this text was announced my peace i give unto you and the sermon began among those standing nearest to me was old kelly a noted patient whose monomania was the notion that he was a millionaire and who spent most of his time in drawing checks on imaginary deposits for vast sums of money i held one of his checks for a round million but it has never yet been cashed the old man pressed up close to me seeming to feel that the success of the service somehow depended on him i had not more than fairly begun my discourse when he broke in that's daniel webster i don't mind a judicious amen but this put me out a little i resumed my remarks and was getting another good start when he again broke in enthusiastically henry clay the preachers standing around me smiled i think i heard one or two of them titter i could not take my eyes from kelly who stood with open mouth and beaming countenance waiting for me to go on he held me with an evil fascination i did go on in a louder voice and in a sort of desperation but again my delighted hearer exclaimed calhoun old kelly spoiled that sermon though he meant kindly he died not long afterward gloating over his fancied millions to the last if you have steady nerves come with me and i will show you the worst case we have a woman half tigress and half devil ascending a stairway i was led to an angle of the building assigned to patients whose violence required them to be kept in close confinement hark don't you hear her she is in one of her paroxysms now the sounds that issued from one of the cells were like nothing i had ever heard before they were a series of unearthly fiendish shrieks intermingled with furious imprecations as of a lost spirit in an ecstasy of rage and fear the face that glared upon me through the iron grating was hideous horrible it was that of a woman or of what had been a woman but was now a wreck out of which evil passion had stamped all that was womanly or human i involuntarily shrunk back as i met the glare of those fiery eyes and caught the sound of words that made me shudder i never suspected myself of being a coward but i felt glad that the iron bars of the cell against which she dashed herself were strong i had read of furies 
one was now before me the bloated gin-inflamed face the fiery red wicked eyes the swinish chin the tangled coarse hair falling around her like writhing snakes the tiger-like clutch of her dirty fingers the horrible words the picture was sickening disgust for the time almost extinguishing pity she was the keeper of a beer saloon in san francisco and led a life of drunkenness and licentiousness until she broke down and she was brought here is there any hope of her restoration i fear not nothing short of a miracle can retune an instrument so fearfully broken and jangled i thought of her out of whom were cast the seven devils and of him who came to seek and to save the lost and resisting the impulse that prompted me to hurry away from the sight and hearing of this lost woman i tried to talk with her but had to retire at last amid a volley of such words as i hope never to hear from a woman's lips again listen do you ever hear a sweeter voice than that i had heard the voice before and thrilled under its power it was a female voice of wonderful richness and volume with a touch of something in it that moved you strangely a sort of intensity that set your pulses to beating faster while it entranced you the whole of the spacious grounds were flooded with the melody and the passing teamsters on the public highway would pause and listen with wonder and delight the singer was a fair young girl with dark auburn hair large brown eyes that were at times dreamy and sad and then again lit up with excitement as her moods changed from sad to gay she will sit silent for hours gazing listlessly out of the window and then all at once break forth into a burst of song so sweet and thrilling that the other patients gather near her and listen in rapt silence and delight sometimes at a dead hour of the night her voice is heard and then it seems that she is under a special afflatus she seems to be inspired by the very soul of music and her songs wild and sad wailing and rollicking by turns but all exquisitely sweet fill the long night hours with their melody the shock caused by the sudden death of her betrothed lover overthrew her reason and blighted her life by the mercy of god the love of music and the gift of song survived the wreck of love and of reason this girl's voice pealing forth upon the still summer evening air is mingled with my last recollection of stockton and its refuge for the doubly miserable who are doomed to death in life End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 The Reblooming it is now more than thirty years since the morning a slender youth of handsome face and modest mien came into my office on the corner of montgomery and clay street san francisco he was the son of a preacher well known in missouri and california a man of rare good sense caustic wit and many eccentricities the young man became an attache of my newspaper office and an inmate of my home he was as fair as a girl and refined in his taste and manners a genial taciturnity if the expression may be allowed marked his bearing in the social circle everybody had a kind feeling and a good word for the quiet bright-faced youth in the discharge of his duties in the office he was punctual and trustworthy showing not only industry but unusual aptitude for business it was with special pleasure that i learned that he was turning his thoughts to the subject of religion during the services in the little pine street church he would sit with thoughtful face and not seldom with moistened eyes he read the bible and prayed in secret i was not surprised when he came to me one day and opened his heart the great crisis in his life had come god was speaking to his soul and he was listening to his voice the uplifted cross drew him and he yielded to the gentle attraction 
we prayed together and henceforth there was a new and sacred bond that bound us to each other i felt that i was a witness to the most solemn transaction that can take place on earth the wedding of a soul to a heavenly faith soon thereafter he went to virginia to attend college there he united with the church his letters to me were full of gratitude and joy it was the blossoming of his spiritual life and the air was full of its fragrance and the earth was flooded with glory a pedestrian tour among the virginia hills brought him into communion with nature at a time when it was rapture to drink in its beauty and its grandeur the light kindled within his soul by the touch of the holy spirit transfigured the scenery upon which he gazed and the glory of god shone round about the young student in the flush and blessedness of his first love o oh, blessed days o oh, days of brightness and sweetness and rapture the soul is then in its blossoming time and all high enthusiasms all bright dreams all thrilling joys are realities which inwork themselves into the consciousness to be forgotten never to remain with us as prophecies of the eternal springtime that awaits the true-hearted on the hills of god beyond the grave or as accusing voices charging us with the murder of our dead ideals amid the dust and den of the battle in after years we turn to this radiant spot in our journey with smiles or tears according as we have been true or false to the impulses aspirations and purposes inspired within us by that first and brightest and nearest manifestation of god such a season is as natural to every life as the april buds and june roses are to forest and garden the springtime of some lives is deferred by unpropitious circumstances to the time when it should be glowing with autumnal glory and rich in the fruitage of the closing year the life that does not blossom into religion in youth may have light at noon and peace at sunset but misses the morning glory on the hills and the dew that sparkles on grass and flower the call of god to the young to seek him early is the expression of a true psychology no less than of a love infinite in its depth and tenderness his college course finished my young friend returned to california and in one of its beautiful valley towns he entered a law office with a view to prepare himself for the legal profession here he was thrown into daily association with a little knot of skeptical lawyers as is often the case their moral obliquities ran parallel with their errors in opinion they swore gambled genteelly and drank it is not strange that in this icy atmosphere the growth of my young friend in the christian life was stunted such influences are like the dreaded north wind that at times sweeps over the valleys of california in the spring and early summer blighting and withering the vegetation it does not kill the brightness of his hope was dimmed and his soul knew the torture of doubt a torture that is always keenest to him who allows himself to sink in the region of fogs after he has once stood upon the sunlit summit of faith just at this crisis a thing little in itself deepened the shadow that was falling upon his life a personal misunderstanding with the pastor kept him from attending church thus he lost the most effectual defence against the assaults that were being made upon his faith and hope in being separated from the fellowship and cut off from the activities of the church of god have you not noted these malign coincidences in life there are times when it seems that the tide of events sets against us when like the princely sufferer of the land of us every messenger that crosses the threshold brings fresh tidings of ill and our whole destiny seems to be rushing to a predoomed perdition the worldly call it bad luck the superstitious call it fate the believer in god calls it by another name always of a delicate constitution my friend now exhibited symptoms of serious pulmonary disease 
it was at that time the fashion in california to prescribe whisky as a specific for that class of ailments it is possible that there is virtue in the prescription but i am sure of one thing namely that if consumption diminished drunkenness increased if fewer died of phthisis more died of delirium tremens the physicians of california have sent a host of victims raving and gibbering in drunken frenzy or idiocy down to death and hell i have reason to believe that my friend inherited a constitutional weakness at this point as flame to tender was the medicinal whisky to him it grew upon him rapidly and soon this cloud overshadowed all his life he struggled hard to break the serpent folds that were tightening around him but the fire that had been kindled seemed to be quenchless an uncontrolled evil passion is hell-fire he writhed in its burnings in an agony that could be understood only by such as knew how almost morbidly sensitive was his nature and how vital was his conscience i became a pastor in the town where he lived and renewed my association with him as far as i could but there was a constraint unlike the old times when under the influence of liquor he would pass me in the streets with his head down a deeper flush mantling his cheek as he hurried by with unsteady step sometimes i met him staggering homeward through a back street hiding from the gaze of men he was at first shy of me when sober but gradually the constraint wore off and he seemed disposed to draw nearer to me as in the old days his struggle went on days of drunkenness following weeks of soberness his haggard face after each debauch wearing a look of unspeakable weariness and wretchedness one of the lawyers who had led him into the mazes of doubt a man of large and versatile gifts whose lips were touched with a noble and persuasive eloquence sunk deeper and deeper into the black depths of drunkenness until the tragedy ended in a horror that lessened the gains of the saloon for at least a few days he was found dead in his bed one morning in a pool of blood his throat cut by his own guilty hand my friend had married a lovely girl and the cottage in which they lived was one of the coziest and the garden in front was a little paradise of neatness and beauty ah uh, i must drop a veil over a part of this true tale all along i have written under half protest the image of a sad wistful face rising at times between my eyes and the sheet on which these words are traced they loved each other tenderly and deeply and both were conscious of the presence of the devil that was turning their heaven into hell save him doctor save him he is the noblest of men and the tenderest truest husband he loves you and he will let you talk to him save him oh save him help me to pray for him my heart will break poor child her loving heart was indeed breaking and her fresh young life was crushed under a weight of grief and shame too heavy to be borne what he said to me in the interviews held in his sober intervals i have not the heart to repeat now he still fought against his enemy he still buffeted the billows that were going over him though with feebler stroke when their little child died her tears fell freely but he was like one stunned stony and silent he stood and saw the little grave filled up and rode away tearless the picture of hopelessness by a coincidence after my return to san francisco he came thither and again became my neighbor at north beach i went up to see him one evening he was very feeble and it was plain that the end was not far off at the first glance i saw that a great change had taken place in him he had found his lost self the strong drink was shut out from him and he was shut in with his better thoughts and with god his religious life rebloomed in wondrous beauty and sweetness the blossoms of his early joy had fallen off the storms had torn its branches and stripped it of its foliage but its root had never perished because he had never ceased to struggle for deliverance aspiration and hope live or die together in the human soul the link that bound my friend to god was never wholly sundered 
his better nature clung to the better way with a grasp that never let go altogether oh doctor i am a wonder to myself it does seem to me that god has given back to me every good thing i possessed in the bright and blessed past it has all come back to me i see the light and feel the joy as i did when i first entered the new life oh it is wonderful doctor god never gave me up and i never ceased to yearn for his mercy and love even in the darkest season of my unhappy life his very face had recovered its old look and his voice its old tone there could be no doubt of it his soul had rebloomed in the life of god the last night came they sent for me with the message come quickly he is dying i found him with that look which i have seen on the faces of others who were nearing death a radiance and a rapture that awed the beholder o solemn awful mystery of death i have stood in its presence in every form of terror and of sweetness and in every case the thought has been impressed upon me that it was a passage into the great realities doctor he said smiling and holding my hand i had hoped to be with you in your office again as in the old days not as a business arrangement but just to be with you and revive old memories and to live the old life over again but that cannot be and i must wait till we meet in the world of spirits whither i go before you it seems to be growing dark i cannot see your face hold my hand i am going going i am on the waves uh, on the waves the radiance was still upon his face but the hand i held no longer clasped mine the wasted form was still it was the end he was launched upon the infinite sea for the endless voyage end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of california sketches by oscar penn fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six san quentin i want you to go with me over to san quentin next thursday and preach a thanksgiving sermon to the poor fellows in the state prison on the appointed morning i met our party at the vallejo street wharf and we were soon steaming on our way passing under the guns of fort alcatraz past angel island why so called i know not as in early days it was inhabited not by angels but goats only all of us felt the exhilaration of the california sunshine and the bracing november air as we stood upon the guards watching the play of the lazy-looking porpoises that seemed to roll along keeping up with the swift motion of the boat in such a leisurely way the porpoise is a deceiver as he rolls up to the surface of the water in his lumbering way he looks as if he were a huge lump of unwieldy awkwardness floating at random and almost helpless but when you come to know him better you find that he is a marvel of muscular power and swiftness i have seen a school of porpoises in the pacific swimming for hours alongside one of our fleetest ocean steamers darting a few yards ahead now and then as if by mere volition cutting their way through the water with the directness of an arrow the porpoise is playful at times and his favorite game is a sort of leapfrog a score or more of the creatures seemingly full of fun and excitement will chase one another at full speed throwing themselves from the water and turning somersaults in the air the water boiling with the agitation and their huge bodies flashing in the light you might almost imagine that they had found something in the sea that had made them drunk or that they had inhaled some sort of piscatorial anaesthetic but here we are at our destination the bell rings we round to and land at san quentin nature is at her best and man at his worst against the rocky shore the waters of the bay break in gentle plashings when the winds are quiet when the gales from the southwest sweep through the golden gate and set the white caps to dancing to their wild music the waves rise high and dash upon the dripping stones with a hoarse roar as of anger 
beginning a few hundreds of yards from the water's edge the hills slope up and up and up until they touch the base of tamalpais on whose dark and rugged summit four thousand feet above the sea that laves his feet on the west the rays of the morning sun fall with transfiguring glory while yet the valley below lies in shadow on this lofty pinnacle linger the last rays of the setting sun as it drops into the bosom of the pacific in stormy weather the mist and clouds roll in from the ocean and gather in dark masses around his awful head as if the sea gods had risen from their homes in the deep and were holding a council of war amid the battle of the elements at other times after calm bright days the thin soft white clouds that hang about his crest deepen into crimson and gold and the mountain top looks as if the angels of god had come down to encamp and pitched here their pavilions of glory this is nature at san quentin and this is tamalpais as i have looked upon it many a morning and many an evening from my window above the sea at north beach the gate is open for us and we enter the prison walls it is a holiday and the day is fair and balmy but the chill and sadness cannot be shaken off as we look around us the sunshine seems almost to be a mockery in this place where fellow men are caged and guarded like wild beasts and skulk about with shaved heads clad in the striped uniform of infamy merciful god is this what thy creature man was made for how long how long seated upon the platform with the prison officials and visitors i watched my strange auditors as they came in there were one thousand of them their faces were a curious study most of them were bad faces beast and devil were printed on them thick necks heavy back heads and low square foreheads were the prevalent types the least repulsive were those who looked as if they were all animal creatures of instinct and appetite good-natured and stupid the most repulsive were those whose eyes had a gleam of mingled sensuality and ferocity but some of these faces that met my gaze were startling they seemed so out of place one old man with gray hair pale sad face and clear blue eyes might have passed in other garb and in other company for an honored member of the society of friends he had killed a man in a mountain county if he was indeed a murderer at heart nature had given him the wrong imprint my attention was struck by a smooth-faced handsome young fellow scarcely of age who looked as little like a convict as anybody on that platform he was in for burglary and had a very bad record some came in half laughing as if they thought the whole affair more a joke than anything else the mexicans of whom there were quite a number were sullen and scowling there is gloom in the spanish blood the irrepressible good nature of several ruddy-faced irishmen broke out in sly merriment as the service began the discipline of the prison showed itself in the quiet that instantly prevailed but only a few who joined in the singing seemed to feel the slightest interest in it their eyes were wandering and their faces were vacant they had the look of men who had come to be talked at and patronized and who were used to it the prayer that was offered was not calculated to banish such a feeling it was dry and cold i stood up to begin the sermon never before had i realized so fully that god's message was to lost men and for lost men a mighty tide of pity rushed in upon my soul as i looked down into the faces of my hearers my eyes filled and my heart melted within me i could not speak until after a pause and only then by great effort there was a deep silence and every face was lifted to mine as i announced the text god had touched my heart and theirs at the start i read the word slowly god hath not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our lord jesus christ then i said my fellow men i come to you to-day with a message from my father and your father in heaven it is a message of hope god help me to deliver it as i ought god help you to hear it as you ought 
i will not insult you by saying that because you have an extra dinner a few hours respite from your toil and a little fresh air and sunshine you ought to have a joyful thanksgiving to-day if i should talk thus you would be ready to ask me how i would like to change places with you you would despise me and i would despise myself for indulging in such cant your lot is a hard one the battle of life has gone against you whether by your own fault or by hard fortune it matters not so far as the fact is concerned this thanksgiving day finds you locked in here with broken lives and wearing the badge of crime god alone knows the secrets of each throbbing heart before me and how it is that you have come to this fellow men children of my father in heaven putting myself for the moment in your place the bitterness of your lot is real and terrible to me for some of you there is no happier prospect for this life than to toil within these walls by day and sleep in yonder cells by night through the weary slow dragging years and then to die with only the hands of hired attendants to wipe the death sweat from your brows and then to be put in a convict's coffin and taken up on the hill yonder and laid in a lonely grave my god that is terrible an unexpected dramatic effect followed these words the heads of many of the convicts fell forward on their breasts as if struck with sudden paralysis they were the men who were in for life and the horror of it overcame them the silence was broken by sobbings all over the room the officers and visitors on the platform were weeping the angel of pity hovered over the place and the glow of human sympathy had melted those stony hearts a thousand strong men were thrilled with the touch of sympathy and once more the sacred fountain of tears was unsealed these convicts were men after all and deep down under the rubbish of their natures there was still burning the spark of a humanity not yet extinct it was wonderful to see the softened expression of their faces yes they were men after all responding to the voice of sympathy which had been but too strange to many of them all their evil lives many of them had inherited hard conditions they were literally conceived in sin and born in iniquity they grew up in the midst of vice for them pure and holy lives were a moral impossibility evil with them was hereditary organic and the result of association it poisoned their blood at the start and stamped itself on their features from their cradles human law in dealing with these victims of evil circumstance can make little discrimination society must protect itself treating a criminal as a criminal but what will god do with them hereafter be sure he will do right where little is given little will be required it shall be better for tyre and sidon at the day of judgment than for chorazin and bethsaida there is no ruin without remedy except that which a man makes for himself by abusing mercy and throwing away proffered opportunity thoughts like these rushed through the preacher's mind as he stood there looking in the tear-bedewed faces of these men of crime a fresh tide of pity rose in his heart that he felt came from the heart of the all-pitying one i do not try to disguise from you or from myself the fact that for this life your outlook is not bright but i come to you this day with a message of hope from god our father he hath not appointed you to wrath he loves all his children he sent his son to die for them jesus trod the paths of pain and drained the cup of sorrow he died as a malefactor for malefactors he died for me he died for each one of you if i knew the most broken the most desolate-hearted despairing man before me who feels that he is scorned of men and forsaken of god i would go to where he sits and put my hand on his head and tell him that god hath not appointed him to wrath but to obtain salvation by our lord jesus christ who died for us i would tell him that his father in heaven loves him still loves him more than the mother that bore him 
i would tell him that all the wrongs and follies of his past life may from this hour be turned into so much capital of a warning experience and that a million of years from to-day he may be a child of the heavenly father and an heir of glory having the freedom of the heavens and the blessedness of everlasting life o oh, brothers god does love you nothing can ruin you but your own despair no man has any right to despair who has eternity before him eternity long long eternity blessed blessed eternity that is yours all of it it may be a happy eternity for each one of you from this moment you may begin a better life there is hope for you and mercy and love and heaven this is the message i bring you warm from a brother's heart and warm from the heart of jesus whose life-blood was poured out for you and me his loving hand opened the gate of mercy and hope to every man the proof is that he died for us o oh, son of god take us to thy pitying arms and lift us up into the light that never never grows dim into the love that fills heaven and eternity as the speaker sunk into his seat there was a silence that was almost painful for a few moments then the pent-up emotion of the men broke forth in sobs that shook their strong frames dr lucky the prisoner's friend made a brief tearful prayer and then the benediction was said and the service was at an end the men sat still in their seats as we filed out of the chapel many hands were extended to grasp mine holding it with a clinging pressure i passed out bearing with me the impression of an hour i can never forget and the images of those thousand faces are still painted in memory End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of california sketches by oscar pen fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven todd robinson the image of this man of many moods and brilliant genius that rises most distinctly to my mind is that connected with a little prayer meeting at the mena street church san francisco one thursday night his thin silver locks his dark flashing eye his graceful pose and his musical voice are before me his words i have not forgotten but their electric effect must forever be lost to all except the few who heard them i have been taunted with the reproach that it was only after i was a broken and disappointed man in my worldly hopes and aspirations that i turned to religion the taunt is just here he bowed his head and paused with a deep emotion the taunt is just i bow my head in shame and take the blow my earthly hopes have faded and fallen one after another the prizes that dazzled my imagination have eluded my grasp i am a broken gray-haired man and i bring to my god only the remnant of a life but brethren it is this very thought that fills me with joy and gratitude at this moment the thought that when all else fails god takes us up just when we need him most and most feel our need of him he lifts us up out of the depths where we have grovelled and presses us to his fatherly heart this is the glory of christianity the world turns from us when we fail and fall then it is that the lord draws nigher such a religion must be from god for its principles are godlike it does not require much skill or power to steer a ship into port when her timbers are sound her masts all rigged and her crew at their posts but the pilot that can take an old hulk rocking on the stormy waves with its masts torn away its rigging gone its planks loose and leaking and bring it safe to harbor that is the pilot for me brethren i am that hulk and jesus is that pilot glory be to jesus exclaimed father newman as the speaker with swimming eyes radiant face and heaving chest sunk into his seat i never heard anything finer from mortal lips but it seems cold to me as i read it here oratory cannot be put on paper 
he was present once at a camp meeting at the famous tollgate campground in santa clara valley near the city of san jose it was sabbath morning just such a one as seldom dawns on this earth the brethren and sisters were gathered around the stand under the live oaks for a speaking meeting the morning glory was on the summits of the santa cruz mountains that sloped down to the sacred spot the lovely valley smiled under a sapphire sky the birds hopped from twig to twig of the overhanging branches that scarcely quivered in the still air and seemed to peer inquiringly into the faces of the assembled worshippers the bugle voice of bailey led in a holy song and simmons led in prayer that touched the eternal throne one after another gray-haired men and saintly women told when and how they began the new life far away on the old hills they would never see again and how they had been led and comforted in their pilgrimage young disciples in the flush of their first love and the rapture of newborn hope were borne out on a tide of resistless feeling into that ocean whose waters encircled the universe the radiance from the heavenly hills was reflected from the consecrated encampment and the angels of god hovered over the spot judge robinson rose to his feet and stepped into the altar the sunlight at that moment falling upon his face every voice was hushed as with the orator's indefinable magnetism he drew every eye upon him the pause was thrilling at length he spoke this is a mount of transfiguration the transfiguration is on hill and valley on tree and shrub on grass and flower on earth and sky it is on your faces that shine like the face of moses when he came down from the awful mount where he met jehovah face to face the same light is on your faces for here is god shekinah this is the gate of heaven i see its shining hosts i hear the melody of its songs the angels of god encamped with us last night and they linger with us this morning tarry with us ye sinless ones for this is heaven on earth he paused with extended arm gazing upward entranced the scene that followed beggar's description by a simultaneous impulse all rose to their feet and pressed toward the speaker with awe-struck faces and when grandmother rucker the matriarch of the valley with luminous face and uplifted eyes broke into a shout it swelled into a melodious hurricane that shook the very hills he ought to have been a preacher so he said to me once i felt the impulse and heard the call in my early manhood i conferred with flesh and blood and was disobedient to the heavenly vision i have had some little success at the bar on the hustings and in legislative halls but how paltry has it been in comparison with the true life and high career that might have been mine he was from the hill country of north carolina and its flavor clung to him to the last he had his gloomy moods but his heart was fresh as a blue ridge breeze in may and his wit bubbled forth like a mountain spring there was no bitterness in his satire the very victim of his thrust enjoyed the keenness of the stroke for there was no poison in the weapon at times he seemed inspired and you thrilled melted and soared under the touches of this western coleridge he came to my room at the golden eagle in sacramento city one night and left at two o'clock in the morning he walked the floor and talked and it was the grandest monologue i ever listened to one part of it i could not forget it was with reference to preachers who turn aside from their holy calling to engage in secular pursuits or in politics it is turning away from angels food to feed on garbage think of spending a whole life in contemplating the grandest things and working for the most glorious ends instructing the ignorant consoling the sorrowing winning the wayward back to duty and to peace pointing the dying to him who is the light and the life of men animating the living to seek from the highest motives a holy life and a sublime destiny oh it is a life that might draw an angel from the skies if there is a special hell for fools it should be kept for the man who turns aside from a life like this to trade or dig the earth or wrangle in a court of law or scramble for an office 
He looked at me as he spoke, with flashing eyes and curled lip. That is all true and very fine, Judge, but it sounds just a little peculiar as coming from you. I am the very man to say it, for I am the man who bitterly sees its truth. Do not make the missteps that I did. A man might well be willing to live on bread and water and walk the world afoot for the privilege of giving all his thoughts to the grandest themes and all his service to the highest objects. As a lawyer, my life has been spent in a prolonged quarrel about money, land, houses, cattle, thieving, slandering, murdering, and other villainy. The little episodes of politics that have given variety to my career have only shown me the baseness of human nature and the pettiness of human ambition. There are men who will fill these places and do this work, and who want and will choose nothing better. Let them have all the good they can get out of such things. But the minister of the gospel, who comes down from the height of his high calling to engage in this scramble, does that which makes devils laugh and angels weep. This was the substance of what he said on this point. I have never forgotten it. I am glad he came to my room that night. What else he said I cannot write. But the remembrance of it is like to that of a melody that lingers in my soul when the music has ceased. I thank you for your sermon today. You never told a single lie. This was his remark at the close of a service in Minna Street one Sunday. What is the meaning of that remark? That the exaggerations of the pulpit repel thousands from the truth. Moderation of statement is a rare excellence. A deep spiritual insight enables a religious teacher to shade his meanings where it is required. Deep piety is genius for the pulpit. Mediocrity and native endowments, conjoined with spiritual stolidity in the pulpit, does more harm than all the open apostles of infidelity combined. They take the divinity out of religion and kill the faith of those who hear them none but inspired men should stand in the pulpit religion is not in the intellect merely the world by wisdom cannot know god the attempt to find out god by the intellect has always been and always must be the completest of failures religion is the sphere of the supernatural and stands not in the wisdom of men but in the power of god it has often happened that men of the first order of talent and the highest culture have been converted by the preaching of men of weak intellect and limited education but who were directly taught of god and had drunk deep from the font of living truth in personal experience of the blessed power of christian faith it was through the intellect that the devil seduced the first pair when we rest in the intellect only we miss god with the heart only can man believe unto righteousness the evidence that satisfies is based on consciousness consciousness is the satisfying demonstration eye hath not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god hath prepared for them that love him but god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit they can be revealed in no other way here was the secret he had learned, and that had brought a new joy and glory into his life as it neared the sunset. The great change dated from a dark and rainy night as he walked home in Sacramento City. Not more tangible to Saul of Tarsus was the vision, or more distinctly audible the voice that spoke to him on the way to Damascus, than was the revelation of Jesus Christ to this lawyer of penetrating intellect large and varied reading and sharp perception of human folly and weakness it was a case of conversion in the fullest and divinest sense he never fell from the wonder world of grace to which he had been lifted his youth seemed to be renewed and his life had rebloomed and its winter was turned into spring under the touch of him who maketh all things new he was a new man and he lived in a new world he never failed to attend the class meetings and in his talks there the flashes of his genius set religious truths in new lights and the little band of methodists were treated to bursts of fervid eloquence such as might kindle the listening thousands of metropolitan churches into admiration or melt them into tears 
on such occasions i could not help regretting anew that the world had lost what this man might have wrought had his path in life taken a different direction at the start he died suddenly and when in the city of los angeles i read the telegram announcing his death i felt mingled with the pain at the loss of a friend exultation that before there was any reaction in his religious life his mighty soul had found a congenial home amid the supernal glories and sublime joys of the world of spirits the moral of this man's life will be seen by him for whom this imperfect sketch has been penciled end of chapter twenty seven Chapter Twenty Eight of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight. Jack White. The only thing white about him was his name. He was a Paiute Indian, and Paiutes are neither white nor pretty. There is only one being in human shape uglier than a Paiute buck, and that is a Paiute squaw one i saw at the sink of the humboldt haunts me yet her hideous face begrimed with dirt and smeared with yellow paint bleared and leering eyes and horrid long flapping breasts ugh it was a sight to make one feel sick a degraded woman is the saddest spectacle on earth shakespeare knew what he was doing when he made the witches in macbeth of the feminine gender but as you look at them you almost forget that these piute hags are women they seem a cross between brute and devil the unity of the human race is a fact which i accept but some of our brothers and sisters are far gone from original loveliness if eve could see these piute women she would not be in a hurry to claim them as her daughters and adam would feel like disowning some of his sons as it appears to me however these repulsive savages furnish an argument in support of two fundamental facts of christianity one fact is god did indeed make of one blood all the nations of the earth the other is the fact of the fall and depravity of the human race this unspeakable ugliness of these indians is owing to their evil living dirty as they are the little indian children are not at all repulsive in expression a boy of ten years who stood half naked shivering in the wind with his bow and arrows had well-shaped features and a pleasant expression of countenance with just a little of the look of animal cunning that belongs to all wild tribes the ugliness grows on these indians fearfully fast when it sets in the brutalities of the lives they lead stamp themselves on their faces and no other animal on earth equals in ugliness the animal called man when he is nothing but an animal there was a mystery about jack white's early life he was born in the sagebrush desert beyond the sierras and like all indian babies doubtless had a hard time at the outset a christian's pig or puppy is as well cared for as a paiute papoose jack was found in a deserted indian camp in the mountains he had been left to die and was taken charge of by the kind-hearted john m white who was then digging for gold in the northern mines he and his good christian wife had mercy on the little indian boy that looked up at them so pitifully with his wondering black eyes at first he had the frightened and bewildered look of a captured wild creature but he soon began to be more at ease he acquired the english language slowly and never did lose the peculiar accent of his tribe the miners called him jack white not knowing any other name for him moving to the beautiful san ramon valley not far from the bay of san francisco the whites took jack with them they taught him the leading doctrines and facts of the bible and made him useful in domestic service he grew and thrived broad-shouldered muscular and straight as an arrow jack was admired for his strength and agility by the white boys with whom he was brought into contact though not quarrelsome he had a steady courage that backed by his great strength inspired respect and ensured good treatment from them growing up amid these influences his features were softened into a civilized expression and his tawny face was not unpleasing 
the heavy under jaw and square forehead gave him an appearance of hardness which was greatly relieved by the honest look out of his eyes and the smile which now and then would slowly creep over his face like the movement of the shadow of a thin cloud on a calm day in summer an indian smiles deliberately and in a dignified way at least jack did i first knew jack at santa rosa of which beautiful town his patron mr white was then the marshal jack came to my sunday school and was taken into a class of about twenty boys taught by myself they were the noisy element of the school ranging from ten to fifteen years of age too large to show the docility of the little lads but not old enough to have attained the self-command and self-respect that come later in life though he was much older than any of them and heavier than his teacher this class suited jack the white boys all liked him and he liked me we had grand times with that class the only way to keep them in order was to keep them very busy the plan of having them answer in concert was adopted with decided results it kept them awake and the whole school with them for california boys have strong lungs twenty boys speaking all at once with eager excitement and flashing eyes waked the drowsiest drone in the room a gentle hint was given now and then to take a little lower key in these lessons jack's deep guttural tones came in with marked effect and it was delightful to see how he enjoyed it all and the singing made his swarthy features glow with pleasure though he rarely joined in it having some misgiving as to the melody of his voice the truths of the gospel took strong hold of jack's mind and his inquiries indicated a deep interest in the matter of religion i was therefore not surprised when during a protracted meeting in the town jack became one of the converts but there was surprise and delight among the brethren at the class meeting when jack rose in his place and told what great things the lord had done for him dwelling with special emphasis on the words i am happy because i know jesus takes my sins away i know he takes my sins away his voice melted into softness and a tear trickled down his cheek as he spoke and when dan duncan the leader crossed over the room and grasped his hand in a burst of joy there was a glad chorus of rejoicing methodists over jack white the piute convert jack never missed a service at the church and in the social meetings he never failed to tell the story of his new-born joy and hope and always with thrilling effect as he repeated with trembling voice i am happy because i know jesus takes my sins away sin was a reality with jack and the pardon of sin the most wonderful of all facts he never tired of telling it it opened a new world to him a world of light and joy jack white in the class meeting or prayer meeting with beaming face and moistened eyes and softened voice telling of the love of jesus seemed almost of a different race from the wretched piutes of the sierras and sagebrush jack's baptism was a great event it was by immersion the first baptism of the kind i ever performed and almost the last jack had been talked to on the subject by some zealous brethren of another persuasion who magnified that mode and though he was willing to do as i advised in the matter he was evidently a little inclined to the more spectacular way of receiving the ordinance mrs white suggested that it might save future trouble and spike a gun so jack with four others was taken down to santa rosa creek that went rippling and sparkling along the southern edge of the town and duly baptized in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost a great crowd covered the bridge just below and the banks of the stream and when wesley mock the asap of santa rosa methodism struck up o oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee my saviour and my god and the chorus happy day happy day when jesus washed my sins away was swelled by hundreds of voices it was a glad moment for jack white and all of us religiously it was a warm time but the water was very cold it being one of the chilliest days i ever felt in that genial climate 
you were rather awkward brother fitzgerald in immersing those persons said my stalwart friend elder john mccorkle of the christian or campbellite church who had critically but not unkindly watched the proceedings from the bridge if you will send for me the next time i will do it for you he added pleasantly i fear it was awkwardly done for the water was very cold and a shivering man cannot be very graceful in his movements i would have done better in a baptistry with warm water and a rubber suit but of all the persons i have welcomed into the church during my ministry the reception of no one has given me more joy than that of jack white the paiute indian jack's heart yearned for his own people he wanted to tell them of jesus who would take away their sins and perhaps his indian instinct made him long for the freedom of the hills i am going to my people he said to me i want to tell them of jesus will you pray for me he added with a quiver in his voice and a heaving chest he went away and i have never seen him since where he is now i know not i trust i may meet him on mount zion with the harpers harping with their harps and singing as it were a new song before the throne postscript since this sketch was penciled the rev c y rankin in a note dated santa rosa california august three eighteen eighty says mrs white asked me to send you word of the peaceful death of jack white indian he died trusting in jesus End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of california sketches by oscar pen fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine camilla kane she was from baltimore and had the fair face and gentle voice peculiar to most baltimore women her organization was delicate but elastic one of the sort that bends easily but is hard to break in her eyes was that look of wistful sadness so often seen in holy women of her type timid as a fawn in the class meeting she spoke of her love to jesus and delight in his service in a voice low and a little hesitating but with strangely thrilling effect the meetings were sometimes held in her own little parlor in the cottage on dupont street and then we always felt that we had met where the master himself was a constant and welcome guest she was put into the crucible for more than fifteen years she suffered unceasing and intense bodily pain imprisoned in her sick chamber she fought her long hard battle the pain distorted limbs lost their use the patient face waxed more wan and the traces of agony were on it always the soft loving eyes were often tear-washed the fires were hot and they burned on through the long long years without respite the mystery of it all was too deep for me it was too deep for her but somehow it does seem that the highest suffer most the sign of rank in nature is capacity for pain and the anguish of the singer makes the sweetness of the strain the victory of her faith was complete if the inevitable why sometimes was in her thought too no shadow of distrust ever fell upon her heart her sick room was the quietest brightest spot in all the city how often did i go thither weary and faint with the roughness of the way and leave feeling that i had heard the voices and inhaled the odors of paradise a little talk a psalm and then a prayer during which the room seemed to be filled with angel presences after which the thin blue face was radiant with the light reflected from our emmanuel's face i often went to see her not so much to convey as to get a blessing her heart was kept fresh as a rose of sharon in the dew of the morning the children loved to be near her and the pathetic face of the dear crippled boy the pet of the family was always brighter in her presence thrice death came into the home circle with its shock and mighty wrenchings of the heart but the victory was not his but hers neither death nor life could separate her from the love of her lord she was one of the elect the elect are those who know having the witness in themselves 
she was conqueror of both life with its pain and its weariness death with its terror and its tragedy she did not endure merely she triumphed born on the wings of a mighty faith her soul was at times lifted above all sin and temptation and pain and the sweet abiding peace swelled into an ecstasy of sacred joy her swimming eyes and rapt look told the unutterable secret she has crossed over the narrow stream on whose margin she lingered so long and there was joy on the other side when the gentle patient holy camilla cain joined the glorified throng oh though oft depressed and lonely all my fears are laid aside if i but remember only such as these have lived and died End of chapter twenty nine Chapter thirty of California Sketches by Oscar Pin Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty Corralled. So you were corralled last night. This was the remark of a friend whom I met in the streets of Stockton the morning after my adventure. I knew what the expression meant as applied to cattle, but I had never heard it before in reference to a human being. Yes, I had been corralled and this is how it happened it was in the old days before there were any railroads in california with a wiry clean-limbed pinto horse i undertook to drive from sacramento city to stockton one day it was in the winter season and the clouds were sweeping up from the southwest the snow-crested sierra hidden from sight by dense masses of vapor boiling at their bases and massed against their sides the roads were heavy from the effects of previous rains and the plucky little pinto sweated as he pulled through the long stretches of black adobe mud a cold wind struck me in the face and the ride was a dreary one from the start but i pushed on confidently having faith in the spotted mustang despite the evident fact that he had lost no little of the spirit with which he dashed out of town at starting when a genuine mustang flags it is a serious business the hardiness and endurance of this breed of horses almost exceed belief toward night a cold rain began to fall driving in my face with the head wind still many a long mile lay between me and stockton darkness came on and it was dark indeed the outline of the horse in front could not be seen and the flat country through which i was riding was a great black sea of night i trusted to the instinct of the horse and moved on the bells of a wagon team meeting me fell upon my ear i called out hello there what's the matter answered a heavy voice through the darkness am i in the road to stockton and can i get there to-night you are in the road but you will never find your way such a night as this it is ten good miles from here you have several bridges to cross you had better stop at the first house you come to about half a mile ahead i am going to strike camp myself i thanked my adviser and went on hearing the sound of the tinkling bells but unable to see anything in a little while i saw a light ahead and was glad to see it driving up in front and halting i repeated the traveller's halloo several times and at last got a response in a hoarse gruff voice i am belated on my way to stockton and am cold and tired and hungry can i get shelter with you for the night you may try if you want to answered the unmusical voice abruptly in a few moments a man appeared to take the horse and taking my satchel in hand i went into the house the first thing that struck my attention on entering the room was a big log fire which i was glad to see for i was wet and very cold taking a chair in the corner i looked around the scene that presented itself was not reassuring the main feature of the room was a bar with an ample supply of barrels demijohns bottles tumblers and all the etc behind the counter stood the proprietor a burly fellow with a buffalo neck fair skin and blue eyes with a frightful scar across his left under jaw and neck his shirt collar was open exposing a huge chest and his sleeves were rolled up above the elbows 
i noticed also that one of his hands was minus all the fingers but the half of one the result probably of some desperate encounter i did not like the appearance of my landlord and he eyed me in a way that led me to fear that he liked my looks as little as i did his but the claims of other guests soon diverted his attention from me and i was left to get warm and make further observations at a table in the middle of the room several hard-looking fellows were betting at cards amid terrible profanity and frequent drinks of whisky they cast inquiring and not very friendly glances at me from time to time once or twice exchanging whispers and giggling as their play went on and tumbler after tumbler of whisky was drunk by them they became more boisterous threats were made of using pistols and knives with which they all seemed to be heavily armed and one sottish-looking brute actually drew forth a pistol but was disarmed in no gentle way by the big-limbed landlord the profanity and other foul language were horrible many of my readers have no conception of the brutishness of men when whisky and satan have full possession of them in the midst of a volley of oaths and terrible imprecations by one of the most violent of the set there was a faint gleam of lingering decency exhibited by one of his companions blast it dick don't cuss so loud that fellow in the corner there is a preacher there was some potency in the cloth even there how he knew my calling i do not know the remark directed particular attention to me and i became unpleasantly conspicuous scowling glances were bent upon me by two or three of the ruffians and one fellow made a profane remark not at all complimentary to my vocation whereat there was some coarse laughter in the meantime i was conscious of being very hungry my hunger like that of a boy is a very positive thing at least it was very much so in those days glancing toward the maimed and scarred giant who stood behind the bar i found he was gazing at me with a fixed expression can i get something to eat i'm very hungry sir i said in my blandest tones yes we've plenty of cold goose and maybe pete can pick up something else for you if he is sober and in a good humor come this way i followed him through a narrow passageway which led to a long low-ceilinged room along nearly the whole length of which was stretched a table around which were placed rough stools for the rough men about the place pete the cook came in and the head of the house turned me over to him and returned to his duties behind the bar from the noise of the uproar going on his presence was doubtless needed pete set before me a large roasted wild goose not badly cooked with bread milk and the inevitable cucumber pickles the knives and forks were not very bright in fact they had been subjected to influences promotive of oxidation and the dishes were not free from signs of former use nothing could be said against the tablecloth there was no tablecloth there but the goose was fat brown and tender and a hungry man defers his criticisms until he is done eating that is what i did pete evidently regarded me with curiosity he was about fifty years of age and had the look of a man who had come down in the world his face bore the marks of the effects of strong drink but it was not a bad face it was more weak than wicked are you a preacher he asked i thought so he added after getting my answer to his question of what persuasion are you he further inquired when i told him i was a methodist he said quickly and with some warmth i was sure of it this is a rough place for a man of your calling would you like some eggs we've plenty on hand and maybe you would like a cup of coffee he added with increasing hospitality i took the eggs but declined the coffee not liking the looks of the cups and saucers and not caring to wait i used to be a methodist myself said pete with a sort of choking in his throat but bad luck and bad company have brought me down to this i have a family in iowa a wife and four children i guess they think i'm dead and sometimes i wish i was pete stood by my chair actually crying the sight of a methodist preacher brought up old times he told me his story he had come to california hoping to make a fortune in a hurry but had only ill luck from the start 
His prospectings were always failures, his partners cheated him, his health broke down, his courage gave way, and, he faltered a little and then spoke it out, he took to whiskey, and then the worst came. I have come down to this, cooking for a lot of roughs at five dollars a week and all the whiskey I want. It would have been better for me if I had died when I was in the hospital at San Andreas. Poor Pete! He had indeed touched bottom. But he had a heart and a conscience still, and my own heart warmed toward my poor backslidden brother. You are not a lost man yet. You are worth a thousand dead men. You can get out of this, and you must. You must act the part of a brave man, and not be any longer a coward. Bad luck and lack of success are a disgrace to no man there is where you went wrong it was cowardly to give up and not write to your family and then take to whiskey i know all that elder there is no better little woman on earth than my wife pete choked up again you write to her this very night and go back to her and your children just as soon as you can get the money to pay your way act the man and all will come right yet i have writing materials here in my satchel pen ink paper envelopes stamps everything i am an editor and go fixed up for writing the letter was written i acting as pete's amanuensis he pleading that he was a poor scribe at best and that his nerves were too unsteady for such work taking my advice he made a clean breast of the whole matter throwing himself on the forgiveness of the wife whom he had so shamefully neglected, and promising, by the help of God, to make all the amends possible in time to come. The letter was duly directed, sealed, and stamped, and Pete looked as if a great weight had been lifted from his soul. He had made me a fire in the little stove, saying it was better than the bar-room, in which opinion I was fully agreed. There is no place for you to sleep tonight without corralling you with the fellows. There is but one bedroom, and there are fourteen bunks in it. I shuddered at the prospect. Fourteen bunks in one small room, and those whiskey-sodden, loud-cursing card-players to be my roommates for the night. I prefer sitting here by the stove all night, I said. I can employ most of the time writing if I can have a light. Pete thought a moment, looked grave, and then said, Oh, that won't do, Elder. Those fellows would take offense and make trouble. Several of them are out now goose-hunting. They will be coming in at all hours from now till daybreak, and it won't do for them to find you sitting up here alone. The best thing for you to do is to go in and take one of those bunks. You needn't take off anything but your coat and boots, and— Here he lowered his voice, looking about him as he spoke. If you have any money about, keep it next to your body. The last words were spoken with peculiar emphasis. Taking the advice given me, I took up my baggage and followed Pete to the room where I was to spend the night. Ugh! It was dreadful! The single window in the room was nailed down and the air was close and foul. The bunks were damp and dirty beyond belief, grimed with foulness and reeking with ill odors. This was being corralled. I turned to Pete, saying, I can't stand this. I will go back to the kitchen. You had better follow my advice, Elder, said he very gravely. I know things about here better than you do. It's rough, but you'd better stand it. And I did. Being corralled, I had to stand it. That fearful night, the drunken fellows staggering in one by one, cursing and hiccuping, until every bunk was occupied. They muttered oaths in their sleep, and their stertorous breathings made a concert fit for Tartarus. The sickening odors of whiskey, onions, and tobacco filled the room. I lay there and longed for daylight, which seemed as if it never would come. I thought of the descriptions I had heard and read of hell, and just then the most vivid conception of its horror was to be shut up forever with the aggravated impurity of the universe by contrast i tried to think of that city of god into which it is said there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie but they which are written in the lamb's book of life but thoughts of heaven did not suit the situation it was more suggestive of the other place the horror of being shut up eternally in hell as the companion of lost spirits was intensified by the experience and reflections of that night 
when I was corralled. Day came at last. I rose with the first streaks of the dawn, and not having much toilette to make, I was soon out of doors. Never did I breathe the pure, fresh air with such profound pleasure and gratitude. I drew deep inspirations, and, opening my coat and vest, let the breeze that swept up the valley blow upon me unrestricted. How bright was the face of nature, and how sweet her breath, after the sights, sounds, and smells of the night! I did not wait for breakfast, but had my pinto and buggy brought out, and bidding Pete good-bye, hurried on to Stockton. "'So you were corralled last night,' was the remark of a friend, quoted at the beginning of this true sketch what was the name of the proprietor of the house i gave him the name dave w he exclaimed with fresh astonishment that is the roughest place in the san joaquin valley several men have been killed and robbed there during the last two or three years i trust pete got back safe to his wife and children in iowa and i trust i may never be corralled again End of chapter 30Chapter 31 of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 The Rabbi Seated in his library, enveloped in a faded figured gown, a black velvet cap on his massive head, there was an oriental look about him that arrested your attention at once. Power and gentleness, childlike simplicity and scholarliness were curiously mingled in this man. His library was a reflex of its owner. In it were books that the great public libraries of the world could not match black leather folios that were almost as old as the printing art, illuminated volumes that were once the pride and joy of men who had been in their graves many generations, rabbinical lore, theology, magic, and great volumes of Hebrew literature that looked, when placed beside a modern book, like an old ducal palace alongside a gingerbread cottage of today. I do not think he ever felt at home amid the hurry and rush of San Francisco. He could not adjust himself to the people. He was devout. They were intensely worldly. He thundered this sentence from the teacher's desk in the synagogue one morning, O oh, ye Jews of San Francisco, you have so fully given yourselves up to material things that you are losing the very instinct of immortality. Your only idea of religion is to acquire the Hebrew language, and you don't know that. His port and voice were like those of one of the old Hebrew prophets. Elijah himself was not more fearless. Yet how deep was his love for his race! Jeremiah was not more tender when he wept for the slain of the daughter of his people. His reproofs were resented, and he had a taste of persecution, but the Jews of San Francisco understood him at last. The poor and the little children knew him from the start. He lived mostly among his books and in his school for poor children, whom he taught without charge. His habits were so simple, and his bodily wants so few, that it cost him but a trifle to live. When a synagogue frowned on him, he was as independent as Elijah at the brook Cherith. It is hard to starve a man to whom crackers and water are a royal feast. His belief in God and in the supernatural was startlingly vivid. The voice that spoke from Sinai was still audible to him, and the arm that delivered Israel he saw still stretched out over the nations. The miracles of the Old Testament were as real to him as the premiership of Disraeli or the financiering of the Rothschilds. There was, at the same time, a vein of rationalism that ran through his thought and speech. We were speaking one day on the subject of miracles, and with his usual energy of manner he said, there was no need of any literal angel to shut the mouths of the lions to save Daniel. The awful holiness of the prophet was enough. There was so much of God in him that the savage creatures submitted to him as they did to unsinning Adam. Man's dominion over nature was broken by sin, but in the golden age to come it will be restored. A man in full communion with God wields a divine power in every sphere that he touches." 
His face glowed as he spoke, and his voice was subdued into a solemnity of tone that told how his reverent and adoring soul was thrilled with this vision of the coming glory of redeemed humanity. He knew the New Testament by heart as well as the Old. The sayings of Jesus were often on his lips. One day, in a musing, half-soliloquizing way, I heard him say, "'It is wonderful, wonderful, a Hebrew peasant from the hills of Galilee, without learning, noble birth, or power, subverts all the philosophies of the world, and makes himself the central figure of all history. It is wonderful!' He half whispered the words, and his eyes had the introspective look of a man who is thinking deeply. He came to see me at our cottage on Post Street one morning before breakfast. In grading a street, a house in which I had lived and had the ill luck to own on Pine Street, had been undermined and toppled over into the street below, falling on the slate roof and breaking all to pieces. He came to tell me of it and to extend his sympathy. I thought I would come first, so you might get the bad news from a friend rather than a stranger. You have lost a house, but it is a small matter. Your little boy there might have put out his eye with a pair of scissors, or he might have swallowed a pen and lost his life. There are many things constantly taking place that are harder to bear than the loss of a house. Many other wise words did the rabbi speak, and before he left I felt that a house was indeed a small thing to grieve over. He spoke with charming freedom and candor of all sorts of people. Of Christians, the Unitarians have the best heads, and the Methodists the best hearts. The Roman Catholics hold the masses because they give their people plenty of form. The masses will never receive truth in its simple essence. They must have it in a way that will make it digestible and assimilable, just as their stomachs demand bread and meats and fruits, not their extracts or distilled essences, for daily food. As to Judaism, it is on the eve of great changes. What these changes will be I know not, except that I am sure the God of our fathers will fulfill his promise to Israel. This generation will probably see great things. Do you mean the literal restoration of the Jews to Palestine? He looked at me with an intense gaze and hastened not to answer. At last he spoke slowly. When the perturbed elements of religious thought crystallize into clearness and enduring forms, the chosen people will be one of the chief factors in reaching that final solution of the problems which convulse this age. He was one of the speakers at the great Mortara indignation meeting in San Francisco. The speech of the occasion was that of Colonel Baker, the orator who went to Oregon, and in a single campaign magnetized the Oregonians so completely by his splendid eloquence that, passing by all their old party leaders, they sent him to the United States Senate. No one who heard Baker's peroration that night will ever forget it. His dark eyes blazed, his form dilated, and his voice was like a bugle in battle. They tell us that the Jew is accursed of God. This has been the plea of the bloody tyrants and robbers that oppressed and plundered them during the long ages of their exile and agony. But the Almighty God executes his own judgments. Woe to him who presumes to wield his thunderbolts. They fall in blasting, consuming vengeance upon his own head. God deals with his chosen people in judgment, but he says to men, Touch them at your peril. They that spoil them shall be for a spoil. They that carried them away captive shall themselves go into captivity. The Assyrian smote the Jew, and where is the proud Assyrian empire? Rome ground them under her iron heel, and where is the empire of the Caesars? Spain smote the Jews, and where is her glory? The desert sands cover the site of Babylon the Great. The power that hurled the hosts of Titus against the holy city, Jerusalem, was shivered to pieces. The banner of Spain that floated in triumph over half the world and fluttered in the breezes of every sea is now the emblem of a glory that is gone and the ensign of a power that has waned. The Jews are in the hands of God. He has dealt with them in judgment, but they are still the children of promise. 
the day of their long exile shall end and they will return to zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads the words were something like this but who could picture baker's oratory as well try to paint a storm in the tropics real thunder and lightning cannot be put on canvas the rabbi made a speech and it was the speech of a man who had come from his books and prayers he made a tender appeal for the mother and father of the abducted jewish boy and argued the question as calmly and in as sweet a spirit as if he had been talking over an abstract question in his study the vast crowd looked upon that strange figure with a sort of pleased wonder and the rabbi seemed almost unconscious of their presence he was as free from self-consciousness as a little child and many a gentile heart warmed that night to the simple-hearted sage who stood before them pleading for the rights of human nature the old man was often very sad in such moods he would come round to our cottage on post street and sit with us until late at night unburdening his aching heart and relaxing by degrees into a playfulness that was charming from its very awkwardness he would bring little picture books for the children pat them on their heads and praise them they were always glad to see him and would nestle round him lovingly we all loved him and felt glad in the thought that he left our little circle lighter at heart he lived alone once when i playfully spoke to him of matrimony he smiled quietly and said no no my books and my poor school children are enough for me he died suddenly and alone he had been out one windy night visiting the poor came home sick and before morning was in the world of spirits which was so real to his faith and for which he longed he left his little fortune of a few thousand dollars to the poor of his native village of posen in poland and thus passed from california life dr julius ekman the rabbi end of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty two Ah Lee. He was the sunniest of Mongolians. The Chinaman, under favorable conditions, is not without a sly sense of humor of his peculiar sort, but to American eyes there is nothing very pleasant in his angular and smileless features. The manner of his contact with many Californians is not calculated to evoke mirthfulness. The brickbat may be a good political argument in the hands of a hoodlum, but it does not make its target playful. To the Chinaman in America, the situation is new and grave, and he looks sober and holds his peace. Even the funny-looking, becued little Chinese children wear a look of solemn inquisitiveness as they toddle along the streets of San Francisco by the side of their queer-looking mothers. In his own land, overpopulated and misgoverned, the Chinaman has a hard fight for existence. In these United States his advent is regarded somewhat in the same spirit as that of the seventeen-year locusts or the cotton worm the history of a people may be read in their physiognomy the monotony of chinese life during these thousands of years is reflected in the dull monotonous faces of chinamen ah lee was an exception his skin was almost fair his features almost caucasian in their regularity his dark eye lighted up with a peculiar brightness and there was a remarkable buoyancy and glow about him every way he was about twenty years old how long he had been in california i know not when he came into my office to see me the first time he rushed forward and impulsively grasped my hand saying my name ali you dr Plitzjelly." that was the way my name sounded as he spoke it i was glad to see him and told him so you make a christian newspaper you talk a jesus mr taylor telly me me christian me love jesus yes ali was a christian there could be no doubt about that i have seen many happy converts but none happier than he he was not merely happy he was ecstatic the story of the mighty change was a simple one but thrilling 
near vacaville the former seat of the pacific methodist college in solano county lived the rev irie taylor a member of the pacific conference of the methodist episcopal church south mr taylor was a praying man and he had a praying wife ali was employed as a domestic in the family his curiosity was first excited in regard to family prayers he wanted to know what it all meant the taylors explained the old old story took hold of ah lee he was put to thinking and then to praying the idea of the forgiveness of sins filled him with wonder and longing he hung with breathless interest upon the word of the lord opening to him a world of new thought the tide of feeling bore him on and at the foot of the cross he found what he sought ah lee was converted converted as paul as augustine as wesley were converted he was born into a new life that was as real to him as his consciousness was real this psychological change will be understood by some of my readers others may regard it as they do any other inexplicable phenomenon in that mysterious inner world of the human soul in which are lived the real lives of us all in ali's heathen soul was wrought the gracious wonder that makes joy among the angels of god the young chinese disciple it is to be feared got little sympathy outside the taylor household and a few others the right hand of christian fellowship was withheld by many or extended in a cold half reluctant way but it mattered not to ali he had his own heaven coldness was wasted on him the light within him brightened everything without ali became a frequent visitor to our cottage on the hill he always came and went rejoicing the gospel of john was his daily study and delight to his ardent and receptive nature it was a diamond mind two things he wanted to do he had a strong desire to translate his favorite gospel into chinese and to lead his parents to christ when he spoke of his father and mother his voice would soften his eyes moisten with tenderness i go back to china and tell ye my father and mother allee good news he said with beaming face this peculiar development of filial reverence and affection among the chinese is a hopeful feature of their national life it furnishes a solid basis for a strong christian nation the weakening of this sentiment weakens religious susceptibility its destruction is spiritual death the worship of ancestors is idolatry but it is that form of it nearest akin to the worship of the heavenly father the honoring of the father and mother on earth is the commandment with promise and it is the promise of this life and of life everlasting there is an interblending of human and divine loves earth and heaven are unitary in companionship and destiny the golden ladder rests on the earth and reaches up into the heavens about twice a week ah lee came to see us at north beach these visits subjected our courtesy and tact to a severe test he loved little children and at each visit he would bring with him a gaily painted box filled with chinese sweetmeats such sweetmeats they were too strong for the palates of even young californians what cannot be relished and digested by a healthy california boy must be formidable indeed those sweetmeats were but i give it up they were indescribable the boxes were pretty and after being emptied of their contents they were kept ah lee's joy in his new experience did not abate under the touch of the holy spirit his spiritual nature had suddenly blossomed into tropical luxuriance to look at him made me think of the second chapter of the acts of the apostles if i had had any lingering doubts of the transforming power of the gospel upon all human hearts this conversion of ah lee would have settled the question forever the bitter feeling against the chinese that just then found expression in california through so many channels did not seem to affect him in the least he had his christianity warm from the heart of the son of god and no caricature of its feature nor perversion of its spirit could bewilder him for a moment he knew whom he had believed none of these things moved him o blessed mystery of god's mercy that turns the night of heathen darkness into day and makes the desert soul bloom with the flowers of paradise 
o cross of the crucified lift it up it shall draw all men to their saviour and o blind and slow of heart to believe why could we not discern that this young chinaman's conversion was our lord's gracious challenge to our faith and the pledge of success to the church that will go into the world with the news of salvation ah lee has vanished from my observation but i have a persuasion that is like a burning prophecy that he will be heard from again to me he types the blessedness of old china new-born in the life of the lord and in his luminous face i read the prophecy of the redemption of the millions who have so long bowed before the great red dragon but who now wait for the coming of the deliverer End of chapter 32chapter thirty three of california sketches by oscar pen fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty three chaley vista two footnotes chaley vista sky view a spot of exquisite beauty on the southern slope of the cahuenga mountains near los angeles california as seen by the writer on christmas morning december twenty five eighteen ninety four Cucumongo, the highest peak of the range, snow-capped. End notes. Chaley Vista, Chaley Vista, on Christmas morn at early dawn, listen. Leeward, to the seaward, earth's great ocean in rhythmic motion, its song doth sing to Christ the King. Chaley Vista, Chaley Vista, the valleys green and groves between, with changing tents and sunny glints, and clouds aglow and earth below, tell glory bright of Christ the light. Chaley Vista, Chaley Vista, yon hills eternal of might supernal, with crests snow crowned, feet flower bound, their peaks prolong the Christmas song, and Jesus praise, ancient of days. Chaley Vista, Chaley Vista, sky of sapphire bending nigher, Cucumongo, let thy song go skyward soaring where him adoring souls saved by grace see face to face end of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of california sketches by oscar penn fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four the emperor norton that was his title he wore it with an air that was a strange mixture of the mock heroic and the pathetic he was mad on this one point and strangely shrewd and well informed on almost every other arrayed in a faded blue uniform with brass buttons and epaulets wearing a cocked hat with an eagle's feather and at times with a rusty sword at his side he was a conspicuous figure in the streets of san francisco and a regular habitue of all its public places in person he was stout full-chested though slightly stooped with a large head heavily coated with bushy black hair an aquiline nose and dark gray eyes whose mild expression added to the benignity of his face on the end of his nose grew a tuft of long hairs which he seemed to prize as a natural mark of royalty or chieftainship indeed there was a popular legend afloat that he was of true royal blood a stray bourbon or something of the sort his speech was singularly fluent and elegant the emperor was one of the celebrities that no visitor failed to see it is said that his mind was unhinged by a sudden loss of fortune in the early days by the treachery of a partner in trade the sudden blow was deadly and the quiet thrifty affable man of business became a wreck by nothing is the inmost quality of a man made more manifest than by the manner in which he greets misfortune one when the sky darkens having strong impulse and weak will rushes into suicide another with a large vein of cowardice seeks to drown the sense of disaster in strong drink yet another tortured in every fibre of a sensitive organization flees from the scene of his troubles and the faces of those that know him preferring exile to shame 
the truest man when assailed by sudden calamity rallies all the reserved forces of a splendid manhood to meet the shock and like a good ship lifting itself from the trough of the swelling sea mounts the wave and rides on it was a curious idiosyncrasy that led this man when fortune and reason were swept away at a stroke to fall back upon this imaginary imperialism the nature that could thus when the real fabric of life was wrecked construct such another by the exercise of a disordered imagination must have been originally of a gentle and magnanimous type the broken fragments of mind like those of a statue reveal the quality of the original creation it may be that he was happier than many who have worn real crowns napoleon at chiselhurst or his greater uncle at st helena might have been gainer by exchanging lots with this man who had the inward joy of conscious greatness without its burden and its perils to all public places he had free access and no pageant was complete without his presence from time to time he issued proclamations signed norton i which the lively san francisco dailies were always ready to print conspicuously in their columns the style of these proclamations was stately the royal first person plural being used by him with all gravity and dignity ever and anon as his uniform became dilapidated or ragged a reminder of the condition of the imperial wardrobe would be given in one or more of the newspapers and then in a few days he would appear in a new suit he had the entree of all the restaurants and he lodged uh, nobody knew where it was said that he was cared for by members of the freemason society to which he belonged at the time of his fall i saw him often in my congregation in the pine street church along in eighteen fifty eight and into the sixties he was a respectful and attentive listener to preaching on the occasion of one of his first visits he spoke to me after the service saying in a kind and patronizing tone i think it my duty to encourage religion and morality by showing myself at church and to avoid jealousy i attend them all in turn he loved children and would come into the sunday school and sit delighted with their singing when in distributing the presents on a christmas tree a necktie was handed him as the gift of the young ladies he received it with much satisfaction making a kingly bow of gracious acknowledgment meeting him one day in the springtime holding my little girl by the hand he paused looked at the child's bright face and taking a rosebud from his buttonhole he presented it to her with a manner so graceful and a smile so benignant as to show that under the dingy blue uniform there beat the heart of a gentleman he kept a keen eye on current events and sometimes expressed his views with great sagacity one day he stopped me on the street saying i have just read the report of the political sermon of dr Blank giving the name of a noted sensational preacher who was in the habit at times of discussing politics from his pulpit i disapprove political preaching what do you think i expressed my cordial concurrence i will put a stop to it the preachers must stop preaching politics or they must all come into one state church i will at once issue a decree to that effect for some unknown reason that decree never was promulgated after the war he took a deep interest in the reconstruction of the southern states i met him one day on montgomery street when he asked me in a tone and with a look of earnest solicitude do you hear any complaint or dissatisfaction concerning me from the south i gravely answered in the negative i was for keeping the country undivided but i have the kindest feeling for the southern people and will see that they are protected in all their rights perhaps if i were to go among them in person it might have a good effect what do you think i looked at him keenly as i made some suitable reply but could see nothing in his expression but simple sincerity he seemed to feel that he was indeed the father of his people george washington himself could not have adopted a more paternal tone 
walking along the street behind the emperor one day my curiosity was a little excited by seeing him thrust his hand with sudden energy into the hip pocket of his blue trousers the hip pocket by the way is a modern american stupidity associated in the popular mind with rowdyism pistol shooting and murder hip pockets should be abolished wherever there are courts of law and civilized men and women but what was the emperor after withdrawing his hand just as i overtook him the mystery was revealed it grasped a thick bologna sandwich which he began to eat with unroyal relish it gave me a shock but he was not the first royal personage who has exhibited low tastes and carnal hankerings he was seldom made sport of or treated rudely i saw him on one occasion when a couple of passing hoodlums jeered at him he turned and gave them a look so full of mingled dignity pain and surprise that the low fellows were abashed and uttering a forced laugh with averted faces they hurried on the presence that can bring shame to a san francisco hoodlum must indeed be kingly or in some way impressive in that genus the beastliness and devilishness of american city life reach their lowest denomination when the brutality of the savage and the lowest forms of civilized vice are combined human nature touches bottom the emperor never spoke of his early life the veil of mystery on this point increased the popular curiosity concerning him and invested him with something of a romantic interest there was one thing that excited his disgust and indignation the bohemians of the san francisco press got into the practice of attaching his name to their satires and hits at current follies knowing that the well-known norton i at the end would ensure a reading this abuse of the liberty of the press he denounced with dignified severity threatening extreme measures if it were not stopped but nowhere on earth did the press exhibit more audacity or take a wider range and it would have required a sterner heart and a stronger hand than that of norton i to put a hook into its jaws the end of all human grandeur real or imaginary comes at last the emperor became thinner and more stooped as the years passed the humor of his hallucination retired more and more into the background and its pathetic side came out more strongly his step was slow and feeble and there was that look in his eyes so often seen in the old and sometimes in the young just before the great change comes a rapt far-away look suggesting that the invisible is coming into view the shadows vanishing and the realities appearing the familiar face and form were missed on the streets and it was known that he was dead he had gone to his lonely lodging and quietly laid down and died the newspapers spoke of him with pity and respect and all san francisco took time in the midst of its roar and rush fever of perpetual excitement to give a kind thought to the dead man who had passed over to the life where all delusions are laid aside where the mystery of life shall be revealed and where we shall see that through all its tangled web ran the golden thread of mercy his life was an illusion and the thousands who sleep with him in lone mountain waiting the judgment day were his brothers End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of california sketches by oscar pen fitzgerald this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five buffalo jones that is what the boys called him his real christian name was zachariah the way he got the name he went by was this he was a methodist and prayed in public he was excitable and his lungs were of extraordinary power when fully aroused his voice sounded it was said like the bellowing of a whole herd of buffaloes it had peculiar reverberations rumbling roaring shaking the very roof of the sanctuary or echoing among the hills when let out at its utmost strength at a camp meeting this is why they called him buffalo jones it was his voice there never was such another in ohio he was a blacksmith and a fighting man 
he had whipped every man who would fight him in a whole tier of counties he was converted after the old way that is to say he was powerfully converted a circuit rider preached the sermon that converted him his anguish was awful the midnight hour found him in tears the ohio forest resounded with his cries for mercy when he found peace it swelled into rapture he joined the church militant among the methodists and he stuck to them quarrelled with them and loved them all his life he had many troubles and gave much trouble to many people the old adam died hard in the fighting blacksmith his pastor his family his friends his fellow members in the church all got a portion of his wrath in due season if they swerved a hairbreadth from the straight line of duty as he saw it i was his pastor and i never had a truer friend or a severer censor one sunday morning he electrified my congregation at the close of the sermon by rising in his place and making a personal application of a portion of it to individuals present and insisting on their immediate expulsion from the church he had another side to his character and at times was as tender as a woman he acted as class leader in his melting moods he moved every eye to tears as he passed round among the brethren and sisters weeping exhorting and rejoicing at such times his great voice softened into a pathos that none could resist and swept the cords of sympathy with resistless power but when his other mood was upon him he was fearful he scourged the unfaithful with a whip of fire he would quote with a singular fluency and aptness every passage of scripture that blasted hypocrites reproved the lukewarm or threatened damnation to the sinner at such times his voice sounded like the shout of a warrior in battle and the timid and wondering hearers looked as if they were in the midst of the thunder and lightning of a tropical storm i remember the shock he gave a quiet and timid lady whom i had persuaded to remain for the class meeting after service fixing his stern and fiery gaze upon her and knitting his great bushy eyebrows he thundered the question sister do you ever pray the startled woman nearly sprang from her seat in a panic as she stammered hurriedly uh, yes sir yes sir she did not attend his class meeting again at a camp meeting he was present and in one of his bitterest moods the meeting was not conducted in a way to suit him he was grim critical and contemptuous making no concealment of his dissatisfaction the preaching displeased him particularly he groaned frowned and in other ways showed his feelings at length he could stand it no longer a young brother had just closed a sermon of a mild and persuasive kind and no sooner had he taken his seat than the old man arose looking forth upon the vast audience and then casting a sharp and scornful glance at the preachers in and around the stand he said you preachers of these days have no gospel in you you remind me of a man going into his barnyard early in the morning to feed his flock he has a basket on his arm and here come the horses nickering the cows lowing the calves and sheep bleeding the hogs squealing the turkeys gobbling the hens clucking and the roosters crowing they all gather round him expecting to be fed and lo his basket is empty you take texts and you preach but you have no gospel your baskets are empty here he darted a defiant glance at the astonished preachers and then turning to one he added in a milder and patronizing tone you brother sim do preach a little gospel in your basket there is one little nubbin down he sat leaving the brethren to meditate on what he had said the silence that followed was deep at one time his conscience became troubled about the use of tobacco and he determined to quit this was the second great struggle of his life he was running a sawmill in the foothills at the time and lodged in a little cabin near by suddenly deprived of the stimulant to which it had so long been accustomed his nervous system was wrought up to a pitch of frenzy he would rush from the cabin climb along the hillside run leaping from rock to rock now and then screaming like a maniac then he would rush back to the cabin 
seize a plug of tobacco smell it rub it against his lips and away he would go again he smelled but never tasted it again i was resolved to conquer and by the grace of god i did he said that was a great victory for the fighting blacksmith when a melodian was introduced into the church he was sorely grieved and furiously angry he argued against it he expostulated he protested he threatened he stayed away from church he wrote me a letter in which he expressed his feelings thus san jose eighteen sixty dear brother they have got the devil into the church now put your foot on its tail and it squeals z jones this was his figurative way of putting it i was told that he had on a former occasion dealt with the question in a more summary way by taking his axe and splitting a melodeon to pieces neutrality in politics was of course impossible to such a man in the civil war his heart was with the south he gave up when stonewall jackson was killed it is all over the praying man is gone he said and he sobbed like a child from that day he had no hope for the confederacy though once or twice when the feeling ran high he expressed a readiness to use carnal weapons in defense of his political principles for all his opinions on the subject he found support from the bible which he read and studied with unwearying diligence he took its words literally on all occasions and the old testament history had a wonderful charm for him he would have been ready to hew any modern agog in pieces before the lord he finally found his way to the insane asylum the reader has already seen how abnormal was his mind and will not be surprised that his storm-tossed soul lost its rudder at last but mid all its veerings he never lost sight of the star that had shed its light upon his checkered path of life he raved and prayed and wept by turns the horrors of mental despair would be followed by the gleams of seraphic joy when one of his stormy moods was upon him his mighty voice could be heard above all the sounds of that sad and pitiful company of broken and wrecked souls the old class meeting instinct and habit showed itself in his semi-lucid intervals he would go round among the patients questioning them as to their religious feeling and behavior in true class meeting style dr shirtliff one day overheard a colloquy between him and dr rogers a freethinker and reformer whose vagaries had culminated in his shaving close one side of his immense whiskers leaving the other side in all its flowing amplitude poor fellow pitiable as was his case he made a ludicrous figure walking the streets of san francisco half shaved and defiant of the wonder and ridicule he excited the old class leader's voice was earnest and loud as he said now rogers you must pray if you will get down at the feet of jesus and confess your sins and ask him to bless you he will hear you and give you peace but if you won't do it he continued with growing excitement and kindling anger at the thought you are the most infernal rascal that ever lived and i'll beat you into a jelly the good doctor had to interfere at this point for the old man was in the very act of carrying out his threat to punish rogers bodily on the bare possibility that he would not pray as he was told to do and so that extemporized class meeting came to an abrupt end pray with me he said to me the last time i saw him at the asylum closing the door of the little private office we knelt side by side and the poor old sufferer bathed in tears and docile as a little child prayed to the once suffering once crucified but risen and interceding jesus when he arose from his knees his eyes were wet and his face showed that there was a great calm within we never met again he went home to die the storms that had swept his soul subsided the light of reason was rekindled and the light of faith burned brightly and in a few weeks he died in great peace and another glad voice joined in the anthems of the blood-washed millions in the city of god End of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty six Suicide in California. 
a half protest rises within me as i begin this sketch the page almost turns crimson under my gaze and shadowy forms come forth out of the darkness into which they wildly plunged out of life's misery into death's mystery ghostly lips cry out leave us alone why call us back to a world where we lost all and in quitting which we risked all disturb us not to gratify the cold curiosity of unfeeling strangers we have passed on beyond human jurisdiction to the realities we dared to meet give us the pity and courtesy of your silence o living brother who didst escape the wreck the appeal is not without effect and if i lift the shroud that covers the faces of these dead self-destroyed it will be tenderly pityingly these simple sketches of real california life would be imperfect if this characteristic feature were entirely omitted for california was and is yet the land of suicides in a single year there were one hundred and six in san francisco alone the whole number of suicides in the state would if the horror of each case could be even imperfectly imagined appall even the driest statistician of crime the causes for this prevalence of self-destruction are to be sought in the peculiar conditions of the country and the habits of the people california with all its beauty grandeur and riches has been to the many who have gone thither a land of great expectations but small results this was specially the case in the earlier period of its history after the discovery of gold and its settlement by americans as we call ourselves par excellence hurled from the topmost height of extravagant hope to the lowest deep of disappointment the shock is too great for reaction the rope razor bullet or deadly drug finishes the tragedy materialistic infidelity in california is the avowed belief of multitudes and its subtle poison infects the minds and unconsciously the actions of thousands who recoil from the dark abyss that yawns at the feet of its adherents with its fascination of horror under such circumstances suicide becomes logical to a man who has neither hope nor dread of a hereafter sins against the body and especially the nervous system were prevalent and days of pain sleepless nights and weakened wills were the precursors of the tragedy that promised change if not rest the devil gets men inside a fiery circle made by their own sin and folly from which there seems to be no escape but by death and they will unbar its awful door with their own trembling hands there is another door of escape for the worst and most wretched and it is opened to the penitent by the hand that was nailed to the rugged cross these crises do come when the next step must be death or life penitence or perdition do sane men and women ever commit suicide no, yes and no yes in the sense that they sometimes do it with even pulse and steady nerves no in the sense that there cannot be perfect soundness in the brain and heart of one who violates a primal instinct of human nature each case has its own peculiar features and must be left to the all-seeing and all-pitying father suicide where it is not the greatest of crimes is the greatest of misfortunes the righteous judge will classify its victims a noted case in san francisco was that of a french catholic priest he was young brilliant and popular beloved by his flock and admired by a large circle outside he had taken the solemn vows of his order in all sincerity of purpose and was distinguished as well for his zeal in his pastoral work as for his genius but temptation met him and he fell it came in the shape in which it assailed the young hebrew in potiphar's house and in which it overcame the poet king of israel he was seized with horror and remorse though he had no accuser save that voice within which cannot be hushed while the soul lives he ceased to perform the sacred functions of his office making some plausible pretext to his superiors not daring to add sacrilege to mortal sin shutting himself in his chamber he brooded over his crime or no longer able to endure the agony he felt he would rush forth and walk for hours over the sand dunes or along the sea beach 
but no answer of peace followed his prayers and the voices of nature soothed him not he thought his sin unpardonable at least he would not pardon himself he was found one morning lying dead in his bed in a pool of blood he had severed the juggler vein with a razor which was still clutched in his stiffened fingers his handsome and classic face bore no trace of pain a sealed letter lying on the table contained his confession and his farewell among the lawyers in one of the largest mining towns of california was h b he was a native of virginia and an alumnus of its noble university he was a scholar a fine lawyer handsome and manly in person and bearing and had the gift of popularity though the youngest lawyer in the town he took a front place at the bar at once over the heads of several older aspirants he was elected county judge there was no ebb in the tide of his general popularity and he had qualities that won the warmest regard of his inner circle of special friends but in this case as in many others success had its danger hard drinking was the rule in those days horace b had been one of the rare exceptions there was a reason for this extra prudence he had that peculiar susceptibility to alcoholic excitement which has been the ruin of so many gifted and noble men he knew his weakness and it is strange that he did not continue to guard against the danger that he so well understood strange no this infatuation is so common in everyday life that we cannot call it strange there is some sort of fatal fascination that draws men with their eyes wide open into the very jaws of this hell of strong drink the most brilliant physician in san francisco in the prime of his magnificent young manhood died of delirium tremens the victim of a self-inflicted disease whose horrors no one knew or could picture so well as himself who says man is not a fallen broken creature and that there is not a devil at hand to tempt him this devil under the guise of sociability false pride or moral cowardice tempted horace b and he yielded like tinder touched by flame he blazed into drunkenness and again and again the proud-spirited manly and cultured young lawyer and jurist was seen staggering along the streets maudlin or mad with alcohol when he had slept off his madness his humiliation was intense and he walked the streets with pallid face and downcast eyes the coarser-grained men with whom he was thrown in contact had no conception of the mental tortures he suffered and their rude jests stung him to the quick he despised himself as a weakling and a coward but he did not get more than a transient victory over his enemy the spark had struck a sensitive organization and the fire of hell smothered for the time would blaze out again he was fast becoming a common drunkard the accursed appetite growing stronger and his will weakening in accordance with that terrible law by which a man's physical and moral nature visits retribution on all who cross its path during a term of the court over which he presided he was taken home one night drunk a pistol shot was heard by persons in the vicinity some time before daybreak but pistol shots at all hours of the night were then too common to excite special attention horace b was found next morning lying on the floor with a bullet through his head many a stout heavy-bearded man had wet eyes when the body of the ill-fated and brilliant young virginian was let down into the grave which had been dug for him on the hill overlooking the town from the southeast in the same town there was a portrait painter a quiet pleasant fellow with a good face and easy gentlemanly ways as an artist he was not without merit but his gift fell short of genius he fell in love with a charming girl the eldest daughter of a leading citizen she could not return his passion the enamoured artist still loved and hoped against hope lingering near her like a moth around a candle there was another and more favored suitor in the case and the rejected lover had all his hopes killed at one blow by her marriage to his rival he felt that without her life was not worth living 
he resolved to kill himself and swallowed the contents of a two-ounce bottle of laudanum after he had done the rash deed a reaction took place he told what he had done and a physician was sent for before the doctor's arrival the deadly drug asserted its power and this repentant suicide began to show signs of going into a sleep from which it was certain he would never awake my god what have i done he exclaimed in horror do your best boys to keep me from going to sleep before the doctor gets here the doctor came quickly and by the prompt and very vigorous use of the stomach pump he was saved i was sent for and found the would-be suicide looking very weak sick silly and sheepish he got well and went on making pictures but the picture of the fair sweet girl for love of whom he came so near dying never faded from his mind his face always wore a sad look and he lived the life of a recluse but he never attempted suicide again he had had enough of that it always makes me shudder to look at that place said a lady as we passed an elegant cottage on the western side of russian hill san francisco why so to me the place looks specially cheerful and attractive with its graceful slope its shrubbery flowers and thick greensward yes it is a lovely place but it has a history that it shocks me to think of do you see that tall pumping apparatus with water tank on top in the rear of the house yes what of it a woman hanged herself there a year ago the family consisted of the husband and wife and two bright beautiful children he was thrifty and prosperous she was an excellent housekeeper and the children were healthy and well behaved in appearance a happier family could not be found on the hill one day mr p came home at the usual hour and missing the wife's customary greeting he asked the children where she was the children had not seen their mother for two or three hours and looked startled when they found she was missing messengers were sent to the nearest neighbors to make inquiries but no one had seen her mr p s face began to wear a troubled look as he walked the floor from time to time going to the door and casting anxious glances about the premises about dusk a sudden shriek was heard issuing from the water tank in the yard and the irish servant girl came rushing from it with eyes distended and face pale with terror holy mother of god it's the missus that's hanged herself the alarm spread and soon a crowd curious and sympathetic had collected they found the poor lady suspended by the neck from a beam at the head of the staircase leading to the top of the enclosure she was quite dead and a horrible sight to see at the inquest no facts were developed throwing any light on the tragedy there had been no cloud in the sky portending the lightning stroke that laid the happy little home in ruins the husband testified that she was as bright and happy the morning of the suicide as he had ever seen her and had parted with him at the door with the usual kiss everything about the house that day bore the marks of her deft and skilful touch the two children were dressed with accustomed neatness and good taste and yet the bolt was in the cloud and it fell before the sun had set what was the mystery ever afterwards i felt something of the feeling expressed by my lady friend when in passing i looked upon the structure which had been the scene of this singular tragedy one of the most energetic business men living in one of the foothill towns on the northern edge of the sacramento valley had a charming wife whom he loved with deep and tender devotion as in all true love matches the passion of youth had ripened into a yet stronger and purer love with the lapse of years and participation in the joys and sorrows of wedded life their union had been blessed with five children all intelligent sweet and full of promise it was a very affectionate and happy household both parents possessed considerable literary taste and culture and the best books and current magazine literature were read discussed and enjoyed in that quiet and elegant home amid the roses and evergreens it was a little paradise in the hills where love the home angel brightened every room and blessed every heart 
but trouble came in the shape of business reverses and the worried look and wakeful nights of the husband told how heavy were the blows that had fallen upon this hard and willing worker the course of ruin in california was fearfully rapid in those days when a man's financial supports began to give way they went with a crash so it was in this case everything was swept away a mountain of unpaid debts was piled up credit was gone clamor of creditors deafened him and the gaunt wolf of actual want looked in through the door of the cottage upon the dear wife and the little ones another shadow and a yet darker one settled upon them the unhappy man had been tampering with the delusion of spiritualism and his wife had been drawn with him into a partial belief in its vagaries in their troubles they sought the age of the uh, familiar spirits that peeped and muttered through speaking writing and rapping mediums this kept them in a state of morbid excitement that increased from day to day until they were wrought up to a tension that verged on insanity the lying spirits or the frenzy of his own heated brain turned his thought to death as the only escape from want i see our way out of these troubles wife he said one night as they sat hand in hand in the bedchamber where the children were lying asleep we will all die together this has been revealed to me as the solution of all our difficulties yes we will enter the beautiful spirit world together this is freedom it is only getting out of prison bright spirits beckon and call us i am ready there was a gleam of madness in his eyes and as he took a pistol from the bureau drawer an answering gleam flashed forth from the eyes of the wife as she said yes love we will all go together i too am ready the children were sleeping sweetly unmindful of the horror that the devil was hatching the children first then you and then me he said his eyes kindling with increasing excitement he penciled a short note addressed to one of his old friends asking him to attend to the burial of the bodies then they kissed each of the sleeping children and then but let the curtain fall on the scene that followed the seven were found next day lying dead a bullet through the brain of each the murderer by the side of the wife still holding the weapon of death in his hand its muzzle against his right temple other pictures of real life and death crowd upon my mind among them noble forms and faces that were near and dear to me but again i hear the appealing voices the page before me is wet with tears i cannot see to write End of chapter 36、chapter、37 of California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 Mike Reese. I had business with him and went at a business hour. No introduction was needed, for he had been my landlord. and no tenant of his ever had reason to complain that he did not get a visit from him in person or by proxy at least once a month he was a punctual man as a collector of what was due him seeing that he was intently engaged i paused and looked at him a man of huge frame with enormous hands and feet massive head receding forehead and heavy cerebral development full sensual lips large nose and peculiar eyes that seemed at the same time to look through you and to shrink from your gaze he was a man at whom a stranger would stop in the street to get a second look there he sat at his desk too much absorbed to notice my entrance before him lay a large pile of one thousand dollar united states government bonds and he was clipping off the coupons that face it was a study as he sat using the big pair of scissors a hungry boy in the act of taking into his mouth a ripe cherry a mother gazing down into the face of her pretty sleeping child a lover looking into the eyes of his charmer are but faint figures by which to express the intense pleasure he felt in his work but there was also a feline element in his joy his handling of those bonds was somewhat like a cat toying with its prey 
when at last he raised his head there was a fierce gleam in his eye and a flush in his face i had come upon a devotee engaged in worship this was mike reese the miser and millionaire placing his huge left hand on the pile of bonds he gruffly returned my salutation good morning he turned as he spoke and cast into my face a look of scrutiny which said plain enough that he wanted me to make known my business with him at once i told him what was wanted at the request of the official board of the minna street church i had come to ask him to make a contribution towards the payment of its debt oh yes i was expecting you they all come to me father gallagher of the catholic church dr wyatt of the episcopal church and all the others have been here i feel friendly to the churches and i treat all alike it won't do for me to be partial i don't give to any that last clause was an anticlimax dashing my hopes rudely but i saw he meant it and left i never heard of his departing from the rule of strict impartiality he had laid down for himself we met at times at a restaurant on clay street he was a hearty feeder and it was amusing to see how skilfully in the choice of dishes and the thoroughness with which he emptied them he could combine economy with plenty on several of these occasions when we chanced to sit at the same table i proposed to pay for both of us and he quickly assented his hard heavy features lighting up with undisguised pleasure at the suggestion as he shambled out of the room amid the smiles of the company present most of whom knew him as a millionaire and me as a methodist preacher he had one affair of the heart cupid played a prank on him that was the occasion of much merriment in the san francisco newspapers and of much grief to him a widow was his enslaver and tormentor the old story she sued him for breach of promise of marriage the trial made great fun for the lawyers reporters and the amused public generally but it was no fun for him he was mulcted for six thousand dollars and costs of the suit it was during the time i was renting one of his offices on washington street i called to see him wishing to have some repairs made his clerk met me in the narrow hall and there was a mischievous twinkle in his eyes he said you had better come another day the old man has just paid that judgment in the breach of promise case and he is in a bad way hearing our voices he said who is there come in i went in and found him sitting leaning on his desk the picture of intense wretchedness he was all unstrung his jaw fallen and a most pitiful face met mine as he looked up and said in a broken voice come some other day i, I can do no business to-day I i'm very unwell he was indeed sick sick at heart i felt sorry for him pain always excites my pity no matter what may be its cause he was a miser and the payment of those thousands of dollars was like tearing him asunder he did not mind the jibes of the newspapers but the loss of the money was almost killing he had not set his heart on popularity but cash he had another special trouble but with a different sort of ending it was discovered by a neighbor of his that by some mismeasurement of the surveyors he reese had built the wall of one of his immense business houses on front street six inches beyond his own property line taking in just so much of that neighbor's lot not being on friendly terms with reese his neighbor made a peremptory demand for the removal of the wall or the payment of a heavy price for the ground here was misery for the miser he writhed in mental agony and begged for easier terms but in vain his neighbor would not relent the business men of the vicinity rather enjoyed the situation humorously watching the progress of the affair it was a case of diamond cut diamond both parties bearing the reputation of being hard men to deal with a day was fixed for reese to give a definite answer to his neighbor's demand with notice that in case of non-compliance suit against him would be begun at once the day came and with it a remarkable change in reese's tone he sent a short note to his enemy breathing profanity and defiance 
"'What is the matter?' mused the puzzled citizen. "'Reese has made some discovery that makes him think he has the upper hand, else he would not talk this way.' And he sat and thought. The instinct of this class of men where money is involved is like a miracle. "'I have it!' he suddenly exclaimed. "'Reese has the same hold on me that I have on him.' Reese happened to be the owner of another lot adjoining that of his enemy on the other side. It occurred to him that, as all these lots were surveyed at the same time by the same party, it was most likely that as his line had gone six inches too far on the one side, his enemies had gone as much too far on the other. And so it was. He had quietly a survey made of the premises, and he chuckled with inward joy to find that he held this winning card in the unfriendly game. With grim politeness the neighbors exchanged deeds for the two half-feet of ground, and their war ended. The moral of this incident is for him who hath wit enough to see it. For several seasons he came every morning to North Beach to take sea baths. Sometimes he rode his well-known white horse, but oftener he walked. He bathed in the open sea, making, as one expressed it, twenty-five cents out of the Pacific Ocean by avoiding the bathhouse. Was this the charm that drew him forth so early? It not seldom chanced that we walked downtown together. At times he was quite communicative, speaking of himself in a way that was peculiar. It seems he had thoughts of marrying before his episode with the widow. "'Do you think a young girl of twenty could love an old man like me?' he asked me one day, as we were walking along the street. I looked at his huge and ungainly bulk and into his animal face, and made no direct answer. "'Love, six millions of dollars is a great sum. Money may buy youth and beauty, but love does not come at its call.' God's highest gifts are free. Only the second-rate things can be bought with money. Did this sordid old man yearn for pure human love amid his millions? Did such a dream cast a momentary glamour over a life spent in raking among the muck heaps? If so, it passed away, for he never married. He understood his own case. He knew in what estimation he was held by the public, and did not conceal his scorn for its opinion. My love of money is a disease. My saving and hoarding as I do is irrational, and I know it. It pains me to pay five cents for a streetcar ride, or a quarter of a dollar for a dinner. My pleasure in accumulating property is morbid, but I have felt it from the time I was a foot peddler in Charlotte, Campbell, and Pennsylvania counties in Virginia, until now. It is a sort of insanity, and it is incurable, but it is about as good a form of madness as any, and all the world is mad in some fashion. This was the substance of what he said of himself when in one of his moods of free speech, and it gave me a new idea of human nature, a man whose keen and penetrating brain could subject his own consciousness to a cool and correct analysis, seeing clearly the folly which he could not resist. The autobiography of such a man might furnish a curious psychological study and explain the formation and development in society of those moral monsters called misers. Nowhere in literature has such a character been fully portrayed, though Shakespeare and George Eliot have given vivid touches of some of its features. He always retained a kind feeling for the South, over whose hills he had borne his peddler's pack when a youth. After the war, two young ex-Confederate soldiers came to San Francisco to seek their fortunes. A small room adjoining my office was vacant, and the brothers requested me to secure it for them as cheap as possible. I applied to Reese, telling him who the young men were, and describing their broken and impecunious condition. Tell them to take the room free of rent, but it ought to bring five dollars a month. It took a mighty effort, and he sighed as he spoke the words. I never heard of his acting similarly in any other case, and I put this down to his credit, glad to know that there was a warm spot in that mountain of mud and ice. A report of this generous act got afloat in the city, and many were the inquiries I received as to its truth. There was general incredulity. His health failed, and he crossed the seas. 
Perhaps he wished to visit his native hills in Germany, which he had last seen when a child. There he died, leaving all his millions to his kindred, save a bequest of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the University of California. What were his last thoughts? What was his final verdict concerning human life? I know not. Empty-handed, he entered the world of spirits, where the film fallen from his vision, he saw the eternal realities. What amazement must have followed his awakening! End of chapter 37「Oscar California Sketches by Oscar Penn Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 38. Uncle Nolan. He was black and ugly, but it was ugliness that did not disgust nor repel you. His face had a touch both of the comic and the pathetic. His mouth was wide, his lips very thick, and the color of a ripe damson, blue-black. His nose made up in width what it lacked in elevation. His ears were big and bent forward. His eyes were a dull white on a very dark ground. His wool was white and thick. His age might be anywhere along from seventy onward. A black man's age, like that of a horse, becomes dubious after reaching a certain stage. He came to the class meeting in the Pine Street Church in San Francisco one Sabbath morning. He asked leave to speak, which was granted. Brethren, I come here some time ago from Vicksburg, Mississippi, where I has lived for forty years or more. I heard dar was a colored church up on the hill, and I thought I'd go and worship with em. I went dar three or four Sundays, but I found their ways didn't suit me, and my ways didn't suit dem. They was Yankees niggers, and proudly, I was a southern man myself. Somebody told me dar was a southern church down here on Pine Street, and I thought I'd come and look in. Soon's I got inside the church and look round a minute, I feels at home. Dey look like home folks. De preacher preach like home folks. De people sing like home folks. You see, chillin, I was a southern man myself, emphatically, and I was a southern Methodist. This is de church I was born in, and this is de church I was reared in, and with great energy, this is de church which de scripture says de gates of hell shall not prevail again it. Amen from Father Newman and others. When they heard I was coming to dis church, some of em got arter me about it. They say dis church was a enemy to de black people, and that they was in favor of slavery. I told em de scripture said, Love your enemies, and then I took de Bible and read what it says about slavery. I can read some, chillin. Servants obey your masters in all things, not with I service as men pleases, but as unto de Lord, and so on. But bless your souls, chillin, they wouldn't listen to that, so I found out they was abolition niggers, and I left em. Yes, he left them, and came to us. I received him into the church in due form, and with no little eclat, he being the only son of Ham on our roll of members in San Francisco. He stood firm to his southern Methodist colors under a great pressure. You ought to be killed for going to that southern church, said one of his colored acquaintances one day as they met in the street. Kill me, den, said Uncle Nolan with proud humility. Kill me, den. You can't cheat me out of many days, no how. He made a living and something over by rag picking at North Beach and elsewhere until the Chinese entered into competition with him, and then it was hard times for Uncle Nolan. His eyesight partially failed him, and it was pitiful to see him on the beach, his threadbare garments fluttering in the wind, groping amid the rubbish for rags, or shuffling along the streets with a huge sack on his back, and his old felt hat tied under his nose with a string, picking his way carefully to spare his swollen feet, which were tied up with bagging and woolens. His religious fervor never cooled. I never heard him complain. He never ceased to be joyously thankful for two things, his freedom and his religion. But, strange as it may seem, he was a pro-slavery man to the last. Even after the war, he stood to his opinion. Dem niggers in the South thinks dey is free, but dey ain't. For it's all over, all dat ain't dead will be glad to get back to de masters, he would say. 
yet he was very proud of his own freedom and took the utmost care of his free papers he had no desire to resume his former relation to the peculiar and patriarchal institution he was not the first philosopher who had one theory for his fellows and another for himself uncle nolan would talk of religion by the hour he never tired of that theme his faith was simple and strong but like most of his race he had a tinge of superstition he was a dreamer of dreams and he believed in them here is one which he recited to me his weird manner and low chanting tone i must leave to the imagination of the reader uncle nolan's dream a tall black man came along and took me by de arm and told me he had come for me i said what you want with me i come to carry you down into the darkness what for cause you don't follow the lord with that he pulled me long de street till he come to a big black house the biggest house and the thickest walls i ever seed we went in a little dough and then he took me down the long stairs at the dock till we come to a big door we went inside and then the big black man locked the door behind us and so we kept on going down and going down and going down and he kept locking them big iron doors behind us and all the time it was pitch dark and so i couldn't see him but he still held on to me at last we stopped and then he started to go away he locked the door behind him and i heard him going up the steps the way we come locking all the doors behind him as he went i tell you that was dreadful when i heard that big key turn on the outside and me way down down dar in the dark all alone and no chance ever to get out and i knowed it was cause i didn't follow de lord i felt round de place and dar was nothing but the thick walls and de great iron door den i sot down and cried cause i knowed i was a lost man dat was de same as hell his voice sinking into a whisper and all de time i knowed i was dar cause i hadn't followed de lord by and by something say pray something kept saying pray den i drop on my knees and prayed i tell you no man ever prayed harder than i did i prayed and prayed and prayed what's dat dar is somebody a comin down dem steps dey is unlockin de door and de first thing i knowed de place was all lighted up bright as day and a white-faced man stood by me wid a crown on his head and a golden key in his hand somehow i knowed it was jesus and right den i waked up all of a tremble and knowed it was a warnin dat i must follow de lord and bless jesus i has been follerin him fifty years since i had dat dream in his prayers and class meeting and love feast talks uncle nolan showed a depth of spiritual insight truly wonderful and the effects of these talks were frequently electrical many a time have i seen the pine street brethren and sisters rise from their knees at the close of one of his prayers melted into tears or thrilled to religious rapture by the power of his simple faith and the vividness of his sanctified imagination he held to his pro-slavery views and guarded his own freedom papers to the last and when he died in eighteen seventy five the last colored southern methodist in california was transferred from the church militant to the great company that no man can number gathered out of every nation and tribe and kindred on earth End of chapter thirty eight